things, but uh, sometimes I have to disguise myself. I don't know how well of a job I'm doing in this photo, but yeah, sometimes it's very hot, sticky, lots of bugs, which is something I'm okay with. Um, and sometimes, you know, I have to hide myself from the animals like you just saw, but other times when I'm in a rescue situation or, or we're doing scientific research, I can get really close to some of the animals, like here where I'm filming uh, a bundle of penguins that are being released. And, um, you know, this animal um, that we're gonna talk more about, I've ended up making a lot of short films about them. And, you know, it's crazy to look back on all these things that I've done. And I'm, you know, I ask myself like, how the heck did I get to this place? And uh, the answer is, you know, I really just started out like any other kid. I grew up in Florida. I had, you know, parents that thought I was just your normal little girl that I liked Skipper Barbie. And they gave me this great eighties haircut and put me in dresses. But really, you know, what they would come to discover is that I was much more interested in holding uh, a live animal <laughs> like this amazing chameleon here than I was uh, any Barbie doll. And this love, you know, I was very fascinated by nature and I wanted to figure out a way to represent that visually. And so um, I, this was one of my very first cameras or should I say my first 100 cameras. And I also tried illustration. So I was doing science illustration and, and all different kinds of art. And then I was also doing, you know, continuing my photography all throughout high school and college. And at one point I went and did a study abroad in Australia. And that's when I found video. And I found that, you know, I was trying to make this connection with my audience and share that amazing wonder um, and beauty in nature. And I wasn't quite making that connection until I started sharing my videos. And that's when I felt like I was really getting that, that feedback, that emotional connection that I wanted with my viewer and for them to feel what I was feeling when I was looking at nature. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna explore this more and see what I could do in terms of a video, uh, using video as a tool. Um, and I thought the best place to do that should be National Geographic. So I got an internship there and wah wah, it was actually a desk job, not very fun at all. But in my free time, I would take my portfolio and go on meetings with like, I don't know, I think I met with like 25 different people and this this one gentleman, Jason R. Fannin, basically took me under his wing and took me to a couple different places. And here we are in the Amazon and this is where I really got to shoot for Nat Geo and do some stories and they ended up on PBS and that kind of catapulted my career um, in this really lovely way. Um, and I went on to become a National Geographic Explorer eventually, but that that was like, a few years later. So, you know, after, you know, starting to really get my footing in this career, I thought maybe I was just going to work on wildlife, but then I realized, you know, we live in a world where wildlife and, and, and people, they are, are always coming into contact. And so that intersection point was really interesting to me. And I thought that that was more true to life. And, and those are the type of stories that I wanted to tell to help, um, you know, bring us, uh, together in a cohesive way and, and a symbiotic way. And um, so that's how I ended up talking about the pangolin, which is unfortunately one of the world's most trafficked mammals and said to be the most illegally trafficked mammal in the world. And you're saying like, okay, what the heck is this animal? It looks like a walking artichoke or a cute pine cone. So the pangolin is the world's only scaled mammal. It's not related to sloths, it's not related to armadillos. Its closest relative is actually that of early carnivores. And they're the world's only scaled mammal. So they represent 70 million years of unique evolution. And I love this picture because he looks like he's about to ask someone to prom, but he's really shy. So here's the eight different species that we have worldwide, and they're mostly in South, um, oh, throughout Africa and Southeast Asia. And you have four species on the left and four on the right, and they're kind of cut down the center in terms of what they like to do. So four, like half of them like to climb trees, and half of them like to hang out on the ground and dig holes. So some of the ground diggers like this Temmings pangolin, they are actually bipedal. So they walk like little T-Rexes with their arms held up like this and then their big old legs 
propping up their bodies on the ground and their tails act as a balance point. It's amazing. And then the tree climbers, they have incredible prehensile tails just like possums, so they can hang upside down. They also have the world's longest tongue. You can actually see it in this illustration on the right side here. You can see it, it actually goes way back into their body. And imagine if your tongue was covered in like super glue. That's how sticky their tongues are all the time. And so when they stick those tongues into um, termite mounds, which is their favorite food, they're insectivores, they eat ants and termites. When they bring their tongue back out, it's got all these ants and termites stuck to it. And they eat tons and tons of ants and termites. So that definitely helps keep the environment in check. Here's a baby penguin. This is just adorable. So I had to make sure it got in there. So the babies will ride on top of their moms until they're ready to leave. And they're, you know, they're solitary animals for most of the time. It's really hard to find them. It's really hard to research them. They're incredibly data deficient across the board. We need to know more about their ecology and more about what is needed to protect these animals in the wild. Um, and so, you know, their scales are what makes them unique. Why do they have scales? Well, they use it for protection. So when they're scared, they roll up into this impenetrable ball like this. And this is impenetrable to pretty much everything, including lions. So it just waits till the lions get bored and then it'll unroll and walk off. So unfortunately, the very thing that makes them unique is also the reason why they're the most illegally trafficked and why poachers and people are, are trying to take this animal from the wild. And basically they often remove the scales like you see here, this one little shot of scales is like 20 animals. And this is kind of like one of the worst images I could show you, but it, it is important to see because this is emblematic of, of, you know, this is actually just a small fraction of all the penguins that are taken from the wild. Um, and these are, these are some of the penguins that were confiscated from uh, an airport where somebody was trying to smuggle them. And, um, you know, it's just really sad to see and so, you know, I was really passionate to do something about this, to let people know. And back in 2014, when I first started working on this animal, um, I basically just wanted to get the word out because people didn't even know that the animal existed at that time. And so it was, you know, basically about, you know, hey, look at this incredible animal and and understand that, you know, it's, it's worth saying, saving. And, you know, we're worried that it's gonna go extinct before anybody knows it exists. So I made my first penguin film. And then later on, I got some funding with National Geographic to go to Nigeria and basically document the, um, the trade from the moment the animal is taken from the wild in Africa and then from the moment it's consumed to the moment it's consumed in China. Um, and once I got on the ground, I ended up making a totally different story. Uh, so I'll play a little bit of footage. Don't worry about the sound. I'm just going to talk over this video. So this is actually a black-bellied pangolin. They have black skin and gold scales. They're absolutely gorgeous. Now we're seeing a white-bellied pangolin. They're both tree-climbing species. And there he is eating ants. And so we went there to kind of work with the different folks on the ground, working with the trafficking um, and, and kind of counter trafficking efforts. There's a close up of the scales. And while we were doing this, we, we actually had a, a driver that was just taking us around and he was a local vet. And we started talking to him and he was telling us basically, you know, I actually go into the bushmeat markets and I rescue pangolins. Here's a pangolin that was being trafficked on the day we were there. And you know, people, they'll, they'll eat pangolins. They think it's like a healthy animal to consume. And, um, and then they also traffic the scales like you see here. So we were also working with customs agents and we we're seeing these crazy bags and bags and bags of scales. And Lagos, Nigeria is one of the largest exportation hubs of scales in the world. So we thought that that was kind of the epicenter and an important story to tell. 
And so, you know, we're learning about this, this guy, Mark, and within 24 hours, we were like, okay, we need to change the whole story and feature this, this gentleman, Mark Ofua, which is featured here. And, you know, in Nigeria, it's, it's not a normal thing to, to appreciate wildlife, um, to understand what endangered or things going extinct means. And um, so Mark was just kind of seen as kind of a crazy person. Um, here, I think I have a little video that shows him in the markets here. So this is what the Bushmeat markets look like. And here's Mark, very handsome gentleman. And he was just, he had his, his very small veterinarian clinic just for dogs and cats. But then he would go into the bushmeat markets where you have all kinds of that's you know, crazy things, um, both dead and alive being sold. And he basically would just look around for animals that, that weren't gonna be sold. Maybe they were babies or they were injured. And so he would basically talk with the, the merchants and convince them to either give him the animals like here, he's he's trying to talk to this woman about basically giving him over these pangolins, um, or he sometimes has to pay a small amount of money. Um, but he's you know over the years he's building these relationships, and so people will just call him up and say, "Hey, I've got a baby. Why don't you come and pick it up?" And this is while we were there. I think we actually were able to find eight different pangolins. And so after he takes these pangolins. Uh, the, the first thing he does is he hydrates them because they're all incredibly dehydrated. Sometimes they haven't eaten or drinking anything in a week. They've just been in a, a rice bag. Um, and the important thing I want everybody to understand here is that, you know, these merchant sellers, the hunters, the poachers, you know, these people are just trying to provide for their families. And they're just as much a victim of the demand for pangolins as the pangolins themselves. And so that's a part of the story that I try to point out, um, and I think is, you know, it's important that we're hearing those voices as well. And um, I'm ending on a high note. So this is a photo of um, Mark on World Pangolin Day last March. He opened up Nigeria and maybe all of West Africa's first pangolin conservation center, where he has this massive enclosure now where he can, um, basically, he just, they just, um, increased his ability to rehab pangolins tenfold. And now he can do it with more support, um, more medical um, devices and things you can see here. And he's just learning so much and doing such a, a, a just a crazy amount of, of work to release pangolins now in a way that's efficient and, and working well. And he's actually seen a pangolin. I just got a message last week that, that a baby pangolin was born within the protected area, which is kept very secret. So people can't go back in and poach, poach the pangolins. Um, so yeah, it's just been a pleasure working with Mark. I actually named my son after him. Um, and you know, I'm gonna continue to work with Mark and we actually have a screening. I think it actually happened yesterday. We did a screening of our film in Lagos, Nigeria. And so um, it's great that we can kind of use, fil use the film uh, to help support Mark's work. Um, and it's just great to have a, a happy story. And we're just gonna continue you know, working on pangolin conservation as much as we can. I'll probably work on pangolins the rest of my life um, and, and try to save them before they go extinct. So that's my work. Here's the, my contact information if anybody wants to reach out to me. There I am on Instagram. And then if anybody wants to support pangolins, the Pangolin Crisis Fund, Dot org is an incredible organization and they seek out um, kind of a rapid assessment of projects going on all over the world that are helping pangolins. There's a lot of scientific research that's being done that's really important to help us de design conservation strategies. And so they're a really good go-between for supporting those different projects. So I highly support you guys check out the Pangolin Crisis Fund. Fantastic. Kate, what an awesome presentation. And I'm still 
getting over the tongue going that far into the body. It's kind of terrifying, <laughs> but very, very cool. And uh, again, thanks so much for sharing Mark's work. Again, we got the chance to have him on the broadcast the other day, pangolin tongue and ear. So it's been a nice chance to highlight this really, really special creature. And if people who are tuning in weren't aware of pangolins before, uh, hopefully you get a chance to see how, you know, just beautiful and wonderful creatures they are. And so thank you for such amazing films. Um, Katie, to kick off, I'm going to shamelessly share a question from my mother, who is really keen on pangolins. <laughs> You talked about them being trafficked, and so that, at least to me, implies illegality. Is it illegal to take pangolins in the wild? Is there a penalty for this? Or you sort of show them as being openly traded in the bushmeat market, so I'm curious what the situation is. Yeah, um, you know, it. it uh, there was a law passed for, with the IUCN, um, I think it was in 2001, and so they're, they're considered protected uh, worldwide as an endangered species. All eight species are endangered, two of them are critically endangered, and so technically it should be illegal, but when you don't have um, places you know, on the ground working with enforcement and you don't have those systems in place or even you know, your authorities having the knowledge of the animal, what the scales look like, how to identify these things, it's really hard to enforce those rules. Um, and you know, you know, that lack of knowledge is key. Um, so if people know about these things and, and it's kind of an established thing and, and there's uh, information out there, then they can start you know, enforcing the rules at a bare minimum, enforcing the rules, going to the bushmeat markets and basically you know, letting people know. And that's actually something that Mark does is he goes into the bushmeat markets and educates people as he's doing rescues. Well, I'm so curious about this because you highlighted the fact that now people will tell him, oh, we had a baby come in, come take it from us sort of thing. Do Is there a, a network of people that go through these markets and help them out find these species and bring them to this rehab center or what's the situation like? Um, yeah, I mean, he just, he'll just go himself into the markets, which is actually somewhat dangerous sometimes because um, people don't, uh, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's very uh, uncommon. Yeah. People don't see animals as these cute things. They they see them as something, you know, as as sustenance, as um, something that you know they can eat and support their families and feed their families. So it's 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 a strange environment to be in, and they you know they still look at Mark with with a question on their head on their faces. But I think that that's starting to change. You know, I think that he's got respect now in the community, and people are starting to understand that that the pangolin can disappear from the wild. And so it's nice to see that narrative changing. Yeah. Well, speaking of this sort of, uh, this, this backdrop, you said something in your presentation that I absolutely love, and it's been a theme of a few of the presentations there at the BioFest, and that is that the poachers aren't bad people. They're people that are working to sustain their families. This is a, a way of making money. It's a way of, of you know, ensuring a livelihood for yourself and, and those around you. And so one of the things, one of the strategies that some of our other conservation leaders have talked about is working with the poachers, finding them a role to play in the conservation of these animals because they know where to find them. They know how to, you know, they, they know everything about their distribution and all these things. Is there any strategy like this in Nigeria to sort of bring over poachers to the other side, so to speak, that you know of? You know, that's a great, as you're saying it, I'm like thinking to myself, you know, I should make some suggestions to Mark next time I talk to him. Because wouldn't it be cool if we, you know, basically Mark started, you know, if he had the funding, right? Yeah. You know, and now he has the center all set up and that's fairly recent. But now that he has this kind of home base, it would be so great if he could basically go out into the bushing markets and kind of like recruit market sellers and 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 poachers. The 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 real challenge though um, is is money, honestly. So we would have to stay competitive with whatever they're making on a sale. Right. And so that's where the tricky part comes in. You have to make it worth, you know, the while. And I think that's going to be, that's why it's kind of a big holistic effort, right? Because you kind of need a little bit of like, you need that, you need uh, alternatives for livelihoods, but you also need that enforcement angle, you know, so that they feel a little bit of um, pressure to, to stop, you know, poaching and selling the, the animal. And, and, you know, I think the more we can kind of include their voices in the process and hear from them about what kind of things they need and things that that would kind of convince them to switch over. Um, Cause these are things that, that, you know, like the poacher that we met, um, he's been, you know, his father did that before him and then his father did that before his father. So it's this multi-generational 
thing that people are just used to and and that's how they grew up and they don't know anything else. So, you know, there probably have to be job support and training. So, you know, our support in Mark's efforts, I think, you know, that would be an amazing program to implement and I'm definitely gonna talk to him about it. So this is great. <laughs> well, very cool. We uh, sort of two programs to look back on in our BioFest. We had Indira on talking about uh, the Philippines and all the amazing work that they've been doing to protect the cockatoo. And again, it started with in, you know, bringing poachers on board and they managed to get the funding to give it as an alternative job option. And again, unlike in Canada and the States and the UK, where a lot of our viewers have been from, in a lot of countries, the amount of money it requires to make that a possible alternative is very, very low. I, I've had the chance to go to Madagascar where a typical wage is $1,000 Canadian a year. And I mean, that is a, a small sum for something like the international community to help support to make sure that we protect these really integral species and habitats on a world scale. And, you, you know, you mentioned enforcement too. John Scanlon was on the other day talking about, you know, Africa parks, all the amazing work that's been done to make sure that you view poaching ivory or you view taking a rhino horn as a real disincentive to, to doing that. Um, and it leads to a lot of positive good. So I think there's a lot here. This is very exciting. I, I you know, time flies and you're having fun, Katie, but I wanted to ask one more question. You, you talked about the fact that this is the first such place in West Africa. Are there other pangolariums around the world? Like, is this something that you have in, in Asia and in India or, or anywhere else? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that there are a couple more. I think there's one, there's one being built in India. There's one in South Africa, I think near jo Johannesburg. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a couple in South Africa actually. Um, and yeah, there's more popping up all the time. So, you know, like 2014, when I first started working on this, there was nothing like that. And so it's been incredibly, um, you know, I'm incredibly humbled by the ability to kind of be a part of this first wave mm -hmm. of awareness about this animal. Um, and it's just really nice to see people coming together to try and protect it. Well, you certainly do a fantastic job. I can say like uh, I did with uh, Pablo Borborogu the other day, the moment I first saw you come on one of our broadcasts in the past, I finished it up and donated straight to Pangolin Conservation. So your, your message is spreading. It's very captivating. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I want to bring up on the screen too, pangolincrisisfund.org, and I think I got that all correct. Yeah, um, people should check that out. It's an amazing resource to help this really, really amazing animal. And Katie shared uh, her, her links to her own social media accounts, website, and more at the end of her broadcast. But check out Coral and Oak Studios. Just amazing stuff, amazing footage. And uh, so thank you so much for joining us for the BioFest today, Katie. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Jesse. Enjoy, and, and good luck. I know it's a long Non-stop, amazing. Five more hours. Five more <laughs> hours to go. We're almost there. We you got, got this. You got Thank you so much. Keep up the amazing work. And we look very forward to having you on in the future. <laughs> awesome, Jesse. Thank you so much. Bye for now, Katie. Awesome, guys. So let's keep this train rolling. I want to share a few more things before we bring on our next speaker. We've got a nice little gap. We are keeping straight on time, which after 67 hours is quite the feat. Uh, so what I want to share first is just some of the efforts that we're doing to protect wildlife. Katie takes her lens and makes these amazing films to highlight things like pangolins and more. What we've been doing through the Global BioFest is making a free, comprehensive look around the world, some of the amazing conservation efforts that are being done by real all-stars uh, on every single continent in over 50 countries. However, when you registered at globalbiofest.com, you did have the option to donate to save uh, species through some of our conservation partners, and you can still do so by heading to our support conservation page, where there are many options on how you can continue to donate to support these partners. You can go straight to text biodiversity at 44321 in the United States, if you're tuning in there. If you are not in the US and are anywhere else internationally, this slightly longer number should work for you, 1917-999-0700. And my favorite part of our supporting of conservation is the capacity to take home a little bit of the Global BioFest with you. So if you head to our Prince for Conservation uh, section on our website at globalbiofest.com, for a hundred US dollar donation, all of which will go towards our amazing conservation partners, you will get a large limited edition print by an astonishing nature photographer from around the globe. So check out that series, it's really special. Uh, only 25 per, per print, so a really unique opportunity and uh, hopefully you can get them while they're hot. One more quick thing, speaking of, of saving biodiversity and highlighting the importance of funding this sort of work. I wanna bring up a video from one of our partners. Uh, Fauna and Flora International has done some really amazing work to help conservation worldwide. So I want to play a brief clip before we head on to our next speaker. Let me bring that up. Our well-being, our economies, 
Everything depends on a healthy planet, and yet we continue to neglect it. You'll have heard, probably more than you'd like to have done, about the devastating decline in biodiversity and nature all around the planet. Our beautiful planet that we call Earth and the existence of countless beautiful species face a serious threat from climate change. In the last 50 years, we've seen wildlife populations fall by nearly 70% as their natural homes and habitats are being destroyed. We cannot underestimate just how vital healthy, functioning ecosystems are to the future survival of our own species. That is why FFI is backing a campaign asking governments around the world to put $500 billion every year into the hands of those people who know best how to spend it. Local people who understand local conditions. I am in Kyrgyzstan, where we realize important projects for the preservation of global biodiversity at the local level. Es una realidad eminente que la tortuga laúd y la tortuga carey del Pacífico Oriental siguen en peligro crítico de extinción. Es por esta razón que necesitamos con urgencia seguir apoyando a las personas y a las organizaciones que trabajan en primera línea. We must all act in unison to minimize our impact on nature and reverse the damage that has been caused to biodiversity. Please sign our petition to make this a reality. Back our One Home campaign to put power back into the hands of the people who most need it. How special is that? I can speak for myself and I think for a lot of our audience that if David Attenborough tells me to do something, I want to go right out and do it. Uh, you can check out the hashtag R1 home below. What a special campaign and truly $500 billion is a drop in the bucket when it comes to thinking about global budgets or even national budgets. And it can go such a long way to protecting wild species and habitats, which after all is what the Global BioFest is all about. And so another thing that uh, the Global BioFest is all about, of course, is featuring some really amazing people from across the globe working to protect those species and habitats. And so I'm so excited to welcome in our next speaker. So we've already had the privilege of heading out to the Toucan Rescue Ranch over the course of the BioFest. They are an amazing organization in Costa Rica that works to rescue, rehabilitate, and re-release injured wildlife. They are one of our longest standing and most amazing partners at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, the organization behind this festival. And so I'm privileged to bring in Ana Maria Viana Rosales, who is the chief uh, veterinarian at, at the Toucan, uh, veterinary supervisor at the Toucan Rescue Ranch, and she is going to speak to us today on the importance of a one health approach to conservation, a really, really big, important topic and one we've covered throughout the fest. So Ana Maria, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, it's so, I'm so glad to be here. We're so glad to have you. Thank you so much for coming in. I'm so excited to learn from you today. Yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to show everything. I'm currently in the clinic right now. I have the interns working up over here. We have several animals. Um, but yeah, I can start right away. Fantastic. Well, and if we see cool animals in the background, just flag me and I'll bring your camera back to you. But if you want to bring up your presentation, go right ahead. Okay, I'll start with the presentation and then I will show what, we, what animals we have on the back. Fantastic. Um, there it is. There we go. Excellent. All right, let's just bring up that PowerPoint and we should be all set to go. All right. Um, well, I'm Ana Maria Villada Rosales. I'm a wildlife veterinarian. I've been working in Tucan Rescue Ranch for four years. I have a master in conservation medicine and I'm going to be talking today about One Health. I guess, well, we all have been seeing One Health throughout all the uh, presentations we have had today, but it's basically a very important concept. It's um, the collaborative efforts of multiple disciplines working together locally, nationally, globally to attain optimal health for people, animals, and our environment. It basically is saying that everything is, interconnect is interconnected. If we have a healthy environment, we're gonna have healthy animals and healthy people by uh, uh, just, by having it all together. But so it's really, really important to have one comp one healthy with the other, because if you have one that is 
unhealthy is going to affect and impact completely the others. Um, so why is One Health so important? Well, it is because 60% of the infectious diseases that we're finding in humans are zoonotic. Uh, many of them come from, um, from animals and 5% of the new diseases that, we're, uh, that we are appearing every year are from animal origin. And many of these diseases can be used for, um, for bioterrorism. So, and one of the biggest examples we have right now is COVID. It appeared in a, in a, in a place where we do have bush, uh, bush meat and it, it exploded too globally and it has been affecting us since then. So it's really, really important to have one health because it's the way that we're gonna be monitoring and um, protecting ourselves from, from all of these diseases. Now I'm going to talk about um, Tucan Rescue Ranch. Um, Tucan Rescue Ranch is the place I worked at. Um, our mission is to rescue, rehabilitate, and release Costa Rican wildlife. Uh, we are we have been working uh, in conservation for all from since 2004. And even though we're we're a small grassroots organization, how does one um, Tucan Rescue Ranch approaches the One Health philosophy? Well, let's start from people. Um, we do education. We have so many education programs. Uh, we have international virtual classroom. We have animal handling workshops. We have a first aid workshop. We have educational uh, public property walks where we talk about the animals and or ambassadors, the animals that we cannot release and have stayed here after human animal conflict problems. We work with universities. We bring them here. We do internships. We do volunteering. We do local school lessons, which is the most important one we involve the local people and we involve the, the, the young kids to teach them respect, knowledge, uh, how to treat the animals, how to create a healthy relationship with the environment. So that is really, really, really important. And we also do on, on-site field trip visits. Like we take some of our people over here, some people um, in charge of the education program and they go to schools, they talk about our program, they talk about what we are doing, they talk about um, how we are working to, sa to save and relocate all of these animals. We, we even work with the government uh, doing animal handling workshops and, and teach, teaching them how to handle the animals, how to, when to bring them to us and how to bring them to us. And also one of the most important thing is we, we promote tourism to our local community while opening our doors to, to local and international tourists. We bring them to Costa Rica, we teach them about the animals and they go to the local places and they just boost the economy uh, through tourism. We also have been hosting charity. We have over there tunes for Tucans. Um, this is a very important community outreach work we have been doing is sadly because of COVID, we haven't been able to do it, but we do communicate our outreach. We, it's a charity event. We raise money for ourselves and for other uh, projects that we work with. We have been networking through Avla with other rescue centers. Try, uh, we, we exchange some animals. So for example, we receive a monkey, a howler monkey that has um, success, well, a good success rate and it could be rewilded into the wild and we send it to another rescue center. So it's really, really important working to other places to have all the animals and well, so the animals can have an opportunity to go back into the wild. We also have been working with the Slot Institute, creating the, the Saving Slots Together program is the baseline of our um, release program for slots. It's the whole training we go through. It takes two years. It, it takes one, uh, two, almost two years after we release the animals just to make sure that they're thriving into the wild. And we, we have also been working with the Macaw Recovery Network, receiving uh, macaws from their project whenever they need to be rescued, sending some macaws over there whenever they need to be released. We have been uh, working with Minaik very closely because they bring us the animals. We train them with workshops and we work with them when we need to release the animals back into the wild. We have also been joining international events uh, like Global Biodiversity Festival, we have um, Conservation Expo. We try to do like showcase what is going on in Costa Rica so people, well, so we can have more tourism coming in and open it all. So that's the, the one health approach to people. Now, um, we also been working with, uh, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, we also been working with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, uh, how we said. We do classes online, we do community outreach also with the uh, local schools who I've been talking about, like with San in San Isidro, Santa Cecilia, Nazaret, San Jose. And as I said, we have the internship and volunteering program. We have Lupa, the Lupa Broad Islands. We have professional internships. We have one month opportunities for volunteers that want to come. 
And obviously the onside I was talking about where you can come visit, learn everything about our animals um, and everything that we're doing. And also if you want to stay over, you can go backstage and see how we are working with the re uh, rehabilitation of the animals. And when we go into the environmental part, um, Tucan Rescue Ranch has been working really closely with Kaffir Breed. Uh, he's a, uh, it's a coffee that has given us the habitat and slot blender where uh, they sell a coffee that is, has the, the Tucan X, uh, Rescue Ranch logo, and then they give us tracking equipment. And we have been using this, tr this tracking equipment to follow the slots throughout the canopy, making sure they're doing good. But to start to do that, we opened a release site on, on Nazareth. And this release site, from being a reforest, uh, deforested area, it has been reforested into what we call the Bosque de los Perezosos, which in English will be the forest of the, of the slots. We have also been working with ISE and the electric company, and they have been donating trees, donating volunteers. And through four-year program, we have been reforesting this part of, of, um, of Sarapiqui that connects to the Braulio Carrillo. So that's the place that we have been working um, to put our animals back and um, to improve our program of saving and slots, and slots together by increasing the habitat, reducing fragmentation, connect, make a, a connection uh, with natural places. And not only that, we have also been working with other places near our release site uh, called Earth University and Tirimbina Biological Reserve that when our animals are ready to be completely by themselves and they don't need their tracking devices anymore, that's when we send them to these places and they're on a hard release and they're gonna be living there for, for all their lives. And the good part is that they have biologists working directly on, on that area. And they have been telling us that their animals are doing great. So we have been um, reforestating and also connecting and networking with other places. I'm gonna show you guys a, a small video of how our re reforestation program at the release site has been going. That's how it used to look before. So now you have seen that how we have used the One Health approach to people, the community, helping the community, boosting the economy, and then um, the environment, how we have restored the environment for release of our, of, for more releases on, on our place. Ah. The presentation was going a little bit um, wild. Um, but now we're, I'm gonna talk how the One Health, well, how Tucan Rescue Ranch approaches One Health to their rehabilitation and, and what we do. We rescue, rehabilitate, and, re and release animals. When we receive an animal, it helps us to understand what is going on in that place. We rescue, by rescuing these animals, it allows us to see what the human-animal conflict is, is happening in the real world. We see what is going on in these places, how the fragmentation is affecting them, how the infra infrastructure is affecting them. They get electrocuted, so we see how the power lines are connecting them into the canopy. We, uh, we see them getting uh, run over by cars. So we see how the, the roads are going to all those wild places. We all, it also helps us to monitor disease. When we receive wild populations from a certain area and we continue to receive animals from that place, we know that there's something is affecting the animals. It could be a sickness or it could be a, a, or it could be a virus or it could be something human made like pesticides. So all of that helps us understand what is going on over there. We, it also helps us monitor the environmental problems. We see habitat loss. We see what is, how it, the climate change is affecting these animals and how, well, it is really, really important to know all of this because biodiversity loss does affect us because it affects the food chain and the um, uh, food available, availability and the sustainability we have. So when we receive the animal, it's really, really important to know where they come from and the exact area where they come from. And we are always asking me now where the animals are coming from 
even the people, we ask them where, where in their community it is, because that way we're going to understand the conflict that is going on in those areas and what are causing the issues that are affecting these animals. And the final part is the rewilding. We, when we, the animal is ready to go back into the wild, they go back into the wild into where they came from. We don't translocate animals. They go directly to where, where they were found. But when we receive the animals, we have to make sure that when we're going to release them, um, it is a self-sustaining population. That means that there's food and there's uh, uh, everything they need available for them to survive. Um, it, only, it only can be on these places. If we know that there's a problem going on in their environment, then these animals will come back into our care. And we don't want that. We want them to be wild and free. So that's when we have to make sure that the habitat is healthy. And if it's not healthy, then we have to make everything in our power to make the habitat healthy. That's when conservation medicine comes in. That is basically what One Health has been talking about. It's um, having a healthy ecosystem that can sustain the animals that in, in return will affect how the humans relate to that ecosystem. And if the humans have everything they need covered, then they will help um, they will help the animals and they will help the ecosystem. So everything at the end is always together. We need everything to be healthy in order to be able to release the animals and continue the work. And that's how basically a small rescue center, a grassroots organization, Tucan Rescue Ranch, has been applying one help into our, our program and how we work with everything that we have around us. And if, well, if you want to find me online, uh, there's my Instagram, there's my email, uh, there's the info about Tucan Rescue Ranch. You can always follow us online and fo follow us all the amazing stories we have. We have always been working uh, with the animals and we continue to work with the animals. And uh, well, we love what we're doing. Fantastic. What a great program. I love things like the forest regeneration. It's just the most special thing to see and, and you know, the impact that can have. One of the things that we've had throughout the festival is people, you know, re-releasing animals. And if you release them into an area where they're just going to be captured again or if they're going to be run into danger again, you're, you're sort of, you're, you're slightly putting out the fire, but you're still leaving the building burning. So I think it's a really special approach and it's so nice to see that you really take a holistic uh, approach to everything that you're doing there at the Rescue Ranch and beyond. So kudos to you and this really amazing work. Um, Anna Maria, you, you mentioned at the top, so your presentation was so fast. You have the fastest presentation, I think, of anyone in the whole festival. Well done, gold star to you. Um, where are you right now? You're in, it looks like a, a rehab center. What's going on behind you? Yeah, I'm actually at the clinic. Sorry about that. I was, I was going a little bit too fast. Um, I have the animals on my back. Um, I start over here. We have a small uh, critter. This is a green, green, great green macaw. It's a baby that we just received today. We fed her and she's just sleeping over there. And on the other side, I have um, some sloths. I can actually bring them closer to you guys so you can see. Okay. We won't pass up an opportunity to see some sloths. Never. Oh, hello, darling. I will start with this little guy over here. Oh, nice. He's very, very small. Uh, he was found on the nest by itself. And that's when they brought it to us. It's the first case we have received that is not for the grand green macaw. So it's very interesting to understand what's going on with this little fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an uh, owl over here. This owl is actually a victim of electrocution, as I was saying. It yeah. comes from the Sarapiki area. And we are rehabilitating him back in, into the wild. Um, his wing is actually doing better, so we're, we're going to hope that we can release him back into the wild. This is a very special case over here. Okay. Uh, this is a mama slot and a baby slot. We just received them a few days ago. Wow. Uh, sadly, they were both electrocuted. Mama is not doing that great. Uh, we have her with an IV, and the baby slot is doing great. He's gaining weight. He's actually sucking right now at milk, so this is a very special opportunity. Yeah. But yeah, sadly, she's one of the most critical patients we have right now. Uh, she was just fed by the interns. And we hope, well, we hope that she gets better, uh, but we have to do a little bit more testings with her. We have um, this other slot that just arrived in today. As I was saying, some of the conflicts these animals receive more often is uh, getting hit by cars. She was hit by a car in the drive, in, well, in a highway. Yeah. And we think she has fractured arms, so we're going to do some x-rays tomorrow and make some decisions about her. Wow. And then we have another slot over here, more electrocuted slot. Um, the hair electrocution is not as severe, but we're trying to save her hand currently. And we're going through some very special treatments uh, like collagen and tilapia skin. And she now is eating, so that's a very good thing. <laughs> then we go into the babies. Um, 
I'm not going to open the kennel of this one because she gets a little bit stressed out, but we that's, have this. That's, not stressed out. that's okay. We can stay away from her, but we've seen so much already. So if you want to, that is just so fantastic. What a, I, I have to ask, so many of the creatures there were electrocuted. Is there a way to mitigate this problem or, or where are they getting electrocuted? Are they climbing from trees onto electric wires or where is this happening? Um, this is a very common problem in Costa Rica. Uh, you have patches of, of wild forest that connects with patches of, of towns, and the towns are in the middle of nowhere. And Costa Rica is it is full of forest, so and and it, um, it's full of everything. So you, you, to connect uh, the electricity for the people to continue living, they have to put the wires, and these wires go through the canopy. So whenever the, the trees, uh, the slots are going around in the trees. They found the wires and they, they think it's like a highway to go faster from one patch of the forest into another patch of the forest. So they start to go on, on these on these wires and usually when they can make the connection to another wire, that's when they get electrocuted. Right. It's one of the most common problems we have had and we are working right now in the in the area zone uh, with ISE and with SPH to locate where all the, the most electrocutions are happening to try to cover the power lines. Uh, we're working with the government to find a way to cover the power lines and avoid uh, slots, especially, and monkeys getting electrocuted. Yeah, that's, a, a, again, a science-based approach, which is really, really cool. And I, I hope that you get the, the facts on that really soon and have the capacity to do that. Because, I mean, we've had in some of our other broadcasts, you know, these simple, simple solutions can prevent animals from going where you don't want them to. Beehives in Africa prevent elephants from coming into people's farmsteads. And I think that's such a special approach and can be really, really low cost and high impact. So I, I wish you well with that. But certainly in our past broadcast with you, electrocution really is does seem to be a really huge problem. So I'm so curious. You have so much specialized knowledge how to save species like this, but being electrocuted for a sloth seems like a pretty big deal. How do you go about saving them? Or you talked about saving a hand. I mean, what, what is actually involved in this? How long does it take to rescue these creatures? Well, it, it depends on the sloths. Sloths are very interesting creatures. They can be uh, they can be really amazing. They can they can have horrible injuries yeah. where they ha they're full of maggots and they're still walking around and acting like nothing is happening, or they can take forever to heal. Um, so we actually have a slot that has been here for almost six months because he has an injury that just doesn't want to close down. So what we do is, well, we do a triage. We find out what is going with the slot. And sometimes the, the bad thing about electrocutions is that they, they burn from the inside to the outside. So whenever we're doing the treatments, uh, there's, there's necrosis going on on, on, the, on the tissue on a cellular level. So the, the tissue starts dying and sometimes we have to amputate. And we have so many cases of electrocuted slots that have to be amputated. Uh, but we have a very good rehabilitation program and release program, and we have actually released many slots that have been amputated back into the wild. Yeah, I, it, it's so funny for me because I've had the pleasure of, of doing so many broadcasts with you guys who have seen some of this in action, seeing these creatures, you know, getting back to health and it's such a special thing. But what I want to do is, is make sure that anyone who wants to tune in to find out more, toucanrescueranch.org, you guys really do some of the top-notch social media and website stuff to showcase the work that you're doing in the entire planet. So I really encourage everyone when you're doing this broadcast, check out that website and you can see some of this all happening, which is very, very cool. So with a One Health approach, you, you started your talk talking about uh, animal and human diseases transmitting to one another. Is there a way to combat this? Are you seeing this in a place like Costa Rica, where, as you said, there's, there's so much forest, there's so much everything, there's so much connection between wildlife and people. Um, are you noticing more zoonotic transfers? Are you noticing, I don't know, what's going on? <laughs> well, we have been noticing more diseases coming up. Um, I mean... Then it was not a problem, and now it's a big concern in Costa Rica. So but it's happening all over the world, and it's really, really important. The one thing I can say is that bushmeat is not really big in Costa Rica. Animals are morally more kept like pets instead of like uh, as an income yeah. uh, or food. So that's the main problem. The, also, the, one of the biggest problems in Costa Rica is the transmission of diseases between pets and wildlife. So that's what, what really, really worries the people around having too many birds in one area and then having wild birds coming in and out. So that's that's something that is, is uh, needs to be more researched. Yeah. I, uh, for me personally, my first introduction to, to zoonoses in, in the world was a book called Spillover by David Quammen, which is just the most amazing book. So if you're really keen to find out more about this topic, I really encourage people to check that out. It's a fantastic, sort of scary resource and very presaging of things going on with, with COVID and more right now. So a really, really cool read to sort of uh, tie in this presentation. 
Uh, Anna Maria, before we wrap up, one thing that I want to uh, stress now that we have so much time, which is great, um, is no, and it was great, by the way, it really is nice to have an opportunity to have more of a conversation. We haven't had that chance because the presentations are so short. This has been really special. So thank you for this. Um, <laughs> With Costa Rica, you guys as a country are a real success story globally of conservation, of you know, setting aside lands for protected areas. I mean, it, it, in some ways, it's sort of a, a privilege to be in a position where you can rehabilitate and re-release so many wild like, animals back to the, to the wild because you have that wild to do so. There's a lot of ecotourism in Costa Rica. Um, can you speak a little bit to what's happened in the country in the last 30, 40 years to really make that possible? Well, to be completely uh, honest, I come from Mexico. I actually oh, yeah. started working in Costa Rica recently. But it's because Costa Rica is so good at what, it, what it's been doing. It's, it has been so green and they have put so many laws in place to, to, to and well, and they have working amazingly with the ecotourism. So it's, I think it's mainly the focus that they had on ecotourism that they found out that they needed to take care of their own resources that makes it so appealing to people like me that we decided to migrate here and be like, I want to work there. That was a beautiful segue from my terrible setup. That was awesome. Thank you for that very much. Um, Anna Maria, this has been so much fun. Is there a place? So we've got the Re Re Rescue Ranch website. Uh, you highlighted some social media posts at the end. If people wanted to contribute to your work, if people wanted to learn more about sloths and rehabilitation in this One Health approach generally, is there a place that we could send them? Is there a place that you'd really recommend personally given your expertise? Well, if you well, if you want to apply for a, a professional internship, we have several, and, and we we always work with re rehabilitation. We have the the clinical um, internships. That it's one over here. The other one is at the release side. So it will be very cool if they want to hop on and be part of the internships. Oh, and we also have the virtual internships if you guys want to like hop on and learn a little bit more of our release program. Yeah. So that those places will be a good way to start. Fantastic. Hey, you mentioned at the top that you had interns helping you out. And I don't think there's any better internship in the world than feeding baby sloths or helping <laughs> care for things. It's a pretty special opportunity. So Anna Maria, thank you so much for your time today. It's such a neat organization that you guys have going and it's so nice to hear about a little bit of a different side of it than we got the chance to feature yesterday. So thank you so, so much for this. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Well, have a wonderful day. Keep up the amazing work and we will see you again soon, I assure you. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs> All right, guys, we are in the home stretch. We've got four and a half hours, I think, left in our, our 72 plus hours of broadcasting. It has been such a special Global Biodiversity Festival. So thank you so much for tuning in. I think I said at the top of my program half an hour ago, I think we have been to either all seven continents or very close to it today, which is pretty incredible. I know we've gone to Antarctica twice over the course of the broadcast uh, series and over 50 countries on all seven continents. So thank you so much for tuning in. You can travel the world without a passport and see all the amazing conservation work being done to save species and habitats around the globe. We are almost ready to turn it over to our next host and our next speaker, but what I want to do is highlight again the support of one of our amazing partners. Bringing together 150 plus broadcasts is not done in isolation and alongside the truly incredible work of Joe Grabowski to make this possible, I wanted to highlight the support of Lenovo. So I'm going to play a little video from them on some of their amazing education initiatives before I turn it over to Wes Delavola. Uh, let me bring that right up, guys. coffee in the morning. I'm just going to play that video and just hype myself up all the time. That was a lot of fun. Um, I want to highlight one more thing. we got so much time. This is like a rare opportunity in our broadcast. We can sit back, relax, mull over what we've heard over the last hour or two hours or ten hours, however long you've been joining us. But what I want to stress is one more thing that we are doing throughout the rest of the month of May is the Backyard Bio Global Nature Campaign. So if you are tuning in, if you are a speaker, if you are a host, if you're coming to this for the first time in three weeks next Tuesday, check out our BackyardBio.net campaign. We have been encouraging communities and especially kids around the world to get out locally, wherever they happen to join from around the globe, and take a picture of the local wildlife near them. I can speak to the fact that we did this for the first time in our last Global BioFest. And for me personally, with a biology background, with an intense love of nature, this uh, act of mindfulness, going out and trying to find what lives near you, was really, really special. 
There was a bird in my neighborhood I always thought of as that pretty bird, and now I know it's a red-breasted nuthatch, and I know it's call, and I know more about it. And so just go out, try and find species. My contention is that if you spend just 10 minutes, you will find 10 different kinds of living thing, 10 different ways of making a living on this planet close to you, and share them with hashtag backyard bio or on our iNaturalist.org page. And if you're new to iNaturalist, it is a truly amazing nature tool for connecting amateur and professional naturalists around the world. With that, I'll take my leave. I'm gonna turn it over to our next amazing host to keep this train rolling with an amazing speaker to boot. So Wes, come on in. Thank you so much. Oh, we're both right in. Come on in, nice to see you, man. Nice to see you as well. That was a great presentation. I got to check in on a little bit early and see all the work that's being done to help those sloths and just, just a dedication to biodiversity and animal well-being. It was really wonderful to see, especially as we're starting to wrap up. Yeah, it really is. I mean, the, the passion of all these speakers is such a special thing. And I know we harp on this a lot as hosts, you know, how passionate, how enthusiastic people are. But we really did draw upon yeah. some of the world leaders in conservation. So glad you could tune in and uh, nice to have you here. Yeah, I'm glad to be back for my last hour before we wrap up, which is crazy to think. I felt like I just did my first hour. And here we are, 72 hours later, seven <laughs> countries, <laughs> countless countries, so well, much energy. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to go to bed at some point, but I'll, I'll leave you to keep the train going for us. Thank you so much, man. See you soon. Good to see you. Thank you. And uh, I have to also give another shout out to Lenovo EDU. Thank you for teeing that up. Um, I am behind the Field Expert series, along with some great um, uh, explorers and scientists, which you just saw in that tease up video. So definitely check it out. Head over to Lenovo EDU, which is education.lenovo.us. Take a look uh, and learn more about the field experts that are some of the the scientists that were involved with this, the Great Biodiversity Festival, so you can learn more, engage with them, and, uh, and insp inspire that lifelong learner to everyone. Um, but more importantly, it is now time for our next speaker, who is Lise Lot Lang, and she researches the black-faced black spider monkey. So yeah, black-faced black spider monkey. Um, wasn't sure if that was a typo or if that's correct, but. Please let will let me know. And so she's working in Peru with this amazing animal. And I'm going to bring Lise Let up into the stream. How are you doing? We can't quite hear you. Let me make sure. No. Now maybe now. Okay. Yep. Good. Uh, yeah, it's not a typo. It's called the black face black spider monkey or Peruvian okay. black spider monkey as well. Yeah, you're good. Oh, great. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I was like, okay, that. That, that's right. Sure. It sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit double, but yeah, it's correct. Hey. And now, are you in Peru or are you somewhere else where you're joining us from? No, I'm in Peru, southeastern Peru, and we just had a really big tropical rainstorm, so I hope you guys don't hear too much rain on the background because it's still going on a little bit. But <laughs> Having been in one, of the, one or two of those myself, I know that sound on tin roof. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> calming and also, I think it loud. <laughs> Well, it's very loud two hours ago, so I'm lucky with my timing. <laughs> well, Mother Nature is being nice. She knows that we're here talking about her biodiversity and want to share it with everyone. So she's brought a reprieve into the rain so we can hear you. Now, I have a yeah. question. Do you have a presentation that you're bringing up? Yes, yes, yes. So let me share my screen. Yeah. I okay. want to make sure we get that queued up for you before I leave the... There go. Ah, and I see it. Should work. Oh, yep. Can you guys see it? Yep, I'm going to go ahead and add it to the stream. We're both going to be up here for a quick second. So now I will turn it over to you to tell us more about the uh, the spider monkeys. Thank you. Yeah, welcome, everyone. I, uh, I don't know what time it is for all of you. I don't know if you just channeled in for my presentation, but welcome and thank you for listening to me. I hope I can keep your attention. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about primates in a specific region of Peru, uh, where I've been working for the last five years. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am, what primatology really is. Um, I'm going to go over the species that we have in the region of Las Piedras, and I will tell you more specifically about the black-faced black spider monkey, um, Atelis gemex, the species name. There are threats that they face and solutions since they're an endangered species here. And I will also shed a light a bit on like my future plans. So, well, as has been said, my name is Lieselot Lange. I'm 27 years old, I'm from the Netherlands, and since I was young I always knew that I wanted to help animals, and whilst I was studying my high school I thought I was going to work with cats and dogs, but as soon as I started a bachelor in wildlife management, I knew, well in animal management, I knew I wanted to work with wildlife, so I did a major in wildlife management. 
Um, during that major, I had a chance to travel to Suriname, which is a country in South America. And there I got into contact with primates in captivity and in primates in the wild as well. And I was kind of fascinated by them. And I actually wanted to do something to help conserve them in the wild. Um, both these pictures, I think, show that not necessarily monkeys are that happy behind bars and especially also not maybe in someone's household as a pet. So I want to contribute to keeping primates wild and in, in the wild. So I returned to Europe and I did a master's degree in primate conservation in the UK, actually in England. Um, I, with that degree, I can call myself a primatologist and I've been working in this field since 2016 when I graduated that master's. So what is primatology specifically? Primatology is the study of primates, of the order of primates, which includes all sorts of monkeys and primates, whether it's a small mouse lemur in Africa or a tarsier in, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia or spider monkeys in, in South America. But what we study about primates is either behavior, evolution, taxonomy, biology, it can be all sorts of things, diets. Um, and as you can see in this photo, you see all of the species that we have or genuses. I specifically focused on South American primates during my studies and during my work, and mostly on the spider monkeys, which is the Atelis family. So from the Netherlands, I kind of moved to South America and left my roots. Um, and I've been working for the, since 2016 in this specific region of southeastern Peru, which is the Las Piedras River. Um, within the circle, you can see the area that we focus on. In the little map on the left on the bottom, you can see that we have various concessions, forestry concessions that we are protecting, kind of creating a corridor. And when I say we're protecting that, it's with the organization I work for currently called Jungle Keepers. Um, we have a ranger program where we work with Peruvian rangers that are actually currently in the field and protecting this corridor of wildlife of both flora and fauna. Um, they go on daily patrols, they walk the concessions and they make sure that there's no illegal logging or hunting occurring on these forestry protect, uh, protected forestry concessions. I'm currently in Puerto Maldonado, which on the map is on the bottom corner on the right. That's a small growing, quickly growing um, jungle town, we call it. Uh, there's a lot of miners here. There's a lot of gold mining going on in this region of Peru. Um, so it's a typical jungle town, but it's growing and developing quick. And with that, you can also see the development actually in this map, because if we see on the right side, you see a yellow road going up, which is the interoceanic highway. And there's a lot of deforestation always correlating with highways. And you can see that there's a lot of like empty patches there, which is all agricultural plots. So Puerto Maldonado and with the highway coming through has caused a lot of human development recently, which is the reason why we need to up our game a little bit in conserving as well some of the wildest places that are still left here. Within the Las Piedras River, we have multiple species of monkeys. So I'm gonna just run by them uh, one by one. So first of all, the black-faced black spider monkey, which I'm gonna go into more detail about as well in a little bit. Their common name here is Makisapa, and they're the endangered species that we find of monkeys in this region. They usually live high up in the canopy and they have a highly frugivorous diet, which means that they consume a lot of fruits. The next species that we have here is the Colombian red howler monkey, Aluata semiculus. Um, they're a least concerned species at the moment. They are hunted a lot as well. They usually live in the high canopy levels as well, but they eat more leaves instead of fruits. So they don't directly compete with the spider monkeys because they live at the same forest level, but they have a different diet. This avoids conflict between the two. Then there's Saki monkeys, very furry looking monkey, very strange looking monkey. Um, I've only seen it a couple of times, maybe 10 times in total. They're very shy and they often flee up on site. We call them Mono Wapo here. Um, there's not much known about them. And actually the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, they don't even have enough data to decide whether they're like a least concerned species or you know if they're vulnerable or if they're threatened, we don't really know. They mostly eat like nuts and harder fruits. Uh, they have special canines that help them crack those nuts open. This is a white-fronted capuchin. I'm just gonna show you it's a little video. It's one of the camera traps we had in one of our concessions. So it's a very cute monkey. <laughs> Sees the camera and then decides, mm, 
maybe not today. Pop us back. So this is a white-fronted capuchin. We actually have two species of capuchins within the Las Piedras region. We have this one, which is a slightly bigger one. And then we have this capuchin, which is the black-capped or large-headed capuchin. Um, there's some confusion in the literature about which species it really is. The IUCN has them as Sapajus apella, and other papers or literature will refer to them as Sapajus macrocephalus. Um, we here call them the black capuchins, usually in Spanish. They're a least concerned species, and both capuchin species roam usually between lower levels of the forest and middle levels of the forest, where they hunt for insects, where they hunt birds, lizards as well, and frogs, but they also eat a lot of fruits. So they're omnivore species. This is a tapid titi monkey. Titi monkeys are another species that are very shy. They're like medium sized and they're usually found in like in bamboo forest patches. They really like to eat the leaves of the bamboo forest. Um, quite hard to spot, but they have a very loud uh, noise actually that usually in the mornings they will use to mark their territory. So they will sing in a group with the male leading and the females joining into the singing. And it's a very impressive sound, so definitely look it up if you have a chance to. We have night monkeys as well. So we usually don't see these ones um, during the day. This specific individual I photographed in a rescue center. That's why it's out in bright and uh, broad daylight. We call them musmukis here, quite hard to study. There is a primatologist here actually in the same region that is studying these guys at the moment, um, doing a PhD on them. But yeah, they're very cute looking. Um, I love going out early mornings in the forest and try and find some because they're very interesting as well to find. They have such big eyes, of course, to help them see better, but they also have a, a better smell than most monkeys here to be able to find fruits, ripe fruits. The reason that they're active at night is again to avoid maybe competition with some of the other species that are also fruitivorous. So whilst they are foraging at night, they won't have other monkeys trying to fight them because the other monkeys will just be sleeping. Uh, the next species that we have here is the squirrel monkey. Maybe all of you guys know this. It's a monkey from Pippi Longstocken as well. We've seen that in the movie. Um, it's a least concerned species. These guys actually travel in very large groups, sometimes up to 100 individuals. Um, they're a small monkey. They eat mostly insects and a little bit of fruits. And sometimes they travel together with capuchins. The reason why they do that, we don't really know for sure, but there's several theories. And I think the most probable one is both for safety reasons, the more the better. And if the capuchins are there, they have maybe a better protection against like predators such as harpy eagles and vice versa, because those capuchins will also profit from the multiple eyes, like trying to scan for predators. And as well, because of foraging reasons, if you travel with more monkeys and heavier monkeys, like the capuchins might um, wake up the insects which will start flying around and then the squirrel monkeys will be able to catch them and eat those. Another monkey that we have here is the Goldies monkey. I've never had the pleasure to actually finding this one in the wild. Um, very hard to find but it has been spotted within our concessions. It's a monkey that usually lives quite close to the ground. They mostly forage on fungi so they actually look for the mushrooms. And of course, mushrooms mostly grow, grow on decomposing wood, which is found near the forest floor. So they are quite near the floor usually. Um, and I really do hope I get to see at least a glimpse of one one day. Another species of smaller monkey is the saddleback tamarind. Um, they're very cute. They travel with like maybe five monkeys. They eat fruits and insects as well. Um, and yeah, they, we have several species of smaller monkeys. So both the Gouldy monkey that I just showed, this one, this one, they're all in the same family. Um, and including this one as well, the Emperor Tamarind, which has the really nice moustache. I have not seen this species in the wild either, yet there has been confirmed sightings of the species within our concessions. Um, they're very pretty to look at, of course. And then the final species that we have confirmed, there might be even more species, but this is the last species that we have confirmation of is the Pygmy marmoset. Uh, actually, the photo of it in the in the tree, this one, was taken by one of our forest rangers from the Jungle Keepers organization that he took like a couple of months ago. And it's the first like record we actually have on photo. So that's amazing and very exciting news for all of us to have that species now confirmed in the region. 
So now I'm going to switch a little bit to why protect spider monkeys and their habitat. We first will hear a little bit about their role in the ecosystem. As I said before, spider monkeys are highly fruitivorous. They eat like a lot of fruits. So spider monkeys, as they are like the largest monkeys here, actually, they also eat the largest fruits. And some of the examples are Ananasea, Aracea, Moracea, and Sapotacea. In this picture, it's the Sapotacea. Um, if you can see that the seed is almost four centimeters long. Spider monkeys can actually swallow these seeds whole, versus other monkeys will probably like chew on them and break those seeds whilst they're consuming them. The reason why spider monks are so special is that they don't actually break the seeds while they are consuming them. And that means that the seed will be carried in their stomachs for various kilometers before it gets pulled out and then can germinate with the, with the feces. So the feces are actually a natural fertilizer for the seed to grow. This means that spider monkeys are one of the main seed dispersal agents we have here in the Amazon together with tapirs. Tapirs are also, and we heard a talk about tapirs earlier, tapirs are also a major seed dispersal agent. Um, there's currently some studies being carried out here as well in the Amazon about differences in rainforest where spider monkeys have been hunted to extinction and tapirs as well, so we don't have those large body mammals anymore versus forests where we still have these species and there's a very clear difference in the spreading of those seeds. Where there's no spider monks and no tapirs, the seeds will usually just be scattered around the mother tree. But where we do have these animals, the seeds are spread over various kilometers, which of course keeps the forest a lot more healthy. Another reason why we need to protect spider monkeys from extinction is because they have a very slow reproduction and a very long lifespan. They that means they grow slowly, right? They can't really reproduce quickly to recover populations that have been impacted by human development or human activity. Their age of fertility, so the age where they can be produced is only at like four or five years old, where they will start having young. And usually they only have one young every three, two or three years. They nurse their, or they have a gestation period of eight months. So that's very similar to human. We of course carry our babies for nine months in the stomach the in the bellies in the womb and spider monks do that for eight months before the baby is born and they nurture young for almost three years as well with the first one and a half year the baby traveling on the back and slowly it will detach from the mom uh, but will stay with her up until the age of three this is the reason why they only have one young every two or three years because they're still caring for the previous young and then i don't know if anyone can take a wild guess of how old spider monkeys are I know you guys can't interact with me, so I'm gonna just tell you, but I think I might surprise some people. But spider monkeys have reached up to 50 years in captivity. There's actually a monkey in the Appenhill, which is a zoo in the Netherlands, a primate specialized zoo, and it reached 50 years, which is an amazing age. And I don't think we can reach this age with spider monkeys in the wild, but they must reach like around 35 years of age in the wild. I'm going now towards the threats. So what is actually threatening the spider monkeys? Well, one of the major causes of threats is deforestation for cattle ranching. Um, as you might know, a lot of deforestation in the Amazon is caused by deforestation, deforestation for the cattle ranching, where we as consumers buy a lot of beef from South America. So this is a, a small video, right? Where you can actually see the cattle that needs a lot of hectares to be cleared for them to have enough grass to feed on. And in the picture on the right, you see that same field that's cleared for the cattle, but with one standing solitary Brazil nut tree. The Brazil nut tree is an endangered species and it's a protected species by law, but you can't cut the Brazil nut tree, but you can cut all the ecosystem around it, which still means that the Brazil nut tree will most likely not survive and die off in a couple of years. This is completely legal though. People can just, uh, the forest around the Brazil nut trees. So it's very important to protect these forests and as well, not just the deforestation for cattle ranching, there's also deforestation for other agriculture purposes and of course for the gold mining and human development. There's more roads coming into the forest, there's more villages, communities being built, which all contribute to the deforestation of these areas. And spider monks are highly sensitive to these human developments because they need the high canopy levels to travel. And they usually disappear quite quickly when there's human development in the area. The other threat is bushmeat and pet trade. I didn't want to include a picture of bushmeat because it's quite graphical to see, and I, you know, it's not nice to have that on your 
on your <laughs> brain, please, like, memorized. Um, this is a small spider monkey, a young in a, one of the communities along the Las Piedras River, and there's a lot of pet trade. So unfortunately, hunters usually hunt for adult females that carry a baby, um, that gives them extra profit because they can sell the meat of the mom, and they can sell the baby in the pet trade. Unfortunately, monkeys still form a large part here of rural diets, which is okay if it's sustainable hunting. We all understand that, but unfortunately, in recent years, like it's not really sustainable hunting anymore, but now it's more commercial hunting. And especially with COVID, we saw a massive increase in hunting and uh, illegal activities within the forest. So some of the solutions we have in order to help conservation of these beautiful monkeys is law enforcement. Unfortunately, Peru is quite a corrupt country. Um, no offense, but it is, and I've seen it like firsthand here. It's hard to get anything done. People that have pet monkeys, which is completely illegal, as they're an endangered species, both by Peruvian law and international law, uh, police will just look the other way, or you can bribe the police here as well. And the region where we work in Las Piedras, there's actually no governmental authority present. There's no forestry departments, there's no police stations, there's nothing. So it's kind of like the Wild West, I want to say, where you can just do whatever you want. There's no one that really cares unless like someone puts in a, or reports it to the authorities. We should work with the government and try and fix this issue. So what we as the jungle keepers try to do is maybe get more governmental presence within the area of Las Piedras, where we want to in the future build like a control post and even have governmental um, rangers there. Because right now we only have private rangers that work for our uh, organization. We don't have any governmental rangers there present, which would really help um, with setting a presence for the region. Since having said that, like one of the other major things we can do here is provide job opportunities. We do that currently by providing jobs for rangers, as position of ranger, but we also are planning to continue uh, growing our projects and we want to do reforestation projects where we would hire like local community members to help us reforest like deforested areas. Um, we also want to help help them with their agricultural projects. There's a lot of local communities that have their farms, but they're not really using them sustainably. So giving them advice on how can they grow their crops more sustainable and how can they contribute to conservation and maybe do some reforestation in parts of their farm so that they help uh, conservation in general. Some of the monkeys that come into the pet trade are lucky enough to make it back into the wild through rehabilitation and reintroduction programs. So we have a re reintroduction program in the Madre de Dios area of Peru, uh, which is run by the Rescue Center Tarikaya. That's where I took this picture. You can see the mother has actually a color on, a GPS color, which with we track them uh, after reintroduction. So some of the monkeys that we can get out of the illegal pet trade can potentially be reintroduced back into the wild, which of course helps contributing to population maintaining populations. Um, what, what I want to say is, yeah, not we can't save all of the individuals, of course, in the illegal trade, and not all of them can be reintroduced, but there's a large proportion of individuals that we have been able to bring to the rescue center and that have been successfully reintroduced. These spider monkeys are being reintroduced in an area where they've actually been hunted to extinction, so it's bringing them back to an area where they actually been, have been exploited in the past. Hopefully it will have a positive effect on that forest there or surrounding because it's been without spider monkeys for many years. And the last one I have here is environmental education. So I think education is always mm, really important. Like we have to educate the youth, the local youth as well. And this is a project that I've been working on for a couple of years now. I made a children's coloring book in cooperation with many people. Um, but it's actually like being distributed right now through communities. So this has been a cooperation between um, local NGOs here in Puerto Maldonado. It's been by individuals like Alison Stoiser is a good friend of mine who helped me with throwing it. I wrote the story with a friend of another friend of mine, and then there's a lot of other contributors. And currently, I'm actually leaving on this Tuesday to distribute this to three communities along the Las Piedras River, which will be the first time this booklet is being distributed along the Las Piedras River. And I can do that because I'm getting financial aid from the organization ACIR. 
I'm a conservation fellow of them this year. They give me a grant to actually be able to bring this booklet to those communities. So I'm very grateful to that as well. Other future plans that I have personally is to continue help conservation of habitats, which I do through jungle keepers. Like I work for them as head of operations. I'm not currently based in the field as much. I used to be, I used to actually study the spider monkeys in the field um, for three years. I was living in the forest in the Amazon rainforest. Currently I work from the town of Puerto Maldonado, but I help this grant great NGO jungle keepers with conserving of habitat, that map that I showed earlier with all those forest concessions. So I want to continue this. I want to help protect more area, more land, because by doing so, we conserve the habitat where those spider monkeys can live, right? I do want to go back to scientific research and like actually studying the monkeys in the wild. Specifically, I would love to create a project with this albino spider monkey that you can see on these pictures. It is um, the first albino spider monkey that has been registered uh, for this species. It lives along the Las Piedras River as well, in an um, area called Soledad. And I would love to be able to study her, her intergroup re um, relationships, like do they accept her? Do they actually see her as a female? Like would they reproduce with her? Or does she seem like as a different species? How is predator avoidance for her? I think she would be more easily picked out by predators. Um, there's so much we can study also her health. Like, does it have the same health issues maybe a human with albinism would have? So there's a lot of opportunity there. I'm really excited to be able to work on that more. But currently, what I said, I'm doing more on environmental education. And specifically right now, I'll be traveling to the Las Piedras and try and help protect these monkeys, these spider monkeys. So I think that's it for me. I want to thank you all for your attention. I'm sure there might be some questions. I think I went over that quite quickly. Um, here's some contact details for me if anyone wants to write to me or reach out, my email and Instagram for both me and for Jungle Keeper, so the NGO with, with who I work. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, yeah, and then if there's any questions. <laughs> well, thank you for such a great presentation and get, helping us get to know the, the, the varied species of spider monkeys that call Peru home. I have a quick question. How, how, how is it that there are so many different species of spider monkeys? Why, what about Peru makes it such a hot spot for these okay. primates? So the monkeys that I showed, not all of them were spider oh. monkeys, right? So just the, the, big, the big black one, the first one I showed, and then the others are just other monkey species that we have in the area. But we are located in like very near to a biodiversity hotspot called Alta Burus. And it's like where the Andes goes into the rainforest section. And it's there's so much abundance of wildlife. And this specific region, the Las Piedras is very intact still. It has a lot of intact forests. If we compare it with different regions in Peru, there has been a lot more human development and a lot more agricultural um activities which have meant that a lot of the wildlife has kind of disappeared so as i said um in some of the regions there's actually spider monks are hunted to extinction but in las Piedras we see these megafauna that we still still see the spider monkeys we see the tapirs we have those species still because it's quite intact but it's under a massive threat by illegal activities and no governmental presence yeah well that it's good to hear that there are places that are still, you know, being able to support biodiversity and good pop and good sized populations. So that I'm sure is encouraging. Um, if we are ever to be in Peru and be in an urban area or not an urban area, what should we think about when we see these monkeys or any of the primates um, in the trees around us? Yeah, what you well take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> like I, uh, when you are have the chance to visit. Puerto Maldonado and like this region of the Madre de Dios department of Peru, like you will see that there is abundance of wildlife, but the most common species here are the howler monkey, the capuchins and the squirrel monkeys. I think that's the species that most people will see. If you want to see spider monkeys, you might have to travel a little bit further into pristine rainforest to be able to find them. And if you see them, like enjoy the moment. We don't interact with the monkeys in the wild like never feed a monkey like don't don't do that because you're gonna like be able to transmit diseases you will make them be very used to human we get biting incidents like it's a no-go for 
uh, primatologists and like researchers in general to try and feed the monkeys. Like that's a no go for us. But yeah, just really enjoy and appreciate the moment. When I studied these spider monkeys for three years, like they came really close to me, but still always had like some three, five meter distance from me. Yeah. Amazing well, though. That's good advice to remind everyone if you are traveling and you see any primates, you know, keep your distance, you observe them but don't try not to interact and definitely don't feed them because of all those reasons that you said. So thank you for that advice um, as we are, you know, traveling and potentially in the near future and see any primates. It's a yeah. good way to not interact with them. So Lizlet, thank you very much for presenting today and being part of the Global Biodiversity Festival. And thank you for the opportunity. Primates of Peru. So thank you for that. Thank you. And we have one more speaker. We have well, we have more than one more speaker, but there's a speaker about to come up. And um, I have to, <clears throat> before we bring her up, I want to let everyone know um, that we are, of course, uh, getting some great support from Rolex, who supports the Global Biodiversity Festival as part of the Perpetual Planet Initiative. And more importantly, they also support a lot of incredibly talented scientists, leaders, and educators with their laureate program. And that laureate program has been going on for 40 years and awards funding to one to, to, to amazing scientists from all over the planet and other leaders. We've already met one this, this time around, and that's Krithi Karnath, who spoke earlier. And we're about to bring up another laureate um, from Rolex for our next speaker. So just a reminder that Rolex does support the Global Biodiversity Festival as part of its Perpetual Planet Initiative and which supports individuals and organizations using science to understand the world's environmental challenges. And if you wanna learn more about the Laureate Program and what Rolex is doing to support uh, work like you're seeing today, uh, head over to this website, rolex.org slash Rolex Awards slash laureates. Um, and with that, we are well, we're about to bring up our next speaker who is a National Geographic Emerging Explorer, also a Rolex Laureate, and an educator who has bring, been bringing education and empathy to her um, home region of the peninsula of the Yucatan for I think it is now 20 years. Um, I'm really excited to bring her up next, and that's Maritza Morales Casanova. Morales Casanova, so we'll bring her up right now and welcome her to the stream. Hello, Maritza. Hi, Wes. How are you? Doing well. It's so good to see you. It's been way too long, but I love that we get to catch up a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, congratulations for all these efforts to get together so many environmentalists, conservationists around the world. It's amazing. The, bio, the, bio, the Global Biodiversity Festival has definitely become that this year. Uh, we have 60 countries represented, all seven continents. A big round of applause to Joe Grabowski and the Exploring by the City of Your Pants team for putting this all together. And thank you to every one of our speakers, especially as we wrap up and are excited to learn more about what each of you do. Now, Maritza, do you have a presentation to share with us? Yes, but I want first to give a short talk with no presentation and okay. then I can share the, the screen. Okay. It's well, okay. If, you want, if you want right now, go ahead and share the screen. I won't put it up but it'll be easier to have it queued up and ready for when you're ready. You yeah, sure. it for me? Great. Okay, I'm ready. All right, so just go ahead and click your, if you share the screen, we'll bring, it won't come up into this screen. We'll still have just you, but we'll have it ready. That way, when you are ready for it, I can just do one quick click and it'll be ready to go. Great, thank you. Well, uh, first I want to say hello in Spanish. It's something that I used to do. Hola a todos. Desde la península de Yucatán. Hello, everybody from the Yucatán. We are in the southeast of Mexico, near to the Caribbean. And 25, 26 years ago, I launched a movement when I was 10 years old that is called Hunap. But most children say that I train heroes for Grandma Earth and that I can translate the scientific information into a simple way to understand what scientists as are discovering on nature. Because many times we don't want to hurt Grandma Earth. We don't want to hurt or contaminate our wetlands or the rainforest. But we are doing without knowing that our actions are having negative impact 
of nature. So that's why I decided to develop a methodology that is called, here you have, that is called uh, HUNAP. Um, let me see. It. HUNAP stands for Humans Unite with Nature in Harmony for Beauty, Welfare, and Willingness. And the base of our philosophy are 18 principles that empower children and teens as heroes for Grandma Earth. Montambiente is a mix of two words. Mondar in Spanish is a verb and means to change. Ambientes in Spanish, if you translate it into English, means environment. So how can we change the environment in a positive way? If you practice the Mondambientes, you can coexist in harmony with nature. Because everything around us is nature, even our cities. There were nature, but now we modified this landscape into cities or villages or towns. So we're still making connections with nature, we're still in touch with wildlife, and sometimes we can get troubles or conflicts with these natural resources. And I want to start with a question. When you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you remember? Because many of us who were talking during these three days, non-stop days, uh, we started to take action when we were children. And something in common, I think, is that there weren't schools for each one of us where we can learn how to be environmentalists. I mean, when I was a child, I saw my friends, those who love sports, they join clubs to learn more about football, to polish their talent in different sports. And the same happened for those who love arts. If you love singing, if you love music, or you want to polish your talent to draw better, there are schools for you. But who can teach you or where can you learn how to use a microscope or how to use um, a, a magnifier? And there are no places where you can receive training. That's why I decided to create a special place where children can have fun and learn more about Grandma Earth. And you're going to listen that I, I say Grandma Earth many times because children in Hunap say that Mother Earth, because of the time now, it's Granny Earth. And children have a strong connection with grandparents and they are taking action. So let's see some heroes for Grandma Earth projects. I want to share you. Um, this information. Sarai, she is 12 years old and she is focused in soil restoration and she's only 12. But she has been training during seven years, practicing compost, making inquiry, and even facing some feelings that even we as adults can felt when we are in front of a camera. Imagine if you are participating in an interview, it is very normal to be nervous, but what happens if you're only 12? So that's part of the training for the heroes of Grandma Earth. And we co-develop lessons to teach other children about compost and soil restoration. Sarai also has different connections with other young leaders who are uh, taking action. Here you can see Sofia, she's 14 years old, and her project is focused on water conservation because Yucatan has a unique characteristic. We have no rivers, we have no lakes. 
all fresh water is under the ground. So if we don't prevent the, the pollution of the soil, if we don't prevent water contamination, we're going to be in trouble because it's the only resource, uh, we, the only source we have to fresh water. So she started to take action when she was seven years old. And here you can see some photos about how she is taking inquiry and also developing a puppet lesson to inspire older children. And she's connecting with gardening also. This, this is interesting because it's like giving the opportunity for the new generations to take action from childhood. It's very common to see young people uh, like as leaders for different projects, but it's not common to see children taking action. Also, Fedra, she is 15 years old and she's focused on nutrition. She wants to prevent child cancer and during the mentoring program, when first I listened that she is focused on cancer, I was worried about how it can make a connection with nature. How can you make a connection between nutrition and conservation? And she's very smart and she was focused on how the food that we eat, how our nutrition has a strong connection with crops and also with sustainability. You can see how in the pandemic, most of us started to gardening, trying to germinate the plants, the seeds, as a refuge because of the lockdown. So it is important to understand that environmental education is not only talking about our concerns, it's making a comprehensive connection between different topics and not only about natural sciences. So FEDRA uh, has been presenting her project in different uh, audiences and venues, like National Geographic Kids event, and their next step for, for her project. I'm going to move a little bit quicker because of, of the time. Chanat and Matias, they are brothers and they are making a storytelling on their own style, translating this information for other children and developing, co-developing games with, with HUNAP team. So something interesting is how children have the same language. Many times we as adults have a different message for children and we overthink about how to express terminology that could be difficult for children. But when you give kids the opportunity to be teachers, to be those who are, who are going to share the information, it's, it's interesting. David also, he is uh, 13 years old. He is protecting uh, the native crops, the native maize in, in Mexico. And it's funny because if you take a look to the to his bag when he's going to school, and if you see what's inside his bag, you can see that he has no toys. He has some books, but he has cars inside from different colors. So he, he is very committed with this. And I want to show you the place where children are training as heroes for Grandma Air. When you see kids, you can see how they smile, and also you can see the bright on their eyes. I think that kids are the best teachers because they can share the knowledge, they can share the feelings with the same language. Maritza Morales Casanova runs an environmental learning center for Huna on the outskirts of Medida, the capital city of Yucatan of young people how to care for the community's fragile environment. There are schools to learn more about music and if you want to be an artist, there are places when you can polish your talent. But what happens is as a child, you want to be an environmentalist. When they come to this gate, they experience how to be heroes for Grandma Earth. 
Kunov was founded by Morales Casanova when she herself was only 10 years old and runs in a model of peer-to-peer -peer learning. When we see kids sharing the knowledge, the first thing that they do is to understand the message for themselves and then to share it through a simple way. They share the information very clear and very honest. Right now, the information about the environment is very alarmist. It's very negative around the world. We cannot teach about the theory of climate change, just to scare kids about what's going to happen. What we need to do is to inspire them. 15-year-old Paul grew up in Yucatan and started coming to the center from a very young age. Before coronavirus forced the park to close to visitors, he taught weekly classes on plants and their medicinal capabilities. The best of it. I would say because they are more sensitive, because an adult often clings to his beliefs or clings to his knowledge. Also 15 years old, Fedra has been attending Huna for six years. She now teaches students about how diet impacts the environment. I think it's very important here at Hunab that they teach you everything about the environment and that they also see the value in us as teachers. In its 25 years, Morales Casanova tells us that Hunab has trained as many as 50,000 young people to be environmentalists. But the coronavirus pandemic has been a real threat to its mission. Remote learning may be a challenge, but it's urgent work, according to Morales Casanova. We are printing the material, sending by mail, or visiting the communities so they can keep working and training as heroes for Grandma Earth. In a few years, they are governors, they are politicians, or they are entrepreneurs. We don't know, but I'm sure that they are going to make decisions that respect all living beings. Well, that's the video, that's the place where we are training heroes for Grandma Air. And now we are making alliances with other organizations um, to replicate the methodology, but also we seek to build new environmental educational team parks around the world because the environmental educational system and the world is not giving results. And that made me wonder about this question. Why environmentalists still complain about people? Why we, or those who are taking action to protect the environment, making science, why we still complain about pollution, about illegal trade? And my answer is with other question. Look at this photo. I, I took this photo last year in Yucatan because uh, we had uncommon raining season and flamingos just came near to the, to the city. So you can see how local people just was some steps far from the flamingos taking this, these photos. And how can we ensure that people can coexist in harmony with all this wildlife. We still connected with nature. And the answer is that environmental education history is not enough. Do you know how old contemporary environmental education history is? It has almost 50 years. In fact, my grandma is older than the history of environmental education. It was in 1972 when first, the, the first times when humans decided that it was important to protect natural resources if we want to ensure the development, the economic development of, of the world, because natural resources are the base of the economy, the health and different topics. So only 50 years do you seem that you have learned enough about nature, about 
harmonic coexistence, coexistence at the school? I don't think so. And you know what? This is not different from where are you from? Doesn't matter if you are from a developing or a developed country, both of them have lack of environmental education. And it is also because we are not learning enough. Uh, we are not learning at the same way we are learning maths. In the kindergarten, we can practice how to draw a number. And then in elementary school, you jump into a level, a more complicated level of maths. And then you move forward to high school and arithmetics and different topics for maths. But why we are not learning about environmental education at the school? And something frustrating in Mexico is that only 20% of Mexicans can study a career. Imagine that. That's why it is very important to learn about conservation from the basic levels of education. And I have also another idea crossing my mind. Why we don't have enough results on environmental education? Because we are giving the wrong message to the wrong audience. How many times have we talking in a negative way? If we talk with other people thinking that they are guilty, they are enemies from conservation, we are just giving the wrong message. We should not develop a curricula to teach about climate change for the elementary school. What we should do is to inspire children about the weather, about the climate science, why it's raining, why the patterns of water are important for vegetation, how these plants are important also for animals and fungi. There are many information that local people need to learn, but Due to ignorance, they are making the wrong actions. And you know what? Children have the best way to give the positive idea. I agree that the negative information should be spread for adults. But as educators, we have a strong responsibility in how we are going to share the message and what are we going to teach. And I'm going to jump to the next topic. I think that other reason why we are lack of results, and when I say we, I doesn't mean HUNAP, I mean we as environmentalists, we as conservation leaders, it's because of lack of didactics. On one hand, teachers don't have enough information, enough knowledge, about the ecology terms, but on the other hand, conservationists don't have enough didactics to engage people or to transmit what they want to share. So we can organize uh, festivals or maybe we can launch a video or develop a story, but that's not enough. Isolated activities cannot change lifestyles and the what we need is to inspire people to change the way they are living, to change their day-to-day -day lifestyles. And for example, here you can see a photo that we are using a crayon, a green crayon, a big root that is teaching children about the importance of making smart decisions when we choose a food. And it is very funny just to make watercolors with the fruits and understand that also have a colorful uh, food. It's healthy for, for our bodies. And the impact, let me uh, share some, some data about the Yucatan. 
Yucatan Peninsula, it's uh, the most important area in Mexico, indigenous area, the biggest one, because our culture, it's about the Maya culture, that's our cosmogony. So we need to be very respectful about the currently contemporary, about the contemporary Maya culture. And what we have achieved so far is that more than 70,000 children and youth during the last two years continuously have been learning about environment in more than 300 communities. And we have trained more than 850 teachers through more than 75,000 educational materials that they are using at the school. And you know what? Uh, this project has inspired these communities to replicate 200 actions to preserve natural resources. So now they are taking actions as heroes for Grand Mayor. And I want to jump to this video from Santiago. He's only 12 years old. And you can see the commitment he has on his heart to inspire and to invite other children. Hola, mi nombre es Santiago, estoy en la organización de JUNAP unos seis años y yo tengo un proyecto, mi proyecto trata de defender a las abejas, mayormente a las meliponas que se encuentran acá en Yucatán. Los invito a apoyarme con este reto, el reto es poner al menos 100, 100 bebederos para las abejas y que ustedes nos manden, nos manden su evidencia en nuestras redes sociales. Ponerlos, tienen que tomarle una foto, eso es todo. Nuestro reto es llegar a 100, si vamos a 200, 300, 500, eso sería mucho mejor. Ya que las abejas pues, serían mucho mejor, tendrían menos calor en estas épocas. Las abejas meliponas son aquellas abejas que no tienen un aguijón propio y viven acá en Yucatán. Me encantan esas abejas. Porque las abejas son muy importantes para nosotros. Ellas hacen el, la polinización, o sea, llevar el polen de una flor hacia otra. Y eso hace que siga la vida en la tierra. Todos podemos ayudar. De cualquier manera lo podemos hacer. Como ejemplo, haciendo nuestros bebederos para las abejas y poner y sembrando más plantas con flores. Okay. El cómic de Junap. El cómic es una manera de poder, es una manera de dar información muy interesante de las abejas. Y lo hacemos por medio del periódico Junap. Ustedes lo pueden visitar en su página web y leerlo. Mi personaje se llama Meliponi, una abeja melipona. Espero que les haya gustado este tema que podemos hablar. Los espero y que me apoyen, que nos apoyen a todas las abejas y a nosotros en nuestro, nuestro reto de poner 100 bebederos de las abejas. And what? Well, there you you can see how kids can take action they are not adults but they are taking it seriously and i have a phrase to recognize what children are doing and it is that their hands may be small but their hearts are huge to protect grandma earth and just to say goodbye i want to share that please do not back to normal lifestyles with this pandemic we had an opportunity to not be to, to not back to to normal. Well, thank you very much, Maritza. That was a really incredible look into your facility in the school and the great students that you have. Um, and I love that message of let's not go back to normal. Uh, let's think about what the world we want to create is going to look like and who's going to be working to make it better. And it's good to see that there are so many students that are coming out of your work and out of your school doing that. Um, what is one, one thing that any student, no matter their age, um, no matter where they are, to do to help Grandmother Earth? It's the one thing, if you could share that with them. Sure, Wes, and I just want to be clear about that. Uh, this is not a normal school. It's not a school, in fact, because children okay. go to normal school and then they come to the park to, to train on a specific topics. 
And my suggestion for both educators and conservationists or, or environmental leaders is to allow children to be children, allow them to take action how they believe they should do it. Because the problem is that we as adults are contaminating children's ideas. Many times we want to do and we are not doing it. Just give children the advice to do it. And we are contaminating their, their own ideas. Some kids have big ideas like Santiago making many uh, these matters and spreading this with that video. And others have single ideas like being responsible from their pets. It doesn't matter. They are trying to take action and to feel that they are useful they, for their communities. That's the most powerful feeling for humans to feel that your life is useful and you are making a difference. You are making a contribution for your community. And that is so important, no matter anyone's age, to have that feeling of being empowered to make a difference and you know work on what you care about and i have to again thank you for all the great work that you've been doing at not not a school <laughs> um but at the park uh which is great to great place to be i know if i were a kid i would have loved it i was about that age 12 where i first started thinking about you know how could i help protect the planet so i'm glad to know that there are people like you maritza and uh, many others passing on that powerful and uplifting message so thank you for joining us today and hope you have a great rest of the day. And thank you so much for sharing everything about your work and the students that you are helping. Thank you, Wes. And just a final quick uh, message. Uh, everybody's welcome to visit us, of course, after the, the pandemic, the emergency. We are to open doors again, October 4th. You're the first ones knowing it. Uh, we, we were closed during that year. so. I want to announce that October 4th is the day when we, we open doors. And if you're not a child, but you want to visit us, please come. And with imagination, we can transform you into a child again. And you can have fun and train as a hero for your admirer. And that is so wonderful to hear because if, if you can have fun while you're trying to help, you know, Grandmother Earth, I can't think of a better thing to do. So thank you so much for that invite and to everyone here. Um, please, of course, you know, get to know Marita better. And it sounds like we've got an open invite in the Yucatan once we can all travel again. So that's also exciting. Thank you again, Marita, and have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. And congratulations for this effort. Well, everyone, welcome back to the last few hours uh, of the Global Biodiversity Festival. We've gone nearly 72 straight hours. We've had scientists and innovators and conservationists from 60 countries, I think it is, and seven continents. And up next, we've got the next host who's gonna take over for a little bit from me, and that's Brianna. How are you doing? Hi there, Wes. Doing Good well. Good to see you again. <laughs> I know, it's great to be back here. You've got a great, great uh, speakers coming up, so I will let you get to that. But uh, hope you have a great, you know, time with the next speakers. And thank you, everyone who's participated today. It's been in the past three days. It's been a lot of fun to be a part of it every step of the way, and look forward to doing it all again next year. Yeah, so I'm sure we're going to celebrate even more. So uh, have a great rest of the afternoon, and I will uh, keep watching and from home. Thanks, Wes. Great, we have an awesome speech speaker coming up next. We have Ariane Elise Harris. Ariane is a biodiversity PhD student in the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Through her research, she's discovered how resilient Guyana's wildlife is and just how important it is to study and conserve these rich communities. Hmm, I don't know much about Guyana, but I'm gonna bring Ariane in here so I can learn a little bit more. Great to have you Hi. here. Hi, welcome. Hi. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. We're excited to learn a little bit about the wildlife um, in one of the smallest islands. Is that right? I guess I'll hear more um, about it. Yeah, well, I have it all in the presentation, but uh, Ghana is uh, one of the smallest countries in the northern part of South America. All right, let's see what, kind, what, what animals and biodiversity and wildlife lives there. Um, if you want to pull up your share screen, I can add it in. I will do that. Great. 
All right, Great. we're seeing it here. Perfect. And you want to click present? Okay. Can you see and the screen fine? We can see the screen. If you can click um, present or uh, yes, presentation mode would, so we can get the full screen. Yeah. Is that good now? Uh, not quite there yet. Maybe in, um, we can hmm. do file or slideshow up in the top there next to animations. Ah, okay. And then from beginning, perfect. Great. Technology. Technology. <laughs> All right. So um, thank you once again for having me, Global BioFest. Um, I am going to be presenting on a topic that's very close to me, uh, which is my home country, Guyana, and a place that I like to call the land of many wildlife communities, because Guyana is known as the land of many waters. Um, so jumping right into it, who am I? So. Um, as you might have guessed, I'm a Guyanese. Uh, I'm 25 years old and um, I study biodiversity of logged rainforests. So particularly population ecologies um, of sea disperser species. So birds, bats and large mammals. And as a fun fact, I love art and animation. Um, I like to say that my blood consists of 50% uh, conservation and 50% art. So there's like literally no in between. <laughs> Um, so Guyana, never heard of her, that's completely fine. As a quick rundown of what Guyana is, um, so it's a country located on the northern side of South America. Its neighbors are Venezuela, Suriname, and Brazil. Um, and its independence is on the 26th of May. It became a cooperative republic on the 23rd of February. The holiday to celebrate this is known as Mashramani, which is indigenous rooted word meaning celebration after hard work. There are five ethnic groups in Guyana, which makes the culture something to really experience and enjoy. And the national dish is pepper pot. Um, if you ever find yourself making it down to Guyana after COVID, um, make sure to try out the national dish. Uh, Guyana has five natural regions. So we have the low coastal plain, which is where the capital Georgetown is located. And it has the majority of, agricul of agricultural activities occurring there. Then we have a hilly sand and clay region where we find a lot of Ghana's mining activities occur there. The forested highland region, which as would imply a lot of the forest area um, occurs there and the interior dry savannas, which combined with the forested highland regions has a lot of the mountain, mountain ranges and tepuis. There are also four major rivers with the Essequibo being the longest. And then if, if we look at a quick map of Ghana, you'll see that in Damarara Mahaika, which is region four. So there are 10 administrative regions in Ghana and region four, which is where the capital is, lies along the low coastal plain, which is directly adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean. And this is the capital city, Georgetown, absolutely beautiful place, uh, one of the most diverse. You know what, we're actually still on the first slide of your presentation. It's not moving along oh. here. Um, Let's see if we can oh, fix no. that, maybe. I'm just gonna pop in for a sec here, Brianna. Great. Um, Ariana, if you can hear me, can you stop the screen share? Sure. I'll do that. Perfect, yep. and this time hit screen share, but this time when the option pops up, choose the one for your entire screen. It'll be a lot easier ah. to go full screen with that one. Okay, perfect. I have the tech that wizard coming in. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Is that much better now? Uh, let's see. Let's try to give it a give it a go here. If we play from the beginning, and we're in full screen, and if we can go to the next slide. Oh, perfect. We're rolling. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. So just a quick going back over what Guyana is. Um, so we talked about Guyana's independence um, when it when they became a cooperative republic. Um, the holiday to celebrate that is known as Matrimani. There are five ethnic groups in Guyana, um, which makes the, the country very culturally dynamic and diverse. Um, the national dish is known as pepper pot, um, which ever, if you ever make it down to Guyana, like I said, make sure to try it. There are five natural regions, the low coastal plain being where the country's capital, Georgetown, is located. Um, and then there are four major rivers with the Essequibo River being the longest, which is, it's about a thousand km long. So if you look at the quick map of what Ghana looks like, um, the capital Georgetown is located here in region four, known as Damarara Mahaika. There are overall 10 administrative regions in Guyana, 
And the fourth administrative region is located along the low coastal plain, which is, which is directly adjacent to the Atlantic Ocean. And then with this picture, um, it's a picture of Georgetown. So it's a very, very beautiful uh, capital city. Um, and once again, if you ever make it down to Ghana, best place to go. And then um, I'll tell you more about the rest as we move on. So why do I call it the land of many wildlife communities? Well, I could go on about why that is, but I'll just lay down some quick biostats for you. Guyana hosts more than 6,000 plant species, about 130 species of amphibians, about 179 species of reptiles, over 800 species of birds, which I was told is being revised, so it might even be more than that, about 225 species of mammals, over 5,000 species of fish, including this absolutely beautiful fish known as the arapaima, which is the largest freshwater scaled fish in the region, and about 1,600 species of arthropods. And then when we think about this in the context of uh, Ghana itself, Ghana ranks third in the world for the country with the most forest cover to, to total land area. So that's about 94% forest cover. And it's in the top two countries that, are, that have the most forest cover, which are both Ghana Shield nations. So with that being said, obviously the question has to be asked, how can Ghana benefit from its resources without losing it, considering how bio, bio, biodiverse rich Ghana is? Well, that's where my research comes in. So I look at a particular area within research, resource use in Ghana known as reduced impact logging. Um, it's always been pushed as best practice forestry because of its sustainable operations that take place. So RIL, as it's commonly referred to, is intensely planned logging operations, which involves the selective removal of, of select hardwood timber species, um, which is all planned through a pre-harvest inventory and then directional felling. So once everything is planned, they'll go in and remove these specific species via directional felling. And this is all in order to minimize forest damage. And what you find happening is the gaps, the forest gaps that are created within your overall forested area tend to mimic natural tree fall. So in a way, you're conserving the overall landscape of the forested area while selectively removing um, harvest species that you want to profit off of. So a way that we can manage this is through the floral aspect, yes, but also through the faunal aspect, which is where my research focuses. And how we do this is by monitoring wildlife species and their overall population trends and community assemblages. Though opponents of this argue that community assemblage isn't enough evidence of um, biodiversity recovery within these logged areas, for my research, we propose a spatial perspective of change in assemblages through time. And I'll give you an idea of what that looks like. So as a quick framework of understanding, once you have logging being stopped within an area, which is what reduced impact logging does, you call it a silvicultural cycle. So you'll log an area, then stop, and then leave it to regenerate. So with time, what happens is you're going to have forest regeneration within two key areas. You have your direct impact and your indirect impacts. Now, forest regeneration in terms of the direct impact is going to influence resource availability. So as you have uh, trees being removed, you have forest gaps, and that forest gaps allows light to penetrate the forest floor, and you have resource blooms. This resource availability would then influence community assemblage change of your population dense taxa, so birds and bats especially, because these animals directly depend on these resources in order to survive and flourish within these logged areas especially. And then you have indirect impacts. So these are looking at man-made structures within your logged areas, such as logging roads. Now, when logging stops, when reduced impact logging stops within these forested areas, there may be continued old road access. Um, and this allows for operations such as monitoring and then planning of future plots to continue because you need continued access into your, um, your highly dense forest area. So continued old road access can indirectly impact um, populations such as large mammals because unfortunately logging has um, a, a very naughty little cousin that, that follows it along known as uh, hunting. And sometimes with old road access, what you find is that hunters have an ease of access into your forested areas and their prey of choice are usually large mammals to substitute for bushmeat trading um, and the bushmeat industry. 
So overall, what's happening is you have a feedback mechanism being formed whereby your community assemblage response through time is influencing the level of forestry generation that's occurring because your wildlife that you're monitoring are usually uh, principal seed dispersers for that area. So what RIL tends to do is we want to limit that and prevent that from hitting a point where these wildlife communities can't respond well or um, revive themselves with time. Um, and in the end, what we should have been happening is a community response that resembles pre-logging levels or something close to it. So you have this nice balance between using a resource and also the wildlife benefiting from the resource still being there essentially. So where did we go and what did we do for this research? So we went to a place called Irakrama. Um, the Irakrama Rainforest um, is located in Region 8 of Guyana. Um, it's usually called the Green Heart of Guyana because it's right dead smack in the center there. And the Irakrama is really special because the forest is divided into a sustainable use area and a wilderness preserve. So our research took place in the sustainable use area where RIL is the principal logging activity that is done. It's not the only sustainable practice Irakrama does, but it's one of the major ones that gets a lot of um, attention. Um, so we did research within the logged area where we went to sampling plots in post-harvest areas, and then we compared the bird bath and large mammal community assemblage to unlogged rainforest. And the interesting thing about it is the people that we included. So we included a lot of the indigenous communities within that area, because one of the things Irakrama stands for is approaching conservation with a community dynamic. So you'll find that the Makushi um, indigenous tribes within the Irakrama rainforest are a key part of this research um, expedition. And overall, we would have found some amazing animals that are residing within the Irakrama rainforest through both mist netting procedures and camera trapping for our large mammals. What we've noticed so far um, is that with Irakrama, they have an extensive database whereby they would have um, a temporal look of how uh, their biodiversity response is occurring due to their sustainable activities. And for their uh, forested, their logged forests, what we've noticed before is that there are idiosyncratic behaviors in the bird and bat communities in response to the disturbance. And this has been attributed more to the strata, so whether it's canopy, subcanopy, or understory, and the differences in feeding gill that are generating this response. And these responses were concluded to be more attributed to natural turnover as opposed to logging. Um, so there really wasn't much of a conclusion that logging especially was the cause or the driver of how our bird and bat communities were responding. Um, and then for large mammals, there was the indirect pressure, um, such as unregularized hunting that was impacting mammal communities, but not to a level that was extremely alarming. But then again, again, there was no direct pressure of logging that was influencing the mammal community to that extent. So overall, the observed changes in the communities weren't conclusive for reduced impact logging. So that's what research before has found. What we want to understand now is the temporal perspective. So knowing that regeneration is occurring, how do the populations respond in a time frame comparison? And is this a, a key way to explain those idiosyncratic behaviors that I mentioned previously? And then for the large mammals, does the continued access of logging roads and skid trails, is it doing more harm than good? So do we have regeneration occurring on those skid trails? Are some of them open versus are some of them closed? And which one do the mammals prefer? And then we have a spatial perspective. So we're looking at the impact of the logging specifically per sample plot that we did within the overall for the log forest compartment. And then we're comparing each sample plot to each other and then seeing whether the community assemblages within those sample plots are more for natural turnover, like previously mentioned, or is there a gradual disturbance impact response due to the logging intensity in these specific plots? And then again, for mammals, it regards the number of roads and trails that the mammals will traverse on. So how many open versus closed roads, how many of them are close to each other, how many of them are close to a major road that people can access. Um, so these are the two key areas that we're, that we're investigating and we're, we're using models to generate a statistically significant response of how these, um, these population dynamics are, are moving within the Irakrama Marine Forest. So with that being said, there are some challenges um, to the land of many wildlife communities 
with an area as bio biodiverse diversely rich as Guyana, there are obviously going to be so many challenges that Guyanese will face. Um, and namely, these four stick out to me particularly. So there is the challenge of urban expansion. Guyana, although it is a beautiful country to come and witness, to live in, it is still a developing country. And therefore, the government of Guyana um, will put economic and urban expansion at the forefront of its efforts to make Guyana a better place. Um, so there is the question of how far this urbanization will go and what impacts can that have to its biodiversity rich regions. Then there's also the threat of illegal logging and mining, which unfortunately Irokrama has experienced recently uh, when it comes to illegal mining in the area, specifically for gold. So there are a lot of cases whereby the more biodiversity rich an area is, the more likely you're going to have some not so not so nice things happening. Um, because if it's biodiversity rich on, on top of the soil, it's got to be rich below the soil as well. So there have been a lot of illegal activities in, in, um, in, court, in accordance with that. Um, and then we have the oil and gas sector, of course. A lot of people now know about Ghana because of the oil and gas industry. And then the question of how, how will Ghana respond in the long term with the oil and gas sector? Ghana is still pretty young in terms of uh, development, in terms of independence, in terms of um, being part of the oil industry. So there's a lot of questions as to um, will Ghana's biodiversity suffer at the expense of gaining oil wealth? Um, so that's one of the challenges that we still face in Guyana. And then there's one that I always debate with my, with my colleagues over, which is the future of academia in Guyana. There does exist a lack of research in key regions in Guyana. And that's partly due to the extent at which, uh, uh, or the remoteness of some of these areas in Ghana. Um, so there's still a lot to be learned. And that isn't just for inland areas, that's also for aquatic systems as well. So um, the University of Ghana really does try its best to bridge that gap and try to output um, academics that can make informed uh, research-oriented decisions to help the Guyanese government with its expansion plans and overall plans for Ghana's future. But I will not be a gloomy cloud. Thank you, Mr. Toad. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of hope uh, when it comes to Guyana's sustainable development and Ghana's biodiversity, and it rests solely in the people. Um, the Guyanese people and then there are the international counterparts that have an invested interest in Guyana with their, with their um, cooperation, with their commitment, with their research. Uh, we can help inform and place measures that can see Guyana to a very sustainably rich future whilst also preserving the land of many wildlife communities um, that I think is the best way forward for Guyana as a whole. And with that being said, Let's connect. So if you'd like to know more about Aerochroma, where I do my research, you can find them at aerochroma.org. Um, they're also an ecotourism area. So uh, when COVID is over, you can plan a trip, come to Guyana. Um, if you want to learn more about the University of Guyana and the research that it outputs, you can visit their website. And then I have all my socials down below. Um, let's connect. Tell me what you think. Send me an email. Follow me on Instagram. Follow Aerochroma on Instagram. Send me a tweet. And with that being said, thank you so much. Sorry for the glitches with technology in the beginning, but thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Wow, really interesting research and a really new and fascinating place to go visit as a tourist yeah. looking to learn about um, a really bio biodiverse place. And yeah. um, I'd love to know, like, what are, you see there's lots of mammals, you do work on, on mm -hmm. that. There's lots of different species. If, you, if I was walking in, in the rainforest where you do your research, what animals mm -hmm. would I expect to see? Oh, that is a great question. Well, it's going to depend on the time of day. Um, one of the animals that you're going to hear uh, before you even see it is the screaming piha, which I think a lot of people have heard this bird before, even though you're not really sure what it looks like. If you've ever listened to any sort of nature documentary and you hear this beautiful kind of, I can't even explain it. It's like a, it's like a very, I can't explain it, but it's, it's a really beautiful sound. And as soon as you hear it, you think, oh, 
I'm in a rainforest. That's how that's how iconic the the bird sound is. Um, if you're just walking through the rainforest, you might you might hear them before you see them again. But that's um, uh, uh, howler monkeys, and then there are also these spider monkeys. Um, spider monkeys, there's a little bit of a chance that they're going to be, well, not a little bit, a lot of a chance that they're going to be a little hostile towards you. Um, but it is really fun to, to see. Uh, they'll usually shake branches and give you this territorial display. And it's so mesmerizing to watch because they'll be like two in front of you and then another one behind you and you're just engulfed in them. Um, but there's the odd chance that they might throw poop at you, but don't worry. I've only had that happen to me once. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I'm sure it's really fun to, to get to do what you do all day long. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your art you and how you use that in combination with your 50% conservation <laughs> world. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, I grew up in a household that is very art and science oriented. Uh, my grandfather was a Guyanese cartoonist. And um, so I really had uh, an introduction to art before I had an introduction to conservation. He also used to look at National, um, National Geographic documentaries and stuff. But how I bridge the gap between art and conservation is through um, this interesting educational awareness thing whereby I try to show a kind of empathetic side to nature by illustrating it in a way that is very um, digestible for social media and, and um, just the general public who don't necessarily have a uh, conservation background. And then in addition to that, um, I have been a part of some wonderful projects. Uh, one that I recently was a part of was called Where Did All the Animals Go? Uh, which was an initiative by an artist in the UK, uh, whereby she's trying to get young children to appreciate uh, wildlife, especially endangered wildlife, by drawing them. And then once they're drawn, um, she posts it up on a gallery for people to come and see. So it relates back to that, to you know, the little warm heart inside of you that probably doesn't know the science behind it, but you know the the human side to it and the empathy and the empathy towards it. Um, so that's a lot of what I try to do with my with my art overall. Yeah, well, it sounds like it's really necessary because as you said, Guyana is de a developing country and there's going to be lots of decisions to make about how to sustainably extract resources and build the economy. And it sounds mm -hmm. like the work that you're doing, both the scientific research, but also the awareness um, using art and other um, education and outreach programs um, will encourage this. The, it, it sounds like people are, are excited about the idea of, of sustainable, de sustainably developing and um, using their uh, this amazing biodiverse area. Definitely, right definitely. I think as we progress as a as as a species um, on a whole, you're not going to stop development. Um, but instead, what we should focus our efforts on is how to continue development sustainably and remember that we're not the only um, species that inhabits this earth. And to just like, just give a little consideration to the little um, house wren outside that that just wants, you know, just wants a meal or just wants to sleep in <laughs> so, somewhere nice and cozy for the rest of its life. Yeah, yeah. Well, the work you're doing is really fantastic. Any any things that we should be looking out for or what's next um, for you on the horizon? Oh, that is a really good question and one that my supervisors always ask. <laughs> but uh, my main goal right now is finishing up my PhD, um, getting this research out into the general public so that they can see the work that we've done. Um, so yeah, beyond that, it is to give back to my country. Uh, so uh, taking part in the building of the academic community within Ghana through the University of Ghana. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna be a wild ride, but I'm looking forward to it. Great, well, we are so grateful to hear about Guyana and to hear about all the 
rich biodiversity species that live there, it sounds like it only continues to grow. Um, <laughs> so I will keep yeah, remember, yeah. I'll keep keep my <laughs> eye out for what's uh, for how many more species are are down there. Maybe one day Definitely. I'll make it down there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. In 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 the non COVID world that we can see on the horizon, definitely make a trip down. Mm -hmm. I think we all should. Sounds like a lot of fun. All perfect. Right. Well, perfect. Well, thank you so much for the for the talk and for joining Global Biofest, and we'll hope to see thank you next you. year. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Yeah. You too. Bye. All right. Bye. All right. That was wonderful. Really exciting. Uh, next up, we have Adriana Vargas. Adriana is a marine, marine ecologist based at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Her research investigates the ecological impacts of climate change in our oceans and develops hands-on restoration solutions to protect and conserve underwater forests and meadows. Really interesting and a good follow-up from that last talk we have. So it's great to see you. Great to have you here, Adriana. Hi, Brianna. How are you? Doing well. Yeah, it's, we're almost the, at the end of the festival. So thanks know, for joining right? us on the tail end here. Yeah, what an epic stretch. Well done, everybody. Yeah. It's been a lot <laughs> of fun. Yeah. So I, I'm excited to, to learn about really what are underwater forests and meadows? That's my big question for you today. Fantastic. So, well, I might just share my screen if that's mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, so. we'll, I'll let you know when it pops up here. Excellent. Let's make sure to share the whole screen. Yes. Okay. Um, are we on? We're on. We've got it here. Fantastic. Great. Screen. Yeah, we can see you. Take, take it away. Thanks. Cool. So I would like to tell you about a couple of projects that uh, I'm running with a lot of colleagues in Eastern Australia. And I'll start um, by telling you about a project um, that focuses on underwater trees. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that the research that I will be presenting was done on the lands and the waters of the Darawal, Gadigal, Pichigal, Darkinjung, and Waramai people. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and future. And then I'd like to imagine what it'd be like if we lost 70 kilometers of forest. So forest along 70 kilometers of land, and imagine if that happened right next to Australia's most populated city or any city at all. There would be huge outcry, that's what I predict. Um, here in Sydney, where I live, um, they had to cut down some trees to make room for a light rail, and there were protests every single day for a while, you know, people asking, save our trees. People feel um, an affinity to forests and they want to protect them. But that's Overland. When things like this happen on the water, it's a it's a different story. And in fact, th this loss of forests is what happened to this species of seaweed. It's called crayweed, and it makes these beautiful, lush underwater forests um, that you know exist along the whole southeastern side of Australia. So this is the distribution here of crayweed, and you know they're really big seaweeds you can't miss them if you go on the water however this seaweed went missing of 70 kilometers along the coast of, of of sydney australia and nobody knew about it so it went missing in the 1980s and scientists only started documenting this in 2008 so it went missing and it was gone for decades before we realized it now the reasons for the disappearance of crayweed um we think it's to do with uh, sewage pollution. So back before the 1980s, sewage was disposed of directly onto the shoreline. And um, so this means that a lot of the beaches around Sydney were, were polluted and closed to swimming. So places like Bondi Beach used to be closed to swimmers 50% of the time before the 1990s. We then um, got the deep ocean outfalls installed. So now the sewage is better treated and it's it's uh, discharged in deep water, very deep, so that the sewage mixes in with the water column straight away. And it is offshore, kilometers offshore. So this means that the water quality now in Sydney is amazing. It really is truly, you know, extraordinary. Um, however, crayweed just never came back. 
So we started thinking about, should we do something about this? Should we try and restore it? And before we, we went there, because we're scientists, we wanted to first kind of work out, well, what's, you know, is there something really special about cray wheat? I mean, the other seaweeds that do now exist in Sydney, are they playing the same kind of role in the ecosystem? Because if they are, maybe, maybe there is no need to restore cray wheat. And to cut a long story short, what we found is that cray wheat is indeed very special. So it's called cray wheat for a reason, because it supports crayfish, um, which is the name we give here to rock lobster. And it also supports abalone, as well as hundreds of microscopic creatures that live in amongst it. So yes, cray wheat special, let's try and restore it. And initially what we wanted to do is see whether it could now survive in Sydney. And so this is what the first cray wheat patch that we planted looks like. This is how we attach it. It lives in wave exposed areas. So um, we need to drill these mats onto the seafloor. We leave them for a while and then we remove them. And this is what the first cray wheat patch uh, that we ever planted looked like. This is 10 years ago now. And again, to cut a long story short, what we found was that the cray wheat not only survived, so this is one of the planted ones, but it reproduced, it, it had babies, and we call them uh, cravies, and this is what they look like. So they're pretty tiny. Um, after about nine months, we started seeing them. So this is the first site that we ever did, and this is what the restoration looked like after eight years. So we planted small kind of, you know, a couple of square meter patches, and then it just started expanding by itself. So we've effectively reversed local extinction and brought these species back to the Sydney coastline, which is super exciting. So at this stage, we knew that the water quality is now fine for both the babies, the crabies, and the adult crayweed. Uh, we know that our restoration methods work and we can bring it back. So now we, of course, wanted to scale it up, right, and bring it to the whole of Sydney. And to do that, um, we kind of realized that what we had in our hands was a, a rare good news story that actually really deserved to be heard. Um, and we could use this story to kind of raise awareness about our underwater forest more broadly. So we created an entity, we call it Operation Crayweed, um, and we created a website and a, you know, social media profiles, etc. And then we started a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so we started asking people for money to, to scale up. Um, and this was just before Christmas. So we asked people to give an underwater tree for Christmas as a gift. So people gave us $20 or for, for a tree or $50 for a family or $500 for a patch. And then um, they get they got a card which then they gave they gave to their to their friends and family, and the story got a lot of kind of press. You know, we were on the news um, nationally and internationally, and we managed to raise the money that we were looking for in in literally thirty days. And by sixty days, we had doubled. So that really kind of gave us a push, and we started really kind of um, expanding the number of sites that we worked on. So where we're at now at the moment is we have six self-sustaining crayweed sites. So this means they, 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 they continue to propagate without any help from us. And then we have six that we're, we're working on at the moment. And this is a team of Operation Crayweed. So there's quite a lot of us. We come from different universities. And yeah, we're all in this together very much. Now, the other project that I want to tell you about is called Operation Posidonia, and it, you know, it, 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 it was a follow-up from Operation Crayweed. Operation Crayweed is still very much ongoing, but you know, there are other species that need our help, and Posidonia is one of them. Now, Posidonia is a seagrass, which is different to seaweeds. So seaweeds are more ancient in evolutionary terms. Um, so all life came from the ocean. Seaweeds um, started invading the land and eventually became higher plants. Uh, like, uh, and then some higher plants actually returned to the ocean and they're the seagrasses. So they're aquatic plants, but they're actually, they belong to the higher plants. They're not a seaweed, which are more kind of, um, yeah, simpler in form. So it's kind of like seagrasses are a bit like the dolphins amongst the plants. If you think of marine mammals like dolphins, they have a terrestrial ancestor. It's the same with the seagrasses. Um, so this means that they have flowers and they have roots and, and rhizomes and fruits, just like higher plants. 
This is what the species that we're working on looks like. It's called Posidonia australis, and it makes vast um, underwater meadows that have many important functions. They're very important for maintaining water quality, protecting shorelines from erosion. They're extremely um, effective at trapping carbon um, and storing it for millennia. So they're what we know as blue carbon ecosystems. They provide habitat for hundreds of species, including um, other endangered species like um, this is a white seahorse. They have hundreds of animals that live in and amongst the meadows and that provide food for other animals, and they're also nursery areas. Now, this species, Posidonia australis, um, is found along 8,000 kilometers. Um, it's basically the entire southern half of the Australian continent, um, and it's endangered in only six estuaries and they're all the ones that are near Sydney Harbour. So the decline is very much linked to urbanization and human activities, things like pollution, um, coastal development, you know, shading, excess nutrients, that kind of thing. But one of the problems that we're seeing these days is to do with boat moorings. So boat moorings um, have heavy swing chains that drag along the seafloor and move with the tides and the wind and scrape everything behind them so that they create these halos, these patches of unvegetated habitats. And these patches keep growing and growing and growing. And this mooring damage happens extremely quickly. So this is a photograph of the installing of installment of the mooring in 2012. And this is, you know, there was nothing there. And in just a couple, in just one year, we got 160 square meters of seafloor completely bare. So it happens very quickly and the problem is that Posidonia grows very slowly. So that's why predictions are that Posidonia may become locally extinct from these New South Wales estuaries where it's now endangered within as little as 15 years. So the proposed solution that we've put forward is a combination of an engineering solution and restoration. So we propose the switching of traditional swing moorings that have this heavy chain that destroys the seafloor with environmentally friendly moorings, which are synthetic materials that are neutrally buoyant and they don't drag along the seafloor. And they, there's many designs that already exist and are being used, but they, the, the uptake is very slow. And then what we're suggesting is that we need to couple this with restoration because the seagrass grows so slowly. Now, the problem with Posidonia is that because it's endangered and there's not a lot, lot left in many places, finding the material for the restoration is actually really quite hard and a major challenge. And that's where the community has really come in here. So what we um, are doing is we recruit volunteers that collect these shoots of seagrass, of Posidonia, that become naturally detached after big storms. So we call these volunteers our storm quad, squad, <laughs> storm squad. And essentially, they go for a walk with the beach, you know, the beach with their dog, whatever. They find the shoots and they pick them up and they put them in these shoot collection stations, which we created. And then we collect those shoots, we store them in tanks until we're ready for restoration. And then we plant them. Now, to engage the communities, again, we created a social media profile, a website, we made films, we did school um, activities. And we did walk and talk type meetings where we went out and we showed people what these shoots look like and what we were looking for. And it was fantastic. We got an amazing uh, reception from the community. Over 1,500 shoots were collected in 1.5 years. And this is in a rural part of New South Wales. And so we've been very busy planting seagrasses. And this is work that is led by a PhD student of mine, Julia Ferretto. Um, and in 2019, we managed to um, restore 10 mooring scars, these old mooring scars. And this is just a video that looks, um, that just shows what the actual restoration uh, looks like. So this is our vessel, this is our team. And essentially um, what we did was, because we're scientists, we couldn't help ourselves. We did a few experiments. So this is what the environmentally friendly mooring looks like. It has this um, synthetic um, rubber and that doesn't drag along the seafloor. And we trialed the restoration in both um, bare sediment and in these jute mats. Uh, and this is what the shoots look like, the ones that have been collected by citizen scientists and stored until ready. Um, and we did it, yeah, in bare sediment and in jute mats.
And we've been getting incredible uh, results. So the survival is around the 70%, which is extremely high for seagrasses. And basically, we have shown that this method works. Um, so Posidonia can overcome the, the transplant stress of you know being detached and collected, blah, blah, blah. So this is a new source of shoots that is viable for restoration. We got about 70% survival rate, and our shoots have started to reproduce and produce new shoots and they do that in less than a year so this is the team from operation Positonia. again people and scientists from different um universities like my, my own and the university of western australia but also the um, local government uh, the department of primary industries here um in new south wales and with that um that's two of my stories thank you very very much uh for the attention and for inviting me to be a part of this Great, thank you so much. Wow, um, really neat stories, things I did not know about. I did not know that seagrass came from the evolution of land and now went back into the water. So that's really neat. And it's really exciting to see conservation in action, to see these real tangible plans. A lot of times we hear about all of the problems and it's your, what you're doing is just all about the solutions. So thank you for doing that work. And um, it looks like it's a lot of fun. It is. And what, what we find is that people, and, and I think the crowdfunding for Operation Crave, it really demonstrates that there's this kind of, people are really hungry for, for solutions and for projects that are, you know, it, it's often the combination of an engineering kind of, major solution right so we fix the, the the main reason for the original decline and then you know us ecologists find ways to give nature essentially a helping hand and what we're finding is that once we do that the, the ability of nature to to fix itself is is phenomenal but we couldn't do this without people we couldn't do this with the community like with the Posidonia project you know, we, we couldn't be out there collecting shoots every single day. I mean, we could, but it'd be very expensive. But um, by engaging local communities, we can get all that material. And at the same time, people, because they're learning about their local marine environment, the, the, their level of kind of stewardship and, you know, looking after country kind of increases. So, yeah, um, it's a win-win. Yeah, I you know, I'm in, in Toronto right now and I've lived in New York and a lot of big cities you don't see a whole lot of conservation projects. Sometimes you think about conservation as uh, the Amazon rainforest or um, you know the, the Great Barrier Reef, but you're saying that there's a, a ways to engage the communities in big cities and a lot of big cities are on, on the shoreline and on the coasts. Um, so it's, it's really neat to, to see. And um, how do you engage the communities? Like that must be a big job in itself to get people excited about, about seagrass. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. I mean, the, the, the hard thing is just finding your way in, you know? So what we do is we, um, we make films, we, we kind of film, I think for marine conservation in particular, it's really important to bring bring the habitat to the people you know it's actually only a minority of people that put on goggles and go for a for a snorkel or a dive right so um use a lot of visual methods make videos explain the story and then organize workshops link up with community groups there's actually a lot of people out there already doing wonderful things and it's just about telling them about hey you know there's also this thing that we're doing and that you could help with so a lot of hands-on activities with crayweed um i i didn't talk about it because I was kind of worried about going over time, but um, we've just done a major seaweed festival. So this was a big art meet science collaboration that kind of, kind of, yeah, very much continues on with what Ariane was saying just now. So we've been using art and collaborating with artists to try and um, engage people in a more emotional level with the environment and we found that that's just incredibly powerful so in this seaweed festival there was it was in a art gallery a museum and there was this immersive seaweed forest that was hanging um, off the ceiling and this is tons of bull kelp that were hanging and there was these lights that moved so that you felt like you were on the water and then in that space we created well we did a whole lot of art workshops and science workshops and talks panel discussions with community engagement etc and we found that has been incredibly um, effective at engaging people 
Mm -hmm. Well, I really loved the logo for the crayfish. It was a really cute crayfish going like that. <laughs> that was my favorite. It seems like you're you, you're using social media a lot um, to engage the communities. Have you found that it's hard to that that these live events are hard to do because of COVID? Have you guys been impacted? Has your have your projects been impacted? And uh, where are they at right now? Yeah, so within Australia, we have been very fortunate that there's actually there's zero community transmission. So the um, the seaweed festival was able to go ahead uh, completely, you know, in person. We had scheduled it for 2020, so we had to postpone it. But now in 2021, it's been able to to go ahead um, in person, which has been wonderful. But I think what's key to reach communities is to use multiple methods. So, um, for example example yeah social media is definitely a big one but you know you only reach certain generations through certain um social media outlets like you know facebook you reach certain type of people um instagram it's another so i think a combination is really good but nothing beats on the ground in-person activity so once you've created a bit of noise and for that you know media is just amazing like I, when we were on the news for example or things like that, we I really felt the impact. You know, people would watch the news and then they would contact us. They'd go online and they'd send us a message. And that's how we started collaborating with artists because they approached us. They were like, those two artists, Michele Crawford and Jennifer Turpin are their names. And they were invited to do a major outdoor art installation as part of um, Sculptures by the Sea Festival. And they just loved their project and this idea of underwater gardening and this idea that there's all this work that is happening underwater and people, you know, are not aware of it. You know, like this is Australia's biggest city, you know, over five million people and people don't know. Right. So they wanted to make that work that was happening underwater visible to people through their artwork. So they created this kind of artwork side that kind of just kind of surrounded a restoration site and you know they used all sorts of different devices to try and bring attention to the underwater world and that was incredibly powerful mm -hmm. so but that would not have happened had we not been on the news and had we not done the crowdfunding because that's how they learned about the project right so there's all these synergies that happen once uh, the project is out in the in the ether yeah it, it was a great campaign idea to to buy a christmas tree underwater and use that as, as a gift. Um, it sounds like to do your work, you really need a lot of different skills. You need to have the, the science background and you need to have also the media and communications background, the organizational background. Um, what advice would you give young people looking to start careers in conservation? Um, I mean, I think it's true, like being multidisciplinary in your approach and that includes um, Yes, a science background. I think rigorous science, you know, is the basis of all the projects that I do. And I, th I think that that's really important, right? So it's evidence-based and, and yeah, there's, there's kind of real kind of rigorous work behind it. But then to bring it to the public, yes, you need a whole lot of different skills. And in terms of advice, I reckon, um, yeah, cultivate more than one thing and 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 not being narrow minded um, is, is really helpful because we kind of do need to think outside the box to fix the big problems that are ahead. So I find that a lot of the students that are now coming into my lab, um, you know, they're doing double kind of degrees, you know, like fine arts and, and marine science. For example, I have a couple of, of students that have that combination and it's wonderful because they you know, because they're fine art students, they have that eye and that intuition, which then is super useful for the sciences. You know, I think in the past we had these two in disciplines so divided, you know, in two different silos and, and they, they shouldn't be because um, a lot of the things that make you a good artist are the things that will make you a good scientist and vice versa. So I'd say, you know, be open, cultivate, you know, yeah, be, be open and, and, and try and approach things from more than one discipline. Um, the other big one is, is social research, social science, and even psychology. You know, the big conservation problems that we have now, it's not a lack of science that is stopping us from fixing those problems. It's, it's actually not understanding the, the human dimension. That, that's the bit that we really need to, to, to work on and understand better to fix um, the problems. 
Yeah, it sounds like that's a common thread amongst this whole festival is that um, the political, everything is somehow political, everything's interconnected between on a global scale and a local level. And you really do need to have that social science background and humanities background to, to um, engage people in these different issues. It's not just these different uh, disciplines, like you say. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and that's a lot of the work that you do. Um, can you tell us about any 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 of the next projects that you've got going on? It sounds like there are more than you're juggling a million things at once. It sounds like. Well, I so in terms of restoration, um, there's these two projects. There's another one where we're restoring um, a different species of seaweed as well, uh, and that's to do with removing sea urchins that are overgrazing the kelp. But I think the next big thing really is is growing the Posidonia project. And um, I actually just got some funding from a foundation in the US, it's called the Wild Elements Foundation. And they have given me <clears throat> a grant that will allow me to bring the Posidonia project to Botany Bay, which is a, a local um, estuary here in Sydney. And I'll be doing this work in collaboration with an indigenous group of um, rangers that are looking after countries. So I'm, I'm incredibly excited about working together with them to bring uh, Posidonia back to Sydney, uh, which is one of the places where it's most endangered. So that's incredibly exciting. Yeah, so how are, how, how are we doing with bringing them back? Uh, you, the, is the last we checked the 15, 1500 that you guys collected and how are they doing? The ones in, in so that project was in a place called Port Stevens and we've been getting 70% survival and growth. So we're kind of close to, you know, there's, there's, you, there's now more shoots in there than we originally planted. And that's because even though some died and the other ones grew and, and, and reproduced. So it's extremely exciting. We've even seen flowering happening in that initial site. So that project is now wrapping up and that was the proof of concept that we could do it. And now the next stage is bringing it, bringing the species to two other estuaries. And one is Botany Bay, which is about to start. The other one is um, in a place called Lake Macquarie. So that's the next stage for Posidonia. It's actually bringing it to those estuaries where it is um, endangered. However, the big, big, big problem here is that unless we replace these swing moorings with environmentally friendly moorings, you know, the restoration will not work. And that's something I can't do. I can't replace every single uh, swing mooring with an environment. That's that's something that, you know, requires regulatory change. And, and that's a much harder battle. But hopefully this project shows how if we do that, the, the biodiversity benefits are so high that it's really it's really worth it. Mm -hmm. That's why you need the, the social science background as well to work on the politics side of things and the campaigning side of things. Um, because it really is all interconnected. That's right. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm guessing, are you in Sydney right now? I am in Sydney. It's 9.26. Yeah. In the morning. So, yeah, beginning of the day. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for starting your day with us. Uh, we are finishing up the, the Global BioFest tonight. And um, I learned a lot. I know our viewers learned a lot as well. So um, thanks so much for, for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you, Brianna. All right. Take care. All right. Um, so I am going to bring in our next host. We have Lizzie Rosenberger. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Oh, doing well. We're just finishing up the festival. Can you believe it? There's only a few talks left. I know. It's been an amazing weekend extended, and I can't believe we're almost at the end. I know. Um, let's play one of our videos that we haven't played in a little while, um, maybe from one of our sponsors for the festival. How about the, the Lenovo um, video? Do you know about how Lenovo EDU is, is helping fund the festival? And they're also creating a community that expands access to engaging innovate, innovative educational resources like the Global Biodiversity Festival. Um, so I'm, I think this video is a couple minutes long. Uh, we're going to play it now. Sounds great.
That was really cool, lots of fun. And I think it's time to remind people how they can get involved and um, join the, the campaign here. Um, I'm gonna put up this banner here. Do you know about this, Lizzie? Oh yes, absolutely. You can text biodiversity to 44-321 and give a donation. Um, this whole event is a not-for-profit, so all of the donations go straight to biodiversity, which what could be better than that? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's for, for those folks in the United States. And here's the international one. Um, so texting this, texting biodiversity to this number will help support um, there's another way that you can help support these conservation efforts. This one's really fun. Um, we can check out prints for conservation on the website. You can buy prints. Um, and let's see, we've got, you can donate $100 on the prints page and then email globalbiofest at gmail.com. Um, all that information's on the website. And we ship in Canada, the United States, the UK and Europe and we can probably arrange something for outside of those regions. So we have some really cool um, prints for sale um, to help the Global Biodiversity Fest effort. And so if you haven't taken a look at them yet, I highly suggest taking a look. There's some really fantastic images that have been captured. Well, maybe there's some neat ones coming up from where you're going to next. I think um, we have some cool talks coming up, and so I'll, I'll let you take it away, Lizzie. Great. Thanks so much, Brianna. Have a great rest of your evening. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Lizzie Rosenberger, and I am in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and so excited to be here for just the last couple of hours of our Global Biodiversity Fest. And we're going to take a, a trip kind of close to Australia, where we just were, and we are going to head over to Tonga. Um, specifically, we are going to learn about conservation in Tonga from the Vavau Environmental Protection Association. And their mission is that they are dedicated to, a con to the conservation of Vavau's natural beauty through education, awareness, sustainable development, and collaboration. And today we have two locals with us from the community, um, Susanna and Lisa, and I'm so excited to welcome them into the call so that we can hear a little bit about the wonderful work they have been doing um, in Vavau. So hello, it's so nice to meet you two. Hi. Welcome. Hi, Thank you. Uh, so would you we start, uh, we would like to introduce, introduce ourselves and Susanna we're going first. Yeah. Um, hi everyone. My name is Susan Aika and I'm uh, working for VIPA, Vavao Environmental Protection Association. I've been helping out Lisa and um, and our other staff here for looking after our biodiversity. Yeah, that's for me. Hi everyone, my name is Lisa Paloa. I'm working here at the VIPA, that's Vavao Environmental Protection Association. And um, for a long year, <laughs> from 2013 until now. And uh, most of the uh, awareness I'm working for the school awareness and the uh, youth and the community. Wonderful. And that's all for myself. Wonderful, it's so nice to meet you both. We're thrilled to have you with us. Thank you. Do you now, do you have a slideshow that you're gonna, a couple of images you were gonna share with us? Yeah, yeah, we're just um, trying to share, share the screen. Our screen. <laughs> Great. Okay. All right, I can see it in there. I'll add it in here for you. Okay. And if you click full screen, we should be good to go. Cool. Excellent. All right. Here we go. All right. Thank you, everyone. I would like to uh, keep it, uh, sharing a little background about uh, Vavau Environmental Protection Association. Uh, Vavau Environmental Protection Association is uh, one of uh, non 
uh, government organization here in Tonga, uh, focusing on environmental issue and biodiversity con conservation from 2009 until now, we still continue on that uh, lovely work. <laughs> and also WIPA, uh, right now there's a 12 years of WIPA uh, doing operate, uh, operation of to protect the uh, restore and restore the unique of biodiversity here in Wawa'u. WIPA, they have a board member, so it's uh, seven volunteer uh, board members, they are, are running WIPA, and uh, we have our own constitution. And also we work with Ministry of uh, Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, Food, Forest and Fishery, and also Ministry of Land and Survey and Natural Resource. And also we are dedicated to conservation of our national beauty through education awareness, collaboration and sustainable development. So the kind of the biodiversity that we're working, um, trying to conserve and looking after, it's um, we're doing like both ocean and um, uh, land areas, bio, biodiversity in the ocean and the land areas. Um, we're like uh, looking after doing, um, looking after the ocean and mangroves and reefs in the ocean, uh, biodiversity. And also on land, we are uh, doing uh, different projects there for um, in different uh, areas. Yeah, and uh, how we doing all those uh, working, we go through collaboration with the community, youth, and also the, the school program. Uh, we also uh, do collecting data just to inform the government and the scientists of um, regards the importance of collecting this data for looking for the future of um, about the biodiversity that we're working on. And from the school awareness, uh, we are doing our school awareness for a six uh, secondary uh, secondary school here in Wawao, but uh, we visit them uh, four times. So they're having four semester, and uh, we have to visit them once in one semester. And also we have four top for uh, four topics for each uh, semester. So the first one we presenting our ocean presentation, and the second uh, term we doing uh, invasive species presentation. The third uh, semester we we sharing out the mangrove. And uh, last semester, we were sharing about uh, climate change. And here are the topics we sharing out with the uh, our school awareness. And also, if they need help from BIPA for their like their assignment and everything like that, we can uh, we also feel free to helping them when they come over to BIPA. Okay. So why do we have to like uh, look after this biodiversity? It is, um, I guess it is from these threads. Sorry, I thought we going uh, jump over, but we're not yet explaining all our working. And uh, also on the slide, there's a photo of us with the community uh, when we doing a, uh, uh, like drawing the mapping of how to managing the uh, ocean. So we have to go sit down with the community and sharing <clears throat> with them. And they have to sharing their information with us and they have to draw their map which side of the ocean they want to manage for our program is called SMA or Special Management Area. And also on the uh, those are the photo upstairs with the youth. Uh, sometimes we uh, invite the youth to go in with us to Mount Dalau, showing them how we manage the, 
the red up in Mandalao, because there's some of the birds here, it's important here in Wawa'o, we call it uh, Tongan Whistler, they are endemic species here in Wawa'o, but we want to manage the, the amount of red up there because they're eating the fruit of Tongan Whistler. Uh, so we need to manage to reduce the amount of uh, red and mouth in the Lao. And that's how we're doing. We need to working with the youth, helping us how to manage the the, oh, yes. the red at Mount Dalau. We're doing uh, once a month going up to Mount Dalau and uh, doing our data there and record how, how do we know it's improving. But from now at 2015, we start this project with the invasive species. And right now we have a good result that the Tongan whistler are spread around here mm -hmm. in Wabao. We can hear it everywhere here in Wabao. From doing the coral survey and also the plankton is helpful for us for collecting our data, for showing to the, to in, uh, helping to inform the government and the scientists here in Tonga. So they we have to know what the situation of our coral here in Tonga, they are healthy or they stress or what they die. Mm -hmm. So why are we doing this? Um, there are lots of different threats here in Wabao. It's including the invasive species, um, land development around our coastal areas. Yeah, and um, this is all the threats from all the invasive uh, species here in Wabao. Uh, we can showing you how the red uh, destroying our tongue and whistler egg. And uh, on your Right side, that's how the pigs here in Tongan uh, take, uh, take over our ground and cause more erosion in our mm -hmm. area. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> and the picture inside that's uh, Baba, that's Neyahu. Yeah, so yeah, as you can see, there's like more uh, land development, uh, buildings and stuff in the coastal areas, which, yeah, which those are threats to the biodiversity. And uh, in this uh, slide, we're showing uh, overfishing and uh, all the threats from the climate change, pollution, and uh, those activity that's the human doing here will cause problem for our biodiversity. Because <clears throat> sometimes they are uh, here in Tongan, we're doing a lot of awareness with our communities and our youth and also the school too um, about doing overfishing in here. Because sometimes we they thinking, oh, we're having a lot of fish, but they didn't know when they're fishing a lot, mm. but there's something will be unbalanced in the ocean and the life of the marine organism there, there's something will change if the level will unbalance. And uh, that's what we're doing here, most, uh, most of our activity to the communities and also schools and youth, just sharing to them how important to taking care of our ocean to make sure every level of in the ocean are balanced because of their uh, food chains we have to go through, not missing one, mm -hmm. one level. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, like the one on the side from the pollution, that's one of the uh, invasive in here, the crown of one. We don't have a uh, uh, best uh, uh, materials yeah. to use for picking up uh, to picking up the crown of one from the coral, but uh, we have created our own uh, instrument uh, mm. materials to use it for killing the uh, for taking out the the chronophon from the coral. But the reason uh, sometimes we explain to our people, when you saw, uh, see it, you have to let us know because the, if they go and break it down, will be more chronophon yeah. gonna growing up. Yeah. But if they go and touch it without knowing what is chronophon, there will be some, they will be harmful and something be toxin. 
it going to be seen by the son of the crown of horn. And uh, let them know it's going to be a lot showing around here because of the ero uh, erosion and the pollution from the land to the ocean. And the last, uh, I remember. The last pictures down there. <clears throat> That's the natural predator of of the of the crown of horn. They can kill crown of horn, but most of our people, they yeah. fishing it using for handicraft. Mm -hmm. But right now they are going in not many now, yeah. and the crown of horn are start to growing up mm -hmm. fast in here. So uh, we're doing like um, other um, <coughs> activities and other projects to support livelihoods um, and protecting biodiversity at the same time with communities. Uh, we're doing a mud prep uh, project uh, to one of our communities that uh, participates on the SMA, Special Management Area, as uh, Lisa has mentioned. And um, uh, this project is to like um, not only to uh, to protect their their uh, to help out their livelihoods, but to like um, um, create a more value on the habitats around their their ocean areas, like uh, mangroves. We're doing that's why we're doing mud reps uh, project is to like use mangroves as um, as a way to like provide for them. So with... Um and also when this uh, project are uh, process and are uh, going well, that the tourism uh, visit, we're willing to go and visit the uh, community to see how, how, how they are going, how they, they create that idea to get the the natural, the like the fresh one from the ocean, and the family on this island, they can have their their yeah, sure. livelihood from that uh, project. And this project uh, helping a lot for this community because they are they are one of the small community here in our island in Malau, and this is the other uh, object we're thinking of how to create this uh, project on this uh, village. We're helping, uh, helping them on tourism, economic, and also their livelihoods. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and we did. And also we have another livelihood uh, project that's a chicken coop uh, a project. It's to strengthen project uh, to protect area management project. So the first uh, uh, things we think it's important to have this uh, project to the one of our islands, but we target in our outer island. So we selected four islands to pilot uh, this uh, project, and uh, we need to improve their food security, like uh, especially with, with the global uh, pandemic of coronavirus currently expanding around the world and the threats increase for communities here in Tonga. Like the food security is uh, becoming to... It's becoming a critical issue to the... Um, so we need to ensure that the communities have access to healthy and fresh foods. And also we need to strengthen the women and the youth activity with the project area. Women and youth are uh, often left out the discussion of offset with the implementation of project area management due to the overreaching and uh, and the recognition of um, men being as being the main um, people who who do providing for the household. So the the um, object of this um, uh, objectives of this. Um, as chicken coop project is to 
get like women and youth involved in like providing for their own households and um, like that. Uh, we're doing, um, we also do, as mentioned, uh, youth, um, uh, we do also do cleanups with youths in, um, in coastal areas and in beach areas uh, with uh, different, um, at different uh, communities. So the people are coming to and help us out on doing the cleaning up. Yeah, and uh, before uh, we doing the clean up, so we thinking of doing uh, like uh, awareness with the community, sharing them the the dangers of the plastic and the other waste on land. When they all end up to the ocean, they will be a problem for the all the biodiversity in the ocean. So that's what uh, we are doing. We're going around the community in outer island and also the mainland here in Rabao, uh, doing the presentation with the community and uh, that's the activity of the uh, presentation we're going with the community and doing the, the coastal cleanup. We also do uh, conservation of our turtles and like looking after them Earlier this year, we we did like um, no, Lisa, can you we uh, at the beginning of this year we went to one of our outer island and put the the temperature to extend testing temperature on one of our outer islands. On the sand, so we can uh, we can uh, uh, monitor it after three months, and we can uh, update uh, and we know how how warm did the sand of the island have, and uh, we can tell what, like when the the turtle are uh, laying egg, mm. the, if the sand are too hot, they're gonna be have uh, most lots of the of the small turtle we will have is female. But if the amount of the heat in the uh, the sand are uh, in the normal temperature, mm. and they will, uh, so the result of the small turtle will be female and male. Yeah. So we are like uh, looking at like um, how the temp sand temperature would affect the nesting of turtles and their eggs, gender, something. So yeah. And that's it from us. I guess um, the last slide is to just, um, if we um, look after our biodiversity, we would get more beautiful environment in both in land and the oceans. So yeah, that's all from us. Thank you very much from Viva. Thank you, that was Great. wonderful and you have beautiful images to have shared with us. And I just am amazed at all of the different initiatives that you all have going on. It really seems like you are doing a lot to help the biodiversity um, of Vow. So it sounds absolutely amazing. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have been coming in as well for you all. Um, the first one, I'm wondering if you can kind of paint us a picture of where the islands and if there is it just one big island or are there multiple smaller islands within Vivao? Um, so that when you talk about the different communities that you're interacting with, are they close by? Are they really far apart? Because it sounds like you're working in a bunch of different communities and villages. So um, here in Lava'u, we have like um, the main island, the main um, city. Uh, I don't know. City or... In Lava'u, we have a community in the main island of Lava'u, and we have a community in outer island. So we have to travel by a boat. Mm -hmm. So it's a community in the outer island. We got 40 community in uh, from the outer island. 
And uh, every time we're doing a project to the outer island, we have to take a boat to, to uh, travel from the mainland to the outer island. Mm -hmm. But the community in uh, in the mainland, so we're using a car or a truck to going around with that community for our doing our project. And about when you take your your boat to the outer um, communities, how long is it like a is it a short boat ride or is it a long boat ride? It would depend on the, um, uh, on the island. Yeah, and also to. the weather. If the weather is not, uh, it's fine. You take uh, like forty five minutes or thirty minutes, but if the weather is bad, we're gonna take one hour. Yeah, but for now we but do not have any boats, so we like hired locals. So yeah, <laughs> wonderful. And do you do you see a difference in the different communities that you work with? Are the outer islands do they have different threats to the biodiversity than the mainland does? And what might be some of those differences if you have any? Hmm. Yeah, from the outer island, they have a like a, most, uh, some of their community they have have on the comment uh, all the threats from from their like the coral reef. It's not only the climate change, but when the, if any a cyclone happen, mm, they yeah. it goes, uh, will cause more damage to their yeah. coral reef. Mm. Not only uh, not only the uh, climate change, but it's caused from the cyclone. And sometimes when the the human go doing fishing, some of the fishing they have to remove the coral reef, mm. and that's the other threat. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, I know you mentioned overfishing is something that you talk with the youth about quite a bit. Is that overfishing? Is it mainly from with people from Tonga, or is it international, or is it a little bit of both? That are the impact of the overfishing. I guess it's like everyone, yeah, both, like locals and the international ones that they are around our water, Tonga waters. So yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a problem that unfortunately is in a lot of waters around the world. Um, and is there, I know you spoke about some of the um, invasive species being the rats and the pigs on the land, um, and then also the crown of thorns. Um, and I'm curious, you said that there, I didn't quite catch the predator of the crown of thorn, um, but it looked like a beautiful picture of it. But that predator, you said they that people fish that for, um, using for handicrafts. Um, so I'm wondering if there has been some, have you had some messaging around kind of changing people's ideas of what they can use that for so it stays in the ocean so it can actually be a predator for the crown of thorns or if there's just another um, removal method you've been using for the crown of thorns. So the, can I repeat it? Yeah, it's the triton trumpet that they, um, yeah, that they, that they are uh, the breeder of um, of crown of thorns. And what if, what do people to what's the kind of handicraft that they use that for? Uh, some uh, handicraft they're using for making necklace and. Uh, Earring, but uh, some handicraft they sell the whole mm. oh, shell. whole shell, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there, have you seen? Um, I know you mentioned that the crown of thorn is a little bit can be toxic if people try and remove it themselves. So, is that part of the education that you're providing to the local communities of? Try and don't try and remove it yourself, but let us let us know or let a different authority know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we, Lisa here always like uh, reminding people that they don't need to like touch with bare hands. Yeah. 
So, yeah. Wonderful. And just um, one more question for you both is of all of this amazing work that you all do, because it sounds like there's a lot that you are doing to help out um, both the land and the oceans. What are each of your favorite parts of the work that you do? For me, that's uh, uh, my favorite part is uh, going to Mandala for the bread. Yeah, I guess like um, I'm really enjoying like doing all these things. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I haven't decided on any favorite part. <laughs> That's you even better. Everything all. is the best part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's so wonderful. Do you all, do you each have a favorite animal or species that you're trying to help protect and conserve? Yeah, I guess we're all like trying to, like, if we see something that is become extinct or like, yeah, we, we help out. Wonderful. So it's not just one thing. It's really everything in true form of Global Biodiversity Festival. You love all of the biodiversity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for spending you. um, your morning, I guess it is, with us today. <laughs> we really appreciate you being a part of our Global Biodiversity Festival and can't wait to hear more about the work that Vipa is doing in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> of course. You have a uh, great day. Thank you. You too. Well, that was just wonderful to be taken over to Tonga and to see all of that wonderful work that they're doing between the mangroves and the chicken coops um, and the coral reef restoration. Just impressive and amazing to see what communities can do to protect our global biodiversity. So our next guest that we have um, is named Luis Naranjo. And Luis is a passionate birder and naturalist um, and holds a PhD in evolutionary ecology from New Mexico State University. He has been a professor um, and a researcher in California and Columbia for nearly 20 years and the director of international programs for the American Bird Conservancy for two years. He's worked on a wide range um, of ecological settings, everywhere from temperate deserts to moorlands and cloud rainforests, tropical rainforests, mangroves, mudflats. Um, so as you can tell, quite a wide variety of habitats. Um, today, we are excited to speak with um, Luis and he is also um, an, enthusiastic, an enthusiastic spokesperson for conservation in Colombia um, and has authored over 155 scientific papers and books and also writes a monthly column um, for the general public on natural history and conservation. And in 2018, um, Luis was also elected as a correspondent member of the Colombian Academy of um, Exact Physical and Natural Sciences. So I am thrilled to bring in um, Luis to join us. Hello, how are you? Hello, Lizzie. Nice to see you and uh, nice to join the Global uh, Biodiversity Festival. Yes, we are thrilled to have you here today and are looking very much forward to learning from you. Thank you. It is, it is very exciting for me to, to share with you some reflections and some ideas and uh, to celebrate this important day for all humankind. Yes, absolutely. Now, before we begin, do you have a screen you're going to share? Yes, I do. Uh, as a matter of fact, they have a... Uh, presentation to, to guide my, my speech. So uh, I'll, I'll be pleased to, to share it. Excellent. All right, so here it goes. All right, Just, we don't... Uh, Did you click the share button that's in um, our 
Oh, yep, I see it here. Perfect. All right. All right. So here we go. And you can hear and you can hear me well. Yes, perfect. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the people that uh, is still uh, this uh, time of the evening uh, in this uh, fantastic festival to celebrate uh, biodiversity. So as um, as Lizzie was uh, was introducing uh, was introducing me, uh, I'd like to, to repeat a few things. I am a, I am an ornithologist. I was trained professionally as an ornithologist, and uh, more than that, I am a very passionate birder, which means that uh, during most of my life. I have spent my time looking upwards, looking to the skies, looking into the canopy of the trees, trying to see as many birds as possible and uh, having a permanent thrill about all the biodiversity that I can see around me. I am fortunate, fortunate to, to, have be, to have been born in, uh, in the world's richest country in terms of birds, Colombia, and therefore I have had the fortune to uh, to really enjoy every single day of my life uh, looking for birds, trying to learn from them and uh, trying to, to capture all the, the wonder that is around them and how birds uh, can connect with uh, the rest of, of the world. So um, it is, I am sure, unnecessary to, to explain you uh, why I am fascinating, fascinated with, with birds and uh, why I have spent so many years studying them. But uh, just, just by looking at, 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 these, uh, at these fantastic creatures, you know, I have had the chance of traveling around uh, quite a bit and enjoying all these uh, fantastic uh, creatures. And of course, of enjoying all the, the geography and all the fantastic landscapes where I have been uh, looking for, for birds. Uh, for instance, this is a, a view of one of the most iconic places in, in Colombia in the, in the transitional zone between the Orinoco Plains and the Amazon, uh, where I had the fortune to, to be, uh, to be uh, uh, participating in an expedition to document the biodiversity of this uh, fantastic area while we were trying to uh, designate it as a protected Ramsar site. So um, this is why I have spent most of my life going after birds, because they give me the opportunity of traveling around, of, uh, of being in, in such fantastic settings. And of course, not only uh, discovering new birds and, and learning about their behavior and their ecology, but also to learn about uh, quite a few other things. Birds have given me the opportunity to learn about ecology, to learn about behavior, uh, to learn about evolution, to ask myself thousands of questions all the time, and, uh, and to become a, a naturalist. Uh, really interested in learning as much as I can about nature around me. But even with so much fascination that I have that I have had about birds and all the interest that I have had in learning about new things and discovering new creatures around me, there was something that somehow uh, remained hidden to my during all my life, I remained oblivious to something that was really, really evident, only that my senses were not capable of really discovering uh, what it was. Until uh, I had a fantastic uh, opportunity to discover it. Nowadays, I live in this place that you can see in this picture. I live in a rural area near Cali, near the city of Cali, Colombia. This is a, a very special neighbor, neighborhood, as you can see. Uh, all the, the houses of my neighbors and, and, and mine, I live here in this, in this house, right here. Um, we are in the middle of a, of a recovering forest. We are, trying to, we are trying to regenerate, we are trying to restore um, the foothills of a, of a national park uh, that is very close to the city of Cali. And um, 
I, uh, I, I am uh, very lucky to, to, to own this, this little piece of land here and uh, to enjoy this, uh, this great place. But uh, because of uh, all the, the work that I have to do and all the travel that I have to do, I really didn't have much of a chance of enjoying my, my surroundings uh, as I should uh, because I had to go other places. Until the pandemic came a little bit more than a year ago. And uh, as uh, all of you who are listening to, 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 this, to this talk, uh, will understand, I had to, to remain in my house uh, and I have been here in this house for the whole, for the whole year. And this was somehow, this was a gift, a very special gift because it gave me back something that I had been losing. This gave me the opportunity of slowing down, of looking around, um, around myself and trying to learn uh, from what I was what I was seeing in front of my windows. Uh, of course, I was always looking for my birds. I was I have been always uh, watching through the windows, trying to see every single bird that comes to my garden. But while I do that in good company, as you can appreciate, I uh, started to take notice of some other things. Looking at birds, I started to pay attention to many, many other things as I, as I have always uh, done, but, uh, but slowing down has given me a very special way of doing it, which is trying to pay uh, closer attention, trying to take note of every single thing that happens before my eyes and trying to connect the dots. I have been, for instance, paying attention to uh, the flowering events of all plants in my garden. Uh, I have been very, very uh, interested in the phenology of, of plants in, in my garden, the flowering, the, the, the fruiting of every single tree, shrub and, uh, and herb around the garden. Uh, I have been uh, trying to uh, identify as many small creatures uh, as I can. Of course, my, my, my eyes are always poised to the, to the canopy of the trees, as always, trying to see as many birds as possible. But uh, living in a biodiverse place like uh, the place where I live gives me the opportunity of finding many other things. I see lot of lots of insects, uh, lots of uh, butterflies and uh, and beetles and uh, and all kinds of insects, all kinds of uh, other arthropods, uh, spiders, scorpions, uh, millipeds, all kinds all kinds of, uh, of little creatures that uh, at other times in my life had remained a little bit uh, hidden from my interest because I was always in a hurry trying to either to, to do my, my to do my job or to pay attention to my birds. Slowing down has allowed me to pay attention to all these to all these creatures and learn from them. And of course to pay attention to the interactions of all these uh, little animals, all these little organisms with plants and uh, with each other. So in other words, the past uh, year, year and a half or so has been for me like a renewal of my uh, lifetime commitment to learning about nature, to learning about biodiversity. And this has been uh, really reinvigorating because I have not only learned a lot of things, but I also rediscover the, the pleasure and the gift that is in observing biodiversity. And yet, even with all that renewal of my interest, I still was uh, oblivious to something that was uh, just below my feet and I was missing. Until one day that I was looking for some information uh, in the web, I happened to run into a website of the University of Wageningen in, in the Netherlands, where a researcher was, um, was displaying a series of drawings of the root systems of uh, a good number of plants. And when I saw those pictures, 
it was really mind blowing to see how different were the root systems from the part of the plants that was above ground really blew my mind. If you look at this picture, for instance, you will notice that no matter what the aspect of a given plant is above ground, it doesn't have anything to do with the volume, the size, the shape of the roots underground. It is a totally different world. It is something un 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 a <laughs> sorry, impossible to imagine. So looking at this, looking at how different the root systems were from the vegetation above ground made me think all of a sudden, how would my garden, this is a picture of my garden, how would my garden look if I had the capacity of looking underground? What is hidden below, below my feet in my garden? What is going on down there? What kind of relationships uh, are palpitating down there uh, under the ground, in the earth, in the soil? And this set me to ask me many questions and try to learn or to remember to go back to, tech, to old textbooks uh, when I was a, a student, a graduate student, trying to remember what I, what I learned about soil biology and trying to, to visualize, because after all, as a birder, I am a visual person, trying to visualize how that hidden world would look, would look like and what meaning would that hidden world have for the things that, uh, to explain the things that I was looking around me. And uh, these questions have been particularly interesting for me uh, because they have given me the opportunity of learning or remembering many, many important facts. And not only that, trying to connect those facts with, with the, the things that, that I'm, I am most familiar with, with, for instance, the life of birds, the life of the animals that birds eat, the life of plants where birds uh, live and move around. And uh, so how all these dots are connected. And the truth is that uh, I was so amazed as, as, at, at what I was reading and, and relearning and discovering that I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't think of a better subject to share with uh, other people in this celebration of the uh, Global Biodiversity Day. So for instance, um, the most important thing is the, to understand that, that soil is an extremely complex environment. It is complex both physical, physically and chemically uh, because uh, underground the soil offers an immense surface area and an incredible supply of materials uh, for many different organisms. It provides food, it provides water, it provides chemicals, it provides habitat for a lot of different organisms. Organisms as different as uh, microorganisms like archaea, bacteria, protists. Of course, the plant roots, the first thing that, that called my attention, fungi, lichens, tardigrades, rotifers, nematodes, mites, springtails, worms, ants, termites, centipedes, millipedes, wood lice, and burrowing mammals. You know, in my garden, I have a family of armadillos uh, that come to come to feed on uh, on the grubs and the worms that are in the root systems of uh, of uh, some of the plants that that we cultivate in in the garden. And even having those visitors and having uh, a burrow uh, that they have kept for a few for a, for a few years. Uh, didn't make me think about uh, the whole world that uh, they were representing. 
until I came up with the discovery of uh, the drawings of those root systems. Just to give you an idea of how rich this world is, a single gram of soil may contain millions of individuals and several thousands of species of bacteria. Those microorganisms are absolutely essential to maintain this environment. They are at the basic, uh, at the basis of, of the whole system and uh, they make possible the life of many, many other organisms. If you go further up in the, in, in the chain, you will find that uh, for invertebrates, for instance, perhaps the numbers are not as astonishing, but even, even though uh, they are not as great as for microorganisms, in a single square meter of, of soil, you will find, in, of course, in a healthy soil, you will find uh, several hundred individuals of different uh, invertebrate organisms. So this, this shows you that uh, underground, there is, a, there is so much life or even a richer life that, than what you find above ground. So all this biological activity in the ground is responsible for the behavior of the soil, is responsible for wh what goes on above ground. And uh, that is because of the role that each uh, individual organism plays. Um, soils contain, uh, as I just said, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, microbial cells and many of them are um, archaea. So these, these uh, archaea, which by the way, if you remember, were some microorganisms that were relatively recently uh, discovered uh, are extremely important in terms uh, of their capacity to uh, thrive in very difficult uh, environments. So they play an important role as facilitators of uh, the functions of many other organisms in the soil. Some of them are capable of uh, living freely, but many others are associated with other organisms, including uh, some protozoans like ciliates, or uh, some invertebrates like, uh, like uh, ter termites. Uh, many of them are capable of, uh, of thriving, in, like I said, in difficult uh, uh, chemical situations, uh, including uh, soils contaminated with many, uh, with many substances. Uh, and like I said, they are facilitators for the life of many others. Then uh, along the, the chain of complexity come the, the, the uh, bacteria. And uh, soil, soil microbial biomass, um, fungi and other microorganisms represent between one to 4% of uh, total soil carbon, which gives, gives us an idea of the importance of uh, microbial life for ecosystem services provided by the soil uh, biota. Bacteria are part of chemical cycles uh, during which they release essential elements for recycling. And the best example is the, the role they play making available nitrogen for, for plants. Uh, bacteria are the only microbes capable of transforming nitrogen from the atmosphere into ammonium. Uh, which is the substance that is assimilable by, by plants. And therefore, they are essential for the life of plants and therefore for the life of organisms which depend on plants. And then there is something that is absolutely fascinating. Fungi. Fungi are, are an extremely important component of uh, soil life. And there are many different kinds of, of fungi uh, down there. Uh, but the, 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 the special kind that I like to point out is uh, mycorrhizas because they are the most, not only the most widespread uh, symbionts in the world, but also they are responsible for something that is absolutely incredible. They, are, uh, they have uh, relationships with many plant species. Um, they uh, are capable of... Uh, helping plants to communicate with each other. They are, in fact, what somebody have called like the internet, the underground internet. 
So they connect the root systems of many different plants and facilitate the communication among not only among different individuals of the same species of plants, but also between different plant species. And that communication is of a chemical sort. For instance, some uh, plants are capable of communicating to others some chemical signals uh, when they are attacked by a, by a herbivore. Uh, and so by, by communicating this alarm signal, other plants can get uh, prepared and alter their chemical functions in such a way that they get better defenses against herbivores. This is just an example of the kind of communications that goes on down there and that is only possible through the connections provided by mycorrhizas. And these connections are, of course, they are not totally free. Uh, plants provide uh, different kinds of sugars that are the, the outcomes of the photosynthesis um, and that the fungi get as a premium uh, for their services as, uh, as communicators. And uh, like I said, the fungi uh, provide uh, these channels for communication and uh, transport uh, the nutrients and uh, the chemical signals. So this is something of the magic that goes uh, below ground and uh, that makes possible such a rich life. And of course, there is the world of uh, this is the world of earthworms. Uh, I could spend uh, the whole of the time allotted to this speech uh, talking about uh, earthworms. Uh, remember that uh, earthworms made the subject for the last um, the last book published by Charles Darwin uh, in 1881 uh, about uh, the special role that they play uh, transforming uh, transforming the soil, uh, building the soil up uh, by decomposing organic matter and, uh, and, and producing humus and producing uh, fertile soil for uh, plant development. So this is perhaps the best known uh, phenomenon uh, that occurs in the soil, but it never, uh, it never uh, stops amazing us uh, because of the enormous potential that it has to maintain life uh, above ground. There are many other organisms, but perhaps uh, the, the, the most numerous of all besides the microorganisms are nematodes. Nematodes comes in all kinds of sizes, sorts, behaviors, and ecologies. Uh, but in the soils, uh, nematodes can play different roles. They can be, they can be uh, predators, for instance, they can be herbivores, they can be decomposers. But anyway, they, they play many different ecological roles and therefore contribute to uh, the whole food chain, uh, food chain below ground. There are many other uh, smaller organisms like Colembola uh, and, and, and uh, tardigrades and many other, uh, many other invertebrates, each of them playing a specific, a specific role. And even though they are tiny, difficult to see, difficult to sample, and uh, and to the human the human eyes, or at least to the eyes of a birder like myself, they are totally invisible. When we when when one starts to learn a little bit about them, uh, they are absolutely amazing. You know, they are not only they are not only as as beautiful and bizarre and interesting as the most fantastic bird. But uh, if you start to learn about their behavior, about the things that they do down there, uh, you know, the, the, the marvels of, of life underground really become true. Uh, of course, there are many other organisms like, uh, like uh, uh, rotiferans, uh, for instance, uh, and um, that, that depend on the water around the soil particles and uh, of course are very dependent on, on moisture. And uh, all of these organisms are involved in creating and maintaining the soil structure and providing essential ecosystem service, services for humans. We depend on all these creatures. Let's not forget that. 
most of uh, these organisms cannot survive outside the soil. So it is necessary to preserve healthy soils and to maintain their diversity if we want to preserve their beneficial influence and we want to preserve uh, what goes on uh, above ground. Many other animals spend only part of their lives uh, in the ground. Uh, some of them spend only their larval stages below ground and then they emerge. Uh, but during the time that they spend down there, they play uh, specific roles and they help to maintain the soil structure, composition and function. So this means that there is a, a natural soil food web that we need to be as aware as we are of the more or better known food web around us above ground. There are all kinds of relationships uh, among the different organisms that uh, form part of the soil biota. Uh, there are different levels of specialization of, um, of their function, but all of these functions are essential to what happens above ground. So it is extremely important to keep that in mind if we want to maintain the ecological functions on which all of us depend. So when I look around my garden, looking for my birds and I start to, to see things like the new, uh, the new flowers that are emerging in the trees that I have in front of my windows, those same flowers that attract the bees and uh, then that attract uh, that, that produce the fruits that will attract the birds all those things are happening because there is a whole world working below ground none of this is possible without the ecological functions underground so i am starting to pay attention to small things that are happening and that remind me every single day of what goes on down there. First, I, start, I am starting to look more and more at uh, leaf cutting ants, for instance. They are digging deep tunnels uh, in the soil, taking all these materials uh, into their deep chambers to cultivate their fungi and to contribute to the functions that uh, are happening uh, below ground. And of course, in the afternoons when it is sunny around here and uh, the cicadas start to start to sing uh, i remember that these animals that are singing in the tree in front of my window are just some animals that just emerged from long months or long years of their larva stage below ground where they were uh, feeding on uh, plant matter and contributing to build up the fertility of the soil that makes possible my garden. So uh, this is basically the reflection that I wanted to share with, with you. Um, I, am, uh, I, I am particularly pleased to, to, to share these ideas because they have given me uh, they, have, they have given me a great opportunity to learn about many things, about to, to, to understand that the magic of my birds, that the magic of the ecology and the behavior and the evolution that I have studied all my life, looking into the skies, looking into the canopy of the trees, is only possible, possible because there is a whole world thriving below ground. Thank you so much, Luis. That is such an inspiring um, talk that you just gave us. And I love that there's this silver lining of the pandemic that you found by looking beyond just the birds and your absolute love of learning and what you have discovered in just the past year is absolutely inspiring. So thank you so much for sharing that with us tonight. It was really a true treat to hear all of that and how it's all so interconnected. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. It has been a pleasure. And I hope that many of you will get inspired to, to look around you a little bit more and try to, to challenge yourself to, to see the things that are not so evident and go beyond your favorite uh, subjects to, to discover how rich, uh, how rich biodiversity is, uh, in fact, around yourselves. 
Yes, absolutely. I think that's the perfect, perfect message to end on. Um, so thank you so much, Luis. It was great to have you today. And I hope you continue to explore and find out new and fun, interesting things about biodiversity. I will. <laughs> no All doubt right. about it. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Luis. Wow. Well, that was fascinating just to think of how so interconnected the natural world really is is absolutely wonderful and a great reminder that no matter whatever stage you are in your career there's always more to learn our next speaker i am going to bring in for us we have joining us justin grubb and justin is a filmmaker photographer a published writer a naturalist and a co-founder of running wild media with all of his years of international wildlife field research and formal and informal teaching experiences, Justin has combined those different two different fields with media to enhance science communication. Justin's love for nature and passion for the outdoors has brought him to some of the most extreme habitats on earth to film some critically endangered wildlife. He is a 2017 emerging wildlife conservation leader and a Nat Geo Wild Wild to Inspire award-winning filmmaker, as well as a member of the Explorers Club. Justin, we're so excited to have you with us here today um, and can't wait to hear more about what you're up to these days. Awesome, well, I'm really excited to be here and share with you guys a really cool project that I've been working on. Wonderful, and um, do you have a sh uh, screen to share with us? I do, yes. Excellent. Yes. We can pull that up and get that in here for us. Perfect. All right, we'll add that in and I will let you take it away. Cool, I appreciate it. All right, so like she said, my name is Justin and um, on this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about preserving biodiversity through village-led partnerships. Um, it's a really cool concept that um, we have done with Planet Indonesia and that I'm going to kind of share with you guys. But first, I want you guys to do a really quick little thing for me. I want you to either close your eyes and listen or stare at this tree <laughs> and listen. But the important thing is to use your ears. You've probably seen a lot of photos today of um, biodiversity or videos, but I want you to just kind of stop and focus on the noise of biodiversity, what biodiversity actually sounds like. So we're going to be quiet for a little bit and we're going to listen to what biodiversity sounds like. So that is what a packed rainforest in the heart of Borneo sounds like. There's all kinds of really cool wildlife and noises that you hear. And you could hear helmeted hornbills. That was the, the laughing, cackling at the end, the hoo, 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 <laughs> That is one of the coolest noises you could hear coming out of Borneo. You could also hear rhino hornbills. You could hear gibbons. You can hear insects. That is the noise of biodiversity, and that is the sound of a really healthy primary forest inside Borneo. So as we go through the, the, the presentation, I want you to kind of think about what that sounded like and um, reflect on what species you heard and what other animals you think you heard in that noise. But quickly, just quick about me so you can kind of get an idea of my background and where I'm coming from. Um, like it was mentioned before, I am a filmmaker and a photographer. I'm an explorer. I graduated from Bowling Green State University, which is in Ohio, and I got my bachelor's of science in biology. And I'm currently earning my biology or my master's in biology through Miami University. But for this presentation, I'm putting on my, uh, my Planet Indonesia hat. I'm actually the international communications and outreach officer for Planet Indonesia. In Planet Indonesia, 
is a really cool organization that is based in Borneo. And they work with a lot of really nice people and to preserve biodiversity. So where is Indonesia? Well, if you look at the map there at the top left, it kind of shows the world. And then this little square shows where Indonesia is and everything that's green is Indonesia. The darker spots are other islands, other countries. So when I'm talking about Indonesia and the areas that we work in, we primarily work here in Borneo, um, but it includes the entire country of Indonesia. So Bornean biodiversity. Here's images of some of the coolest animals that I think exists in Borneo, which is where we work as uh, Planet Indonesia. And we'll, we'll talk a lot more about Planet Indonesia in just a bit. We've got orangutans. The Bornean orangutan lives in Borneo. Um, it's the largest po population of orangutans in Indonesia. There's three species, the Bornean orangutan being one of them. We've got proboscis monkeys. You probably have heard of these guys. They've got big schnozzes on their faces. They got big bellies and they love to eat mangrove leaves. Tons of insects, tons of snakes. There are about 1,500 different species of birds. There are almost 600 different species of mammals found in Indonesia. Thousands and thousands of species of flowering plants. Lots of different funguses. There's so much diversity in this area. And that's because Borneo in Indonesia sits right on the equator. And I'm sure you guys have learned uh, today that that's where you find a lot of biodiversity because the climate there is extremely stable and allows for all of these cool species to sort of evolve and fill all these very specialized niches in the environment because the environment is very consistent. Um, I do want to point out before we move on, this species right here, the helmeted hornbill, one of the coolest birds I think I've ever seen in the world. The males have big solid casks on their head and they like to headbutt each other. And they do that for territorial disputes and for breeding purposes. So they're a really, really cool bird. Um, one that Planet Indonesia really works well with um, protecting this animal from the wild. We're in the wild. Another thing I wanted to point out is humans. Humans are part of biodiversity. So when you look at an at ecosystem, you also wanna think about the humans who live in that ecosystem and their relationship with all the different animals um, in the environment. So you have your food web, but don't forget to also include humans in on that food web. So these are some of the biodiversity challenges in Indonesia. Uh, it's fairly similar to that, those challenges all around the world. There's habitat loss that usually comes along with development or agriculture where there's a lot of people or there's cities. You have to make room for houses and buildings and agriculture and stuff. And so in order to do that, you have to remove a lot of the habitat that was there before, or that's how it's been historically done. Moving forward in the future, I don't believe it needs to be that way, but that's how it's been over the last several uh, decades or you know, a couple hundred years. Um, so habitat loss acts to fragment biodiversity and cause these animals, their populations to decline. Another thing is pollution. You know, there's a lot of plastic entering the oceans around uh, the world, especially in Indonesia. There's a lot of, um, you know, garbage that's being tossed out. Um, so the pollution, you know, definitely affects the species out there in Borneo and affects the biodiversity. Overexploitation, that is a big one. Um, Overexploitation being um, using some natural resources or wildlife resources uh, to the point where it depletes these resources and they can no longer be um, used. So an example would be trees. Overexploiting trees is, you know, cutting them down for use to build buildings or use um, the logs for whatever decorations or building tools. Another example would be going out and catching too many fish off of the Indonesian reefs so that they could go um, in the pet trade and be sold at aquarium stores. Um, another example of overexploitation would be hunting, you know, going out into uh, a forest and taking out too many animals to where they are, their population has been depleted. Climate change obviously is a big one. Um, one of the things that is really affecting um, these habitats all around the world is since they've existed in such a very specific um, temperature range, climate range, uh, having that climate change changes the dynamic of those forests, which cause a lot of those species that have become extremely specialized to um, 
not be able to handle the change in the environment. An example of that would be the cloud forests in Indonesia. They have existed at a certain altitude, at a certain temperature for so long, but as the temperature rises, the cloud forests actually recede or go up in altitude and that habitat shrinks. And so the animals that live in those cloud forest habitat don't have as much habitat to use and are in higher competition with one another. Alien species, those are animals from around the world that come into um, a new environment, whether they're introduced by people um, or whether they are you know, usually brought there by accident. Um, these species often prevent other species from, um, you know, doing their life cycles and they compete with one another and cause their populations to decline. The last thing I want to mention is economic and political tension. Uh, this can put a lot of pressure on the environment and we'll explain a little bit about that later. Uh, but, you know, when the, when there's people in need, they often have to go to the environment to meet their needs and that puts a lot of pressure on biodiversity. So some really cool facts about Indonesia is one of the 17 mega diverse countries in the world. It contains 10% of the world's flowering species um, and second behind Brazil in number of uh, mammal species that exists within the country, which is uh, crazy because Brazil is huge and Indonesia is broken up into 17,000 islands. So a lot of little areas for these mammals to live, but not as big as Brazil. So the human challenges in Indonesia, um, which kind of are the reason why a lot of the biodiversity there is threatened, is there are 40 million Indonesians who rely directly on biodiversity for their livelihoods. And so that means that they rely on animals, and plants, species to feed their families, to build their homes, to um, make money. And so 40 million people is a lot. That's about the population of California, all relying on essentially the wilderness to survive. And so a lot of these people have lack of access to basic goods and services, which means they can't get to a hospital if they're sick. They can't easily find food. They can't just go to the grocery store and get food. And so what they have to do is they have to go out and they have to catch their food. They have to go fish for their food. They have to go cultivate their food. And in order to do that, it does put a lot of pressure on the biodiversity. Another thing is the socioeconomic inequalities that exist in not just Indonesia, but all around the world. Um, that means that these people don't have access to basic services. They don't have access to um, a fair income. Uh, they don't have access to education. And so that can cause a lot of tension between biodiversity and um, their livelihoods. But that is a really good place on where planet Indonesia steps in and really kind of helps the people who live in that area and helps preserve the biodiversity in that area by taking care of the people. And so planet Indonesia is an organization, it's a grassroots organization that's based in Indonesia and they work primarily with Indonesian people, people who live in communities in rural areas that live near areas of high biodiversity. Um, so there's a couple project sites in Borneo that Planet Indonesia works with, and it's everything from the marine environment to the terrestrial environment. So they're working with bottom of the ocean all the way to the top of the mountain, and they're working with communities and villages and everybody everywhere in between. And so by doing this holistic approach to protecting biodiversity, we're having a lot of success in seeing um, the reduction of some of these exploitation, pollution, and um, deforestation events that you would have seen prior. And so it's a very solutions-focused uh, program where you know, Planet Indonesia will go in and they will first listen to communities to see what they need, what they, what kind of services that they need in order to um, do their thing. Um, and then they will work with individual communities to kind of create these, these programs and services that the communities actually need. And by doing so, help alleviate some of that pressure off of the wilderness and the forests around them and that in turn preserves biodiversity. So creating the enabling conditions for these partner communities to where they can 
be empowered to govern their own natural resources and be in charge of their own conservation and, and stuff like that. So an issue that conservation has seen in the past where a lot of organizations come from other countries and send people who don't really understand the issues, the challenges, and the things that the people need who live in these areas that these other organizations are trying to come and help conserve. And so that creates a lot of tension between an organization that doesn't necessarily know what's going on, telling another organization what to do and how to conserve their species. Well, the great thing about Planet Indonesia is it's more, uh, it plays more of a supportive role where it enables these communities through education and training and other support structures, economic support stru structures, so that these communities are actually in charge. They're the ones who are doing the conservation. So they live within areas of high biodiversity, they live in at-risk ecosystems, and they're the ones doing the biodiversity preservation, the conservation. So it puts them at the forefront in the front lines of conservation and makes them the champions of conservation. And these are just people who are going about their daily lives, you know, doing whatever that makes them happy, but they're the ones who are being the conservation champions. And that's what's really cool about this program. And so the various programs that Planet Indonesia has are, there's a long list of them and there's more, I'm not gonna go through all of them because that's, that's a lot to go through, but I will touch on some of the really important ones and how they work. So that when you're thinking about you know, how to go about a conservation project in your own backyard or in your own community, or, you know, if you're trying to preserve biodiversity, you know, think about these in the back of your mind. And this is kind of maybe kind of stuff that would be helpful to you to really focus and hone in on what the community needs in working with the people that are around you, because conservation really is a human issue. It's not a wildlife issue. You got to work with people. It's all about people. And so making people happy is a great way to conserve wildlife and to get things that you want to get done. So one of the, I think one of the best programs that Planet Indonesia has, and one of the most holistic programs is the Conservation Cooperative. And so what this program does is it allows community members to voice what challenges they're experiencing, and it, it allows them to tell Planet Indonesia what services they would like. And so with that, Planet Indonesia enters a little um, contract with them and starts providing a lot of services that the community needs, things like healthcare or education programs or uh, community loan programs where you know, they will, community members will receive business training from Planet Indonesia to do new sustainable exploits such as sustainable farming or organic fertilizer or stingless bee cultivation and they'll receive the training to do so and then they can receive business loans to be able to build the infrastructure for them to be able to start doing that or um, they'll receive a business loan to receive more business training that they need or more more resources that they possibly would need to do that and so all the training that they receive does revolve around some sort of a sustainable um, business so that they have the ability to create a more resilient livelihood so that they, they are a little bit more resilient against economic or natural disasters or anything like that. If they have a solid business plan, a solid livelihood, then they'll be able to rely on that versus going out and needing to rely on the biodiversity. So that 40 million, this is all about reducing that 40 million so that more people have a sustainable, organic, holistic livelihood that they can fall back on um, in order to protect the species. Um, so Healthy Communities is one of those programs. They go in and they help um, people who need access to hospitals. They'll provide, they'll provide training Planet Indonesia will provide training for local ambassadors within the community so that they can provide basic health services so that the people living in those areas are feeling a little bit better. Um, one Another thing they do is fisheries management programs where the communities will actually um, manage their own fishery. So they have temporary fishing closures to where they allow whatever they're fishing for, typically mud crab. Um, mud crabs live in mangrove ecosystems and they're a really delicious food. 
um, source for the people who live there. So being able to do temporary closures on those mud crabs to where they have the ability to reproduce so that when the fishing is open, there's a lot more crabs available, but that in turn helps the other animals that rely on those crabs and those fish uh, for survival. And those animals do well and they contribute to the mangrove ecosystem, which definitely always relates back to humans. So, you know, healthy communities, if people are healthy, people are happy, the wildlife should be happy. Um, education and literacy programs, I mentioned before. Um, mangrove restoration, agroforestry, that kind of goes in with those conservation cooperatives where um, by, you know, planting some agro agricultural products, they're actually contributing to re restoring a lot of the rainforest to the habitat in the area that is then usable for those species that are rare and endangered. Um, but in addition to all of that, Planet Indonesia does a lot of scientific research. Um, one of that being um, the biodiversity teams. So Plant Indonesia has biodiversity teams that go out and they study the wildlife. They set trail cameras. They do audio transects. So they listen for the animals, just like you guys listened to at the beginning of this presentation to determine what species are present and what species are absent. And they'll use that data and they'll analyze it and they'll compare it to the data of the human side of it. So they have metrics and a baseline to understand, you know, what programs are being implemented in what areas and how has that impacted the biodiversity in that area. And what we were finding is some really cool stuff. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. But another really cool program is the Smart Patrol program. It's spatial monitoring um, assessment reporting tool, which allows rangers to go out into the forests and these project sites with GPS units and cameras and data sheets and use mapping technology to really understand where the animals are and where the pressures are. So they're, you know, making note of illegal activity um, anywhere that people are taking resources that they shouldn't be um, so that they can better implement the rules of the protected areas that are all, all of our project sites are associated with. And with these two programs, the villages that Planet Indonesia supports and partners with are the ones leading these programs. So the people who live within these protected areas are also the people who are leading these biodiversity surveys and who are leading these smart patrols and are uh, enforcing the rules and regulations of these protected areas to make sure that the wildlife is safe because they know Healthy wildlife populations, healthy forests also equal healthy communities and healthy human lives. So last program I'm going to talk about, like I said, there's more, but we got to get through this quickly. Um, one of them is really cool. It's Wakatak. It's the ex situ conservation program where uh, they're working with species outside of their native natural areas. They work with animals that have been taken out of the forest. Uh, an example of that are songbirds. Um, so a lot of the songbirds are taking from, taken from the forest, and that goes along with the exploitation, over-exploitation that I mentioned earlier is an issue to biodiversity in Indonesia. These birds are taken out and they're sold in markets all across different cities. They're sent to Jakarta, which is the capital, um, and so a lot of people buy these birds and keep them in cages their whole life. Well, this organization, the Wakatak um, program, addresses that. So they address illegal wildlife trade. And what they'll do is market surveys, they'll collect data on the animals being taken out of the wild and put into um, these illegal wildlife situations, but they'll also confiscate the animals, bring them back into the forest because Planet Indonesia is building Indonesia's first animal rehabilitation center where the animals will be taken from the illegal wildlife trade, rehabilitated, acclimated, and then released back into the forest. And so this is a really neat idea that will take animals, put them back in the forest so they can continue tr contributing to the ecosystem. And so over the last six years, Planet Indonesia has seen a lot of really positive changes. So a significant decrease in deforestation. Like I mentioned, a lot of these communities are, are reliant upon biodiversity and in times of need, they have to go out and they have to cut down trees, they've got to take animals. But when they're part of these Planet Indonesia programs, they no longer really have to do that as much as they did. So we're seeing a 77% decrease in the amount of deforestation that we had seen historically in our project sites. 
And since we do biodiversity surveys and really study the animals along these areas, uh, we're seeing a major rebound in wildlife populations along these sites. And I can anecdotally attest to that. When I went out to uh, one of the project sites, Gunung Nu, um, about three years ago, we had just started the Smart Patrol program there. And when I went into the forest, it was really kind of quiet. I didn't hear the noises that you heard at the beginning of the presentation. All I heard were insects. And that's because the birds and the mammals and those animals were taken out of the ecosystem because of hunting and so forth. And so I went back again after the program has been active for uh, quite a while and was able to start hearing rhinoceros hornbills again and helmeted hornbills again. And I saw a couple monkeys in there as well. And so the noises were coming back and that is all a result of the presence of the villages, the smart patrols that these villages have going on. The fisheries are stable now uh, before there were long periods of time where it was hard to find mud crabs. Now because of the temporary closing of the fisheries, they're able to get a lot of really good harvests throughout the year. Um, and we have over 59 partner villages now, all a part of these conservation cooperatives and receiving programs and services from Planet Indonesia. And we're growing at a very, very fast rate. We just had um, a map come out where it showed our exponential growth of the conservation cooperative model. Um, over the last couple months, we've added a bunch of villages to our programming. And we're really excited about what this year is gonna bring and what the next couple years are gonna bring. Uh, we're gonna keep adding partner villages to create these resilient livelihoods so that they can have more food security, economic security, um, all part of these programs. And so all in all, we have over 170,000 individuals who all benefit in some way from these conservation cooperatives and these services that Planet Indonesia uh, implements in the community. And so with all that being said, I think the important thing to walk away with in this presentation is that communities and people and locals are the answer to preserving biodiversity, protecting biodiversity, and really turning around uh, the massive biodiversity loss that we've been experiencing um, over the last several decades. It's really working with people, making sure that their needs are met, and that's how you address the root issue, the root causes of biodiversity loss all around the world. So when you're thinking about ways to solve whatever issue you want, if you want to implement a conservation program in your area, or you know, if you're a, a young a young budding conservationist and you want to save a particular animal in your backyard, really it comes down to working with people, getting people to understand what the issue is, how to protect it, but also supporting those people's needs and making sure that they're happy so that then you can protect the wildlife. And so we want to hear from you. We want to connect. So if you guys have any questions or if you have Anything you want to say, please check us out. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Uh, the website is planetindonesia.org. We're on Twitter. Uh, you can contact planetindonesia.org. There's an email there, but you can also Facebook message, Instagram. It actually goes to me. <laughs> so if you have any questions, feel free to ask on those platforms, and we would be more than happy to connect, give advice, um, and entertain your, your comments. And so with that... Um, I'm Thank you so much, Justin. That was absolutely fantastic um, and so wonderful and inspiring to hear. We have um, something that just came in on the chat that said, very encouraging. Please keep these efforts going on. Um, so thank you so much for all of that wonderful work that you all are doing at Planet Indonesia. Um, and it's so impressive to see in the six years the impact that you've already had is absolutely amazing. So definitely worth celebrating indeed. Absolutely. And we're excited to be adding new project sites here in the future. So keep your eyes open for news and all kinds of exciting stuff uh, that we're working on. But I mean, this model could be implemented anywhere in the world and have just as much success as we have. So yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you being here and sharing all of your work. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me. And uh, this is such a unique idea and a cool program. I'm excited to be a part of it. Absolutely. All right. Have a great night, Justin. All right. Thank you. 
And with that, we're going to bring Joe back in um, to kind of take us home in the final stretch of the Global BioFest. It's been amazing, Joe. Hey, Lizzie, how you doing? Looks like you had a great triple header of events there. Yeah, I definitely learned a lot of new things and I'm very inspired. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, thank you so much for that great hosting. Um, and yeah, you're right. We are in the home stretch. We have a handful of events left. It feels like barely any time has passed since Thursday night when we flipped the switch on the festival. We've traveled to six, almost 60 different countries, uh, all seven continents, 150 plus scientists, explorers, adventurers, conservationists, uh, people in the world of finance, photographers, filmmakers, and more. So it really has been quite a wild uh, weekend. I think we've learned a lot and I think we're seeing a lot of common themes coming out of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, it's so impressive that you're able to pull this all together and bring us to all of these different places to learn and to celebrate our biodiversity. All right, Lizzie, thank you so much. Great series of events. Uh, and you're welcome anytime to host these crazy festival weekends with us. I love them. Thanks so much, Joe. Have a great rest of the night. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's keep things moving right along. Um, we have, let's see, we're going to run events through for at least the next hour and 45 minutes before we uh, wrap up the festival for the weekend. So this festival really grew from year one to year two. Uh, year one was over three days, roughly 10 hours each day and about 68 speakers. Uh, and as you just heard now, we 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 got a little carried away. Um, there's so much amazing work going on all over the world. Sometimes all we hear about in the news is, you know, the bad news stories. And you can't ignore those stories because there are a lot of things happening around the world, biodiversity loss, climate change and such. But there are so many great people working on the front lines to do something about it. Uh, making changes, so much grassroots conservation work happening. And we really want to celebrate a lot of that as well uh, through this festival. So we are heading to Vietnam now. We have Ollie Wern joining us. He is an ecologist and conservation biologist. He can often be found rummaging around in a tropical forest. He's currently working at the Institute of Zoology uh, with the Zoological Society of London. And so the project he's working on now will integrate historical camera trap data, remote sensing data, and cutting edge statistical models to uncover uh, trends in Southeast Asian mammals. And these are a highly threatened group of species. Tonight though, he's gonna focus on the gibbons. So there's a lot of great grassroots conservation going on right now, and they're finding some success reversing what was looking like a bleak future for the gibbon. So I'm gonna bring Ollie in with us now. Hey Ollie, how you doing? Hey, yeah, hi Joe. Nice to see you. Nice to see everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you here joining us, um, representing the project, representing uh, ZSL, who we've had a few uh, speakers join us from. FFI, Fauna and Flora International. Oh, no. So, <laughs> I'll forgive you. You've been up for probably something like 72 hours. Okay, no fair enough. Maybe, did you, did you, were you with ZSL in the past? I was, and I spent a lot okay. of my career there, but I'm now uh, at Ford and Flora, and uh, that, they, they would, wouldn't thank me for uh, not reminding you. No, absolutely. No, good. Good good on you for jumping in. Um, that's the problem with lots of bios being online on the internet. Yeah, uh, sure. So, uh, Fauna and Flora International, and we've got a great, for the R1 uh, uh, planet, we're going to share a great um, video afterwards, encouraging people to get on board and sign that petition. So, great. very cool. All right, Ollie, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, we're going to have a few questions. OK, yeah, okay. I'll just share my share my screen, if I may. Yeah, go for it. Absolutely. So can you see what I see? We got it. Looks good in full screen. Cool. All righty. So I'm going to be talking to you about the wonderful world of gibbons. Um, and I'm, the title of my presentation is Saving the Small Apes from a Big Extinction. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, Joe just introduced me. I'm a wildlife biologist at Fauna and Flora International based in Vietnam. And uh, I provide technical input and advice over, over the many projects we have here in Vietnam across eight different, different sites. Um, Vietnam is a, is a primate hotspot. You may not know that. You may know about the Madagascars of this world um, and other countries, but v Vietnam is really a primate hotspot, and that's Fauna and Flora International's uh, focus here in, in Vietnam. I'll be telling you about some of our work uh, on gibbons, um, what's happening to them, what we're doing, 
Um, and it's just great to, to share Gibbons and, the, and their world with you. So the, the Gibbons, singing, swinging, masters of the treetop. If you've ever been lucky enough to see Gibbons, um, they can't fail but take your breath away. They fly through the canopy with complete ease, um, reaching speeds of 50 to 60 kilometers per hour, purely with their, with their arms. Um, they almost never come, come down to the ground, so they're, they're true forest specialists. Um, and they're, 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 the Latin name for the, the group is the Hylobatidae, um, which, in, which comes from the ancient Greek forest walkers, which really sums up their, their way of life. Their great evolutionary invention was something called brachiation. Um, effectively, it's an arm over arm way of moving through the canopy, a little bit like you probably did uh, as a kid in the, in the playground when you were doing the monkey bars. Um, gibbons make it look easy and they have a special joint in their, in their wrist, a ball and socket that gives them the flexibility to, to brachiate um, through the canopy with ease. They're also really important for ecosystem function in the forest where they, they still survive. Um, gibbon poo is gold, effectively. So they, they are really selective about what they eat. So they, they're fruit specialists, mostly on figs, although we're learning um, the gibbons in the, 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 the further north you go in subtropical areas actually are eating more leaves than they are, are the tropical, tropical gibbons, which are more fig and fruit specialists. Nonetheless, um, they love their fruit and they, they move last, large distances, so they're dispersing the fruit in their, in their poo. Um, and that helps in particular these kind of large, larger seeded tree species. Um, studies of defor deformation more broadly have found that areas of forest without their mammals um, actually shift over time to a lower carbon uh, store in the, in the forest. So with all else being equal, a forest with gibbons has more carbon being stored than a forest, forest without. They, our last common ancestor with Gibbons was about 18 million years ago, um, which is a relative blink in the eye in terms of evolution and these large scale processes. They sit just beyond the, the great apes. So in the past, we often called them lesser apes, although now um, we prefer small apes, um, which is less of a loaded term. And we share about 96% of our DNA um, with Gibbons, roughly. And they may be small in name, but they're certainly not small in nature. And there's no better way of demonstrating that than with their call. So I'm going to play with you now um, the call of the Calvit gibbon, um, which, is a, which is a species of gibbon that lives in the far north of Vietnam on the border with China. And I'll tell you more about this species in a bit. But let's first hear, hear its call. Let's hear the, the male first. And um, interestingly, the Calvert Gibbon has an onomatopoeic name. So like the cuckoo, it's named after the sound that it makes. And you might hear the male saying its name, Calvit. So that's the male. Um, and then you can hear the, the male singing initially in the next call, but then the female, in fact, two females, this, this male gibbon is lucky enough to have two wives. The two females come in um, and give the great call. And together we call this the duet. So this is the male. This is the females. It's just an incredible sound. And if you hear it in the forest, it can't help but bring a smile to your face. So gibbons are, are classified into four main genera, the Hulot gibbons, um, the Namascus gibbons or Crested gibbons, Hylobates um, in Southeast Asia, and Symphalangus, which is the Siaman, which is just a single species. There are 20 species recognized um, now with the recently described Skywalker gibbon uh, taking 20th place. But I'm going to focus on the Namascus gibbons, the Crested gibbons, um, which are distributed across Vietnam, but also a little bit into Laos, Cambodia, and, and China. 
So let's meet the Crested Gibbons, the rarest apes on Earth. So across Vietnam, there are six different species, which is a crazy number for such a small country. In the far north, we have the Calvit Gibbon, which is the one you just heard. To the west is the uh, Black Gibbon, sometimes called the Western Black Crested Gibbon. And this gibbon is just crazy, the, the environment that it lives in. It lives in high altitude forests, and where, which takes snow and ice. And you can see that it's also the fluffiest gibbon. It's got very long hair because it's enduring those cold temperatures. The Hainan gibbon, not actually in Vietnam, on, but it's on the Chinese island of Hainan. And this sadly gets the, the title for rarest ape on Earth. There are around about 30 individuals uh, left on Earth. And the white cheek gibbons in central, central north Vietnam, Namascus leucogenes and Namascus sikai, these have crazy uh, white cheeks, so white sideburns. So they are, they are the wolverines of the gibbon world. And there are a couple of species further south as well, Namascus anamensis and Namascus gabriele. So let's go on a, a quick field trip to the Calvert Gibbons home on the border with Vietnam and China. So here you will find the last place on earth for the Calvert Gibbon. Um, FFI helped to support the government to, to create a new protected area, the only protected area on earth for the species um, in 2007. And it lives in, you can see in this, in this um, Google Earth imagery that it lives in this kind of limestone fortress, which has helped protect the, the forest through time. So we'll go on a trek into the forest. So we'll follow the road to the edge of the forest and then we'll start hiking up the side of the forest. And you'll be greeted with this view when you get halfway up the, the side of the limestone. You'll see all the sticky rice growing in the fields below and the villages and the turquoise blue river, which gets that color from, from flowing through the limestone, limestone rock and picking up the minerals. And you can see the, the Chinese border right in front of you, stretching into, into southern, uh, southern China. So I hope you brought your trekking poles and some good footwear, because we're gonna keep going deep into the, into the area. And the whole area is underlain by this limestone rock. So you're not actually walking on soil the whole time. You're walking on um, basically sharp pieces of rock, jumping from one, one piece to the next, or clambering up, um, desperately holding onto trees. Um, it's an extreme environment, that's for sure. Local people call, call the rock cat's ears, um, but actually I think dog's teeth is a more befitting name because it takes chunks out of your shoes. If you persevere and reach the top of one of these limestone mountains, you might be rewarded with this kind of view. Um, it's just incredible and like nowhere else on earth. If you're patient, you may spot this chap and chapette. So here's a Calvert, Calvert Gibbon family. The female is this kind of apricot color, and you can see some black subadult and juvenile individuals in the back, and they're, and they're having a nice groom. It seems like maybe I was at, sitting in a tree whilst taking this video, but the extreme terrain means that you can often be at eye level with the gibbons, which is just a rare, a real treat. This youngster, young male, just came clambering down after his mum, but his mum flew off. And so you have three young individuals here, probably around about seven years old, four years old, and, and three years old. And they're just such special animals. So what's happening to them? Well, it's, it's, it's a similar story as with many species. Um, they've lost a lot of their, their forest home. A lot of this happened historically in, in Vietnam. Um, people have been farming rice, for example, for, for thousands of years here. So a lot of this is old. 
but there's still areas where where deforestation is still a threat um, to gibbons in, in Vietnam, like in the central highlands. Also logging of high value timber um, as well. There's actually a logging ban in Vietnam, so all of this is, is illegal. And there are a number of quite niche crops which are important locally in Vietnam. So a really important one is black cardamom. And this is used in all sorts of Chinese dishes and it's used in Vietnam's national dish, dish pho, which is like this soupy noodle broth. Um, it's very tasty, but unfortunately this black cardamom is a key ingredient. And so this now is, is spreading across um, large parts of particularly the black gibbons um, home, last remaining home, and it affects the forest structure, it thins the canopy, and it endangers the future of the forest as well. Hunting with guns as well. Um, the guns on the right-hand side were, were seized by one of our community patrol groups in one of our sites uh, just last year. So this is an ongoing threat to Gibbons. And sadly, now many of the Gibbons in Vietnam are also endangered just purely because of their small size. When a population becomes very small, it starts to lose its genetic variability and individuals, closely related individuals, start unfortunately breeding, breeding together. And this can cause problems with breeding, higher death rates, which lowers the population even more. And you can see it's a vicious cycle. So the key with these these populations is to try and bolster them and, and increase them over time. So we work, as I mentioned, across eight different sites in, in Vietnam, across a host of given species, five of the, the six given species that, that occur here in Vietnam. But to really exemplify the kind of work that FFI has been doing in Vietnam, um, I want to talk to you about the Calvic conservation, Calvic given conservation. It's been a 20 year journey. Um, and this kind of long-term committed approach to sites kind of epitomizes how FFI has worked in Vietnam. Um, and this has had real payoffs because you build those relationships over time. So a dollar spent in year one is, is equal to a hundred dollars in, in year 20 or maybe a maybe thousand dollars. So the Calvert Gibbon was actually lost to science for 50 years, but it was finally rediscovered by, by Vietnamese um, FFI uh, primatologists in 2002. And community patrol groups were quickly established um, the next year. In 2007, FFI supported the government, local government, in setting up the world's first protected area for the species, the Calvert Gibbon Species and Habitat Conservation Area. And two years, at, two years later, FFI in China helped the, the Chinese government set up Bangyang National Nature Reserve. So it's now protected, this last remaining population, on both sides of the border. In 2013, we introduced SMART, um, which you heard about in the last talk, actually. It's this professionalized way of um, patrolling. It involves software, data, and mobile data collection. And we saw a huge improvement in the quality of the patrols where, where we've introduced SMART. In 2016, we did a large-scale transboundary population survey, which showed that the population seems to have recovered from its past stresses and is now uh, stable going forward. In 2019, just before the pandemic was taking hold, um, we established the first Gibbon monitoring team. And in 2021, this year, we've had a, held a series of Gibbon festivals for local people. Um, and there is so much more to what we've been doing to do with livelihoods and forest restoration, but this gives you a taster of the, the key milestones. So as I mentioned, we've, we've set up the first Gibbon monitoring team in Vietnam. Um, it, it was in December 2019, and we had no idea what was to come, but they persevered, um, kept calm, and carried on. And we've now had more than a year of following a, a focal group and got to know got to know this one given group for the first time in Vietnam. And it's revealing the habitat preferences, how far they move, um, something about how quickly they breed and they and they die. So um, really important for understanding the future of the population. And alongside that, we've been been training uh, these local guys, all from local villages in 
in how to collect data, for example, with acoustics, um, acoustic monitoring, and we do that in, in the field. So these are the Gibbon celebration festivals. Um, we've, we've held two already and more on the way in, in local villages, and they've, they've involved hundreds of local people, all enthusiastically getting involved, and people seem to love it, um, children and adults alike, and that's been really heartwarming to see. And the pandemic didn't stop us from defining also a new vision for the Calvert Gibbon up to 2050 and defining the key actions to do um, up to 2030. And so we held just a couple of months ago an online, offline, multi-country, three language, uh, it was crazy, um, action planning workshop across Zoom and, and two uh, physical hubs as well. So COVID-19 has not stopped um, Calvert Gibbon conservation, that's for sure. And really just to, to justify all these efforts over, over 20 years, um, we've, we've done some, we've looked back at some of the fixed point photography that we've done. Um, and in some sites, you see some incredible recovery of the forest in this, in this area. So on the left in 2008, this was an area um, that had been long grazed and used for, for shifting agriculture. And you see by 2020, now um, the forest has restored and gibbons can use this and expand out and create um, new habitats. And really, thanks for listening. Um, the gibbons are the kind of neglected apes. So, you know, if you're thinking about what you can do, I mean, the simplest thing is to tell people, tell people about gibbons. And um, amongst all the, the great apes, they can often get lost and forgotten. So, yeah, please think of the Calvert gibbon and um, think, of the, think, think of all the gibbons, all 20 species. Thank you. All right. Well, I mean, I know I am going to now because uh, I now know gibbon poo is gold and I'm going to hold on to that. <laughs> after this talk. So thank you so much for sharing that work with us. It's, I mean, it's so good to hear those good news stories where conservation is working, where the community is getting excited, getting involved, um, and things like those festivals can be so successful. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, we were, we were bowled over by the attendance. Yeah. Um, you know, people have a lot of work to do in these areas. They're busy either with their, their sticky rice or any, anything else, but they are absolutely loving it. So that's really great to see. So do you think part of the excitement, so, you know, I have a friend who works in Madagascar and he, he works with a lot of, you know, remote villages. And at first, you know, I think they kind of think lemurs are everywhere, but when they find out it's something special and unique to that area, then there's that excitement and incentive to want to protect it. You've got something unique and special here. Do you think that's part of the reason that excitement is so high? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's partly that and, and also just, I mean, the Gibbons, when, when you open their worlds to people, people can't help but respond to them. They're, you know, they're, they're monogamous um, most of the time. They, you know, they love their family. They, they sing. Um, you know, they're, they're not dangerous in any way and they don't conflict with local people. So, you know, they're, they're actually really easy to sell when, if people are listening. So people really get on board with their conservation. All right. So the, those field work conditions look pretty tough. Uh, I'm wondering yeah. how long a typical uh, field journey or a field session will last. I mean, these guys, we the Gibbon monitoring team, um, they work around the clock to basically to follow the Gibbons as much as they can from, from dawn till dusk. And they, they typically do kind of 10 day trips into the forest. Um, I've joined them on, on one of these and it's, it's hard going. You're, you're camping or, or, or crammed into a tiny shed. Um, it can rain nonstop for, 72 hours is slippery limestone or slippery rock. You cut your hands. Um, but then when you get to the top, which is what I was trying to trying to show with some of those pictures, it's, it's quite breathtaking. And you, you, you could be in Avatar or something, but this is this is Earth. This is this is the real thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those rangers sound just really tough, just rock solid to be able to do that and and follow Absolutely. along and keep track. Are is there any uh, in the project, any any tagging? to you know, make it a little easier to follow? Is it all just kind of doing transects or just following when they find um, a group? Yeah, we, we can't get close enough to them. And, and you know, we need to go through all sorts of steps if we're gonna, if we're gonna go down that path. Because um, with, with just 130 individuals left on earth, you know, everyone is, is precious. However, with the action plan that I mentioned, 
um, the key for, for the caveat given is actually to recover it because the, the, the population is, is too small and the habitat is, is actually too small. So we actually, mm. we started in that workshop and that action plan to start that discussion about maybe moving individuals sometime in the future to, to a new forest home and start to recover the species in, in parts of its historical range, which is really exciting. And, and that will inevitably involve tagging. Um, you can yeah. tag, you can GPS collar gibbons and they, they adapt to it. They, yeah. they sit normally and they move normally. So you, it can be done. Okay. Very cool. So, you know, you mentioned how it really is kind of a fortress and that probably really helped a lot mm. with protecting them and, and, you know, keeping that population kind of separate from some of those, those threats that you mentioned. The, the work that FFI is doing is that, are you working to expand that into other areas, take kind of that same model and then work on other areas, other populations of gibbons? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, we are just, um, at the, the early, earlier stages of a project, maybe in our fifth year, which for FFI is quite early days, um, in the central highlands in, in further south. And that's where the, the newly discovered Namaskas anamensis, um, the northern yellow cheek gibbon lives. It's um, endangered, poorly known, lives in, lives in the mountains. And these areas of the central highlands in Vietnam are, are, are being rapidly lost and being carved up. So we're working with local government partners who are receptive to the idea of establishing a new nature reserve. So we're doing all sorts of biodiversity surveys. We did a huge large scale gibbon survey over many, many months camping in the forest and, and counting the gibbon songs. Um, so that's that's quite a new project for us, really exciting, but but the threats are really, really high. Yeah. Sure. No, absolutely. I you know that's what I, I like so much about hearing about this work is you're doing all the right things long term uh mm. and really bring the community in from day one and getting that investment um i just don't think conservation can work without that so mm. great stuff absolutely that's that's the lesson i think from from our work here and I, you know i've only been here two years and um i can i can see the fruits of that labor of of, of 20 years it's just so important to commit to a to a site or a handful of sites it really is yeah all right well ollie thank you so much for joining us uh, joining us from Vietnam, sharing that story with us. It really is a great story. And uh, as we kind of race towards the end of uh, the festival, it's great to have a, a really nice kind of good news story to kind of bookend things. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the for the space to letting me talk about Gibbons and good luck with the rest of it. You're almost there. <laughs> we're, we're close. Thanks so much, Ollie. Have a great rest of the day. And me I have too. a that we'll connect sometime in the future. Yeah, absolutely. See you. All right. Thanks, Ollie. All right, so I do want to take a moment now. Uh, we have a, uh, a couple minutes now. I do want to share one more time uh, FFIs are one home. So they're really supporting this pledge. Um, there's a very easy petition to sign um, to really kind of push governments around the world to dedicate $500 billion a year uh, to conservation. So let's take a little look at this video here. We'll share the link one more time, and then we're going to spend a little time with Kristen. I'm really looking forward to it. Our well-being, our economies, everything depends on a healthy planet. And yet we continue to neglect it. You'll have heard, probably more than you'd like to have done, about the devastating decline in biodiversity and nature all around the planet. Our beautiful planet that we call Earth and the existence of countless beautiful species face a serious threat from climate change. In the last 50 years, we've seen wildlife populations fall by nearly 70% as their natural homes and habitats are being destroyed. We cannot underestimate just how vital healthy, functioning ecosystems are to the future survival of our own species. That is why FFI is backing a campaign asking governments around the world to put $500 billion every year into the hands of those people who know best how to spend it. Local people who understand local conditions. Я нахожусь в Кыргызстане, где мы реализуем важные проекты по сохранению глобально значимого биоразнообразия на местном уровне. Es una realidad eminente que la tortuga laúd y la tortuga carey del Pacífico Oriental siguen en peligro crítico de extinción. Es por esta razón 
que necesitamos con urgencia seguir apoyando a las personas y a las organizaciones que trabajan en primera línea. We must all act in unison to minimize our impact on nature and reverse the damage that has been caused to biodiversity. Please sign our petition to make this a reality. Back our one home campaign to put power back into the hands of the people who most need it. All right, so very simple to do. Uh, there is the link down there, change.org uh, backslash R1 home. So do visit that site, sign the petition. Uh, it is such a great idea and it's so needed right now. Um, and in fact, it's, it might not even be um, you know enough money, but it's, it's a start. It's a great start. Uh, so do uh, take some time and do that. And great to have speakers from FFI joining us throughout the weekend. Just uh, early, early this morning, uh, I spent some time with uh, Hannah Raza in Iraq, and she was talking about what conservation is like in a in a uh, conflict zone. So really great to speak with her and great to have Ollie joining us this evening as well. All right, time for another shift here, another discussion. So uh, last year, the Global Biodiversity Festival, it came together in about three weeks. It went from idea uh, to a living, breathing festival with over 60 uh, speakers in under three weeks. We had a great group from all over the world, but one thing Paul and I realized is you know, we really were missing the investment piece, the finance piece and how important that is. So that's something uh, we really made an effort to try to bring back in uh, or bring into the festival this year in year two. So to help us out with that a little bit, we've got Kristen Reckberger joining us. She's the founder and CEO of Dynamic uh, Planet, a firm that helps advance and invest in markets that restore nature. Um, it focuses on developing responsible business with high impact partners that regenerate landscapes, seascapes and communities optimizing environmental, social, and economic returns. So before founding Dynamic Planet in 2012, Kristen was Senior Vice President of Global Programs and Partnerships with the National Geographic Society. And she also continues to serve on boards like the Prince uh, of Wales Charitable Foundation, National Geographic, Pristine Seas, uh, and Smithsonian Institution's Earth Optimism. So let's get Kristen in here with us. Hey, Kristen, how are you? Joe, it's so nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Of course, it's great to have you uh, joining us. Um, I mean, one just has to do a little search online to see that you're very passionate about uh, conservation uh, and you know what we can do to help protect our planet, elevating the right people. And uh, you know, it's exciting to have you join us to talk a little bit about the finance piece and how um, how much of an important part that's going to be. Uh, yeah, for sure. Closely. Um, I'm still trying to get over the last session of those great gibbons and all the wonderful work that you've been doing for the last few days. So thank you so much for having this festival, Joe. It's really, really terrific. Um, yeah, I think any of us that have worked in conservation have have struggled with financing, right? How, how do you pay for this? Yeah. And it's hard when nature traditionally has been free and therefore not priced and therefore sure. not valued, right? And so a lot of questions for a lot of groups, especially NGOs um, we worked with over the years is, how do you possibly um, make sure that things are sustainably financed and can can even potentially even be profitable um, in the long run and reinvest, be reinvested back into it? And so in National Geographic, we saw a lot of those types of projects and help develop their impact and, and business plans. And that's a lot of what we do now at, at Dynamic Planet, um, including with partners like National Geographic's Pristine Seas. Yeah, yeah, okay, very cool. So Dynamic Planet works with high impact partners, advancing conservation markets uh, and restoring nature. So a lot of people viewing might not be familiar with conservation markets. Can you kind of share a little bit? Tell us a little bit how that works. Sure, when I started Dynamic Planet in 2012, I used to go to, I live in Washington DC and be at a dinner party and say, yeah, so what do you do? Well, I help build conservation businesses and people will be like, is that an oxymoron? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, you can actually uh, make money and do the right thing for the environment. And the good news is we're no longer getting those kinds of questions. I think um, conservation markets are really what are 
a lot of groups are really good at a conservation plan or a science monitoring plan or biological plan, but really what's your business plan? You know, how can you yeah. really figure out your revenue streams and either fundraise for it or in the long run, maybe create an endowment if there isn't a market, but if there is a market, how do you really look at how to sustain these businesses over time and grow them? And especially for, with equity back to the local communities, which is a key piece because um, one of the equity issues in conservation is that a lot of things get valued up the supply chain, but not at the local level. And I loved um, the line on your on your last video before I came out of local people who understand local conditions. That's yeah. exactly what we're trying to do is drive all of the power that we can possibly have, whether it's policy or finance, to these local people so they can do the best with the resources that that they deserve. Yes, absolutely. I think, and and it's it's. So, I'm so glad we're seeing this. I think kind of fading away in the distance are the days where someone just drops in and starts telling other people how to manage their resources. Um, well, they can look back and be like, "Well, where's your old growth forest?" And you're coming here and telling me what we need to do with our resources. So, yeah, it is. It's a very exciting time right now, and connecting with so many grassroots organizations, um, you know, organizations that were started uh, and then. Uh, you know, the young leaders rose through and are taking them over. It's so exciting to see things like that. It is. And you're, you're bringing up a really important thing, Joe, which is the alignment issue. So if someone comes from the outside, they might not know all the layers of the history and culture and natural systems and the current people that live there and how that all evolved over time, which is, of course, where indigenous knowledge and all those important factors come in. So people come in with their own ideas and it just might not align. And yeah. that alignment's critical, including with the funding side. You can't just swoop in and expect um, money to do the right thing in the right place if it's not properly aligned. So uh, what we try to do is really find the, that when we mentioned high impact partners, the, it could be um, government leaders, it could be community leaders, it could be business leaders, but whoever really has that you know, holistic view of the place are, are the teams that we like to work with to try to you know, evolve the market in that place and create a regenerative market instead of what's traditionally been an extraction market in a lot of a lot of ways in a lot of places. Yeah, absolutely. So when you have a major conservation target, you know, we hear a lot about uh, 30 by 30, so 30 percent of the land uh, and ocean by 2030. Yeah. Where does uh, conservation finance fit in? Is there a role for the public and private sector um, finance and businesses? Yeah, so those kinds of campaigns of 30 by 30, 30% of land and sea protected by 2030 are really important North Star kind of rally the troops type of things. And if you're talking to governments when they're signing on to these things, the first question they ask is, this sounds good, but how much will it cost? Yeah. <laughs> so there, there are resource mobilization party, uh, a work stream figuring figuring these out things out. And there's been great reports in the last year or two that help inform this work, whether it's the Waldron Report, Death Group to Review, all these great things that have come out around biodiversity and finance. They actually weren't really clear and aggregated around the things we're trying to solve by 2030 until the last couple of years. So with a lot of this best thinking of economists and mapping and um, resource mobilization, um, there is public sector interest in trying to figure out, like in the Green New Deal in Europe, for example, or the new Biden administration in the US, how do we really start to pay for this and turn our markets in the right direction? Related to that public financing, of course, is subsidies, including fossil fuel subsidies, which can keep a lot of these issues in, entrenched with current self-interest. And um, a lot of the systems that we're trying to change in conservation are actually being eroded by subsidies and we actually learned that, you know, what we need to regenerate our economies is just a very small fraction of what we're what we're um, paying in subsidies as taxpayers in our country. So there's a lot of big substantive public sector things to change. And on the private sector side, um, it's also really important that you have the different types of private sector financing, starting with philanthropy, but going into impact investing as the market matures and then opening up opening up bigger private sector opportunities. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's it, that line of how much will it cost? It's so short sighted when I mean, the cost of not doing it is so astronomical. I know. High. And I know. returns now will pay off so much uh, in the future. I mean, it's just 
it's hard to get out of, you just can't seem to get government out of that mentality. You can't seem I know, to even in the US, we know that the national parks, which are, you know, struggling, they, they generate 10 times, 10 times what we put in just from the, the um, markets around them, from the local communities and all the other things that benefit. And that's probably a conservative estimate. So it's, it is, um, we need to do, I think, a better job in our narratives for those of us who are working on these issues to really um, help create the value that has not has been externalized by by traditional capitalism, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, kind of touch you on that cost of not doing anything. Um, you know, how does the health of our environment, um, you know, affect things like small businesses? How do corporate value chains and sustainable development goals fit in? You probably know from COVID that a lot of small businesses really struggled. I mean, um, they, it showed. I think 2020 was pretty a pretty drastic reveal of how much resilience we still need to build into our supply chains. And our supply chains really start at the at the base, right? At the local community level and where conservation really matters. And um, whether it was small scale fishermen, or of course, tourism operations and all these other groups that we try to work with to build a holistic conservation market, it was really tough. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of groups found alternative ways to survive and different local markets versus international markets and other things you know, shifted. But it was a shock to the system, and it was shock, obviously, to the global economy. And, and we're still trying to figure out exactly, you know, what's what this all looks like. And um, it'll it'll have been an important moment when we look back on 2020 for sure. Um, but I think when you look at the value chains, what you're also seeing in in this current moment, which is such an exciting time, I think, in our work, is people have had this time to take some deep inventory. I think whether uh, you're just a normal person voting or, or buying things or also a, a business leader and saying, I wonder if I can do better because things are pretty, pretty bleak, right? Yeah. And, um, and then all this talk of investors and company commitments towards ESG, you know, environmental, sure. social and governance um, with investments in things. There's a huge momentum of commitments right now. And I think groups like ours are going to be helping, helping them deliver on their commitments and make sure they're real. Make sure they have the real transformational impact that is necessary right now instead of just uh, these nice political like rah-rah statements. So I'm excited that that kind of um, big company like Microsoft saying they're not only going to be carbon neutral, but nature positive. I mean, all these companies are saying huge things in the last six months. And uh, even U.S. Dairy and Beef Associations, and, and it goes on and on. So um I think that that will be resonating with all the way down the value chain to how how things are supplied. Hopefully, yeah. with more transparency and equity. And I think it's it's an exciting time. Oh, I, I no question, things an exciting time. I mean, you just have to look. You know, with the last administration pulling out of the climate agreement, and a lot of organizations kind of stepped up to say, "Well, we're not. You know, we're gonna we're gonna keep going towards our goals." Exactly. And it's it's almost kind of frustrating when you hear. You know, as we slowly start to maybe come out of this pandemic with with the vaccines, people saying, I can't wait to go back to normal. I can't wait to go back to how things were before when you just want to no, know because how things were before is why we're in this situation. Exactly. <laughs> uh, diversity. And so it, it's really exciting to see some of these changes happening and, and corporations starting to step up. Um, but it is kind of worries you a little bit when you hear I can't wait to get back, get back to the way things were. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think there is definitely these these tensions, right, between uh, kind of a, a a green new deal type of trajectory and a lot of a lot of groups wanting to join that, and then kind of this entrenched. I want to double down and and let's try to. And I I think we don't know what what's going to come out in the next six twelve months. I think um, yeah, I think we're just we're nowhere near through this yet. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, in my intro, I talked about how you work with partners to build regenerative seascapes, landscapes. Can you give us an example of one of the projects you're working on? Yeah, sure. So um, I was lucky to go to Gabon uh, with the Pristine Seas team back in 2012. Seems like a lifetime ago. And um, it was a really, really special trip because it was with Mike Fay, who did the global, the, the mega transect across Gabon and helped set up the, the national parks on the land. And um, with Minister Lee White, um, currently in, in office, they invited us back to do uh, a sea transect. So Pristine Seas was able to help design the most 
you know, the most regenerative area of Gabon, 30% of its coastline of, of a, a blue Gabon, and, and really try to hook that up with the green, green Gabon planning from yeah. the decade before. And I bring up this example because we work on a lot of projects at the subnational or local level, but this is a national project with a visionary leadership that actually wants to build basically a country of conservation markets. And that is to me so exciting to have a sustainable conservation economy. Yeah. Um, right now, as you as you probably know, Gabon is a petrol um, country and they really want to diversify. They've been in that really um, mono uh, industry for since the seventies. And they're thinking about um, sustainable timber and also all, you know, all sorts of interesting tourism and, and smart, agriculture and i think that it just has the potential given that it is so um pristine still land and yeah. sea that yeah. if if done well it could really be a showcase country uh, for the world and um there really aren't that many like them i think i mean what would be the other one B bhutan maybe that has that kind mm -hmm. of opportunity and planning and what we see is a lot of countries really want that vision and even during covid and for example, in tourism, some countries are really taking the time to reset what they want in quality versus quantity or values aligned visitors and things like that. So for example, like in, in Panama or Palau or Iceland or, or even Venice and Barcelona, these, there was so much over tourism or the kind of tourism they weren't happy with through 2020. Um, and they're taking the time to reset what they want. And um, so we work with groups like that, but also just to have a place like Gabon where you have like a holistic view of all sorts of sectors really looking at a long-term plan, thinking about um, how you can really bring a lot more benefits to the local people is, uh, is a, an exciting piece of work for us right now. No question. Gabon is such a beautiful country uh, with so much intact natural resources. A good friend of mine, uh, Joe Cutler, he uh, just finished a mega transect of the Ogui River. So oh, over fantastic. a thousand kilometers, sampling uh, the biodiversity all the way along, pack rafting. Uh -huh. We did live events with classrooms all the way down the river. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and it was just just amazing. But you're right, it really is kind of at this point where there's a decision to be made because you know this is one of Africa's last wild rivers and there's multiple dam projects proposed. So I'm sure kind of racing against time to to show what's there and bring it to the government and say, This is this is what's here, this is we're at stake. So yeah, it, it's it's exciting to hear that these conversations are happening. Um and there's a, a possibility for us to be a really great kind of showpiece of what can happen, what good management, sustainable management can look like. It's cool too, because you have the traditional um, ways of planning and um, some of these, some of the, you know, things that you can do like with agroforestry or fishing and other, other mm -hmm. pieces. And then there's the carbon markets too. So um, we have really great data for um, Gabon's coastline. Um, and then they also have amazing forests also. So there's, they have, they are rich in carbon. And as people think about carbon markets as one more layer um, of how you put together a conservation economy, they have, they're in, they're in good shape. Yeah. So, you know, one thing, uh, Paul, Paul Rose and I have been discussing uh, kind of leading up to the festival and then, you know, over, over the, the, the three days and seeing the themes that have been coming out of it you know, is we've been talking to all kinds of scientists and conservationists and explorers, talking to finance people, um, you know, a lot of people who do spend their time in the field. So we're, we're really kind of thinking about the key takeaways and the new ideas uh, that we can take away from this festival. You know, we want kind of that bigger picture. We want a sustainable economic future. Um, so, you know, I know you've tuned in a little bit, uh, you know, over the three days. And I'm wondering if, if, you, if you've seen anything kind of emerging, anything that's kind of... Um, grabbed your attention? For me, it feels like um, people are thinking about business side more, I think. And I think that um, it seems like even, even in the last session, there is this long-term planning element. People are sticking with things um, for a long time. And that, of course, requires the funding commitment to do that, which is great. Because sometimes yeah. you've seen these projects come and go just based on you just didn't have enough enough money to get to the next stage. So um, I think that things are moving in that direction. I do think that like the gentleman on the last session said, you kind of need a 20 year time frame yeah. to think about this stuff. And yeah. what we like to do is um, see where things are at, at a certain stage, whether it's a place that's just been protected or it's, or it's, it's in the you know, implementation stage or even maturity stage. And how do you move it to the next 
next level of maturity and in, in hopes that it can be even more solid from a financial standpoint. And, yeah. and I guess I was hearing more of that in the stories this festival. I, what do you think? No, I, I think so 100%. I think, I think people are starting to realize that, um, you know, investments, green investments can pay off just as much, if not better than kind of the traditional investments that we, we've been investing in. And, you know, we, we, t we talked to uh, Will from Aviva and he just shared this, this, just this excellent point, you know, people are making investments, investments towards their retirement and their future. But if you're making investments that are going to hurt that future retirement and your quality of life, what's the point in making those investments? Exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, um, when I speak to some um, traditional finance houses and they say, you know, we're, we're really, we're really conservative about where we put our money. We're building for our, our next family's legacy and our, our grandchildren and great grandchildren and people will never know. And I'm like, that's great. What kind of world do you want them to live in? You know, yeah. so it's, it's exactly that. It's um, being smarter about how we can direct capital, which is a, a really powerful the thing that the capital markets are really powerful and really important. And I think if they're directed the right, right way, they can have major um, benefits and success. And um, we already are seeing, you know, back to this ESG indicator and signal. I mean, we're seeing people really wanting to find deals that are shovel ready and really have social, environmental and financial returns. And of course, there's some people that do tend more on the financial side versus the others. And there's others that are like, I made a lot of money or that's really not my main, you know, that's not what turns me on, but I really want that park to be standing by the time I pass and make sure that other people enjoy it, you know? So yeah. it's, um, I think we're seeing a real awakening. And then I, like you said, I do see more and more people walking the walk. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm glad you touched on that next generation. Cause that's something that, you know, I, I love seeing, you know, as, as someone who was originally an educator before kind of moving into the the, the work that I'm doing now with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, um, is just seeing how switched on this generation is and how much they realize what's at stake and how they're not waiting till they're an adult. They're waiting and they're not waiting. They're using their voice. They're being heard. They're launching projects uh, and they're not being quiet. So that's, you know, we, we, we hosted several kind of youth, young youth leaders throughout the weekend as well, which was another great piece to add to the festival. And, and that's really exciting. I just wish we could get them into power a little bit quicker. <laughs> that's cool. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kristen, this has been great. What a great conversation. I, I think I see Paul backstage. If, if you're back there, Paul, turn on your camera. Cause I think we should bring Paul in. He's, he's really been excited about the finance side of things. And he's talked so much about the lovely thread that kind of goes from in the field, collecting data, uh, and then where it goes and, and and who makes decisions with that. So I see him there. There he is. Nice and early for Paul. Hey, oh, Paul. You're supposed to be sleeping. It's really, oh, really hey, I've enjoyed your session. <laughs> <laughs> really great stuff. Oh my goodness. You know, and it's near the end of the, of the festival. There's only two more left. We've got um, the Royal Geographical Society and Russia to wrap it up That's in a sort of geographical, you know, we're a geographical festival, so why not wrap it up with, with geography? But That's preceding funny. that, we can't go wrong with your input, Christine, because we've had everything. And we've had, you, you might have seen the Arctic Philharmonic, who did an amazing job of telling us, you know, you've got, you, we've got to use music to communicate global issues. We've, I think we've caught the thing where, you know, it can be a lonely place at the front line where these people are doing research, uh, doing great stuff, and yet feel, particularly these days, they're not being heard. For sure. Normally they might get visitors, they might get eco-tourists, they might get funders and supporters and influential people coming to see their project. And, you know, it makes you feel great, doesn't it? You're in the field and here comes, oh, you know, great, you show what you've done and, and there's a sense of outreach. Well, all of a sudden that's not happening beyond, say, science papers or laptop sessions just like this. So we've really connected those people with people like the Arctic Philharmonic, with with you, you know, with, with, with BBC reporters and journalists and conservation workers and photographers all over the world. So it's really been, it's really felt like one big tent. That's so wonderful. That yeah, it's I've just... been so excited about this thread. I, I mean, you and I have spoken about this, Christine. I've spoken about a lot with Enric, but this invisible, uncelebrated thread that connects 
someone at the front line getting out their tent every three hours to take a weather observation and global economies. You know, and all of a sudden we've got the ultimate motivation for, for carrying on because we know that every single data point is getting somewhere. It's being listened to. So you beautifully described it. So all the, the, everybody that's watching, uh, I mean, I went to sleep last night and there was 82 countries uh, that we'd reached. I don't know how many there are right now, but everybody that's watching, those of you that are in the field work, um, you know, Kristen's just given you the, the ultimate encouragement. Keep at it. Yeah, oh, well, you guys have been amazing. You keep at it. And it's been such an inspiration to be part of this and uh, a wonderful festival again this year. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks for, for the input and, and for the encouragement to keep going. You know, it's all going somewhere. It's not just going <laughs> to some dusty old paper somewhere. You know, no, every okay. data point means something. Thanks to you and your team. Well, thank you. Thing. Thanks, Paul and Joe. Oh, yeah, Kristen, thanks so somewhere. much for joining us. Amazing, again, work, amazing work Dynamic Planet is doing. And just yeah. a real pleasure to have you joining us as we as we wrap up uh, these three days. And hearing Paul talk about sleep, I don't even, what is sleep? What is that, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this guy. He's off the charts, this guy. <laughs> and Christy, uh, j just to say as well, Dynamic Planet, that's the name. That, <laughs> that's what we're, know, we're all living it, aren't we? That's all you need. I love, absolutely love that name. <laughs> see you soon, Kristen. Great, see you. Uh, we miss you. Miss you too. We'll see you soon. And thanks see again, Joe. Thanks, thanks, mate. Kristen. Thanks. See ya. Yeah. Love it. Well, Paul, what do you think? Well, I think we're doing great. I mean, sort of, I haven't looked at the figures yet today, but I'm excited by the numbers. I know it's it's wrong to look at a festival like ours, which means a lot more than just the numbers. Sure. Um, yeah. But it is easy to get addicted to, particularly you wake up in the morning and quick a quick flash at social media and see where it's going. And it's a very unscientific number, isn't it? Reach, you know, this yeah. reach, how do yeah. you get to it? But wow, I mean, I might be biased, but I think we're having a great effect. <laughs> well, I think the stories we've shared, I think the different areas we've connected, um, I think the the people we've highlighted and the incredible work that they're doing. Mm. Uh, that, yeah. It's been fun too, because we give equal weight to everybody. So whether it's the, the Arctic Orchestra or a globally well-known conservationist or someone doing incredible work at the front line who doesn't reach many people but is doing great work, we've given them all equal weight. And that's uh, one of the yeah. real pleasures in the book. Everybody's got a page. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, and it's a, it's a lovely thing. And I think that's where we get the energy from. It feels to me like we're genuinely in one big tent or, if you like, we're in one big submarine. Wherever we are, we're in one big place on an enormous global you know, research project, we're there. Absolutely, a big tent with lots of room. Um, <laughs> absolutely, very cool. Well, I'm gonna switch our background because uh, I think this is kind of a fitting background. On one hand, you could look at this as maybe like a sunset on the festival, but I'm gonna look at it as more like a sunrise. I think we're starting something here. I think it's gonna keep growing. And I think as we build towards year three of the festival, it's gonna be some really exciting times. Yeah, absolutely right. I think last year was was a beautiful base camp, a real solid base camp. Now we're up well above advanced base camp. You know, we're up in in the, in the upper camps, and next year we'll be on the summit. Absolutely, no question. <laughs> and then we'll go for that moonshot after that. Okay, it's the deal. <laughs> Perfect, awesome. Well, Paul, uh, we've got two, like you mentioned, two great um, recordings that have been sent to us by two amazing. Uh, individuals, one from the Royal Geographical Society, one from the Russian Geographical Society. And like you said, this is a lot of this has been about geography um, and putting those pieces together, those moving pieces. So um, we're going to start with Joe Smith. I'll let you tee it up uh, and we'll go from there. Great stuff, Joe. See you in a moment. All right. You can't have something called the Global Biodiversity, Fe Biodiversity, Biodiversity Festival if you're not thinking about geography. So we decided to finish with uh, two stories, one from the Russian Geographical Society and one from the Royal Geographical Society in London. And so it's a real pleasure to introduce my friend Joe Smith, who's the director of the Royal Geographical Society London, and it really is my spiritual home. So it feels wonderful to introduce a recording made by uh, Joe, um, and he's called it um, a 20-minute recipe towards a sustainable world. So here's Joe Smith. Enjoy it, everybody. Hi, my name is Joe Smith and I'm the director at the Royal Geographical Society in London. 
it's such an honour to speak to you and to be in this amazing lineup uh, across this weekend. I was honoured also to be one of the speakers at last year's inaugural festival, and I got a huge amount of, out of tuning in to the programme across the weekend. Thank you to the imaginative and hardworking organisers of this great thing. So last year I made a rather bold statement, irresponsible even, when I claimed that humanity could make this its best century yet. Now you could call me glib, naive, trite. It turns out that the English have quite a few different ways of dismissing optimism. Well, today I'm going to once again challenge that half of me that's North American and insist that we take on a can-do attitude. In fact, I'm going to be even more glib, naive, trite, optimistic, hopeful in the next 20 minutes or so. I want to try and convince you that we already know the recipes that could serve up our best century yet. And today I'm going to give you a version of mine. Let me recap a couple of the points I made this time last year. First, when you look at the evolution of environmental ideas in the last 50 years or so, you have to recognise that we've come a very long way in a very short space of time. In the midst of the great acceleration of the 20th century, with its massive expansion of human impacts on the non-human natural world, we also saw a parallel acceleration in our understanding of Earth systems. Among other things, this took us to an understanding of global environmental systems and the far-reaching interdependencies and interrelationships that make them up. For me, this has helped to finish Darwin's sentence. In other words, it's helped us to understand ourselves as in and of the natural world. And I think that thought could be enormously powerful in the years to come. So I believe we are seeing the right conditions for what could be, if we make that the case, an unstoppable outbreak of wisdom. So I'm going to try to present this as a recipe. Uh, in the UK, there's a popular TV show called Ready Steady Cook, where you have to pull together a dish in a short space of time with the cameras on you. And this format has spread around the world, um, probably because it's painful to watch people suffer as they struggle with the challenge. In Poland, I know it's known as Smacznego, and in the US it's known as Ready Steady Cook. Sorry, Ready Set Cook. I, I don't know what the other formats are called, versions of the format are called. So I'm going to try and do the same and offer you a recipe for our best century yet, working only with available ingredients. Uh, a few props I might draw on are uh, a tin of emergency drinking water from uh, the Cold War, uh, a tin of genuine Canadian centennial air from 1967, the year of my birth. Um, these may, may or may not reappear. Um, a blue marble I may reference at some point. And I'll just tease you with this. Um, you may not yet know what it is. Um, if you email me with a correct answer, I'll just say, well done, thank you very much. There isn't a prize. Um, no, I'll probably tell you what it is as time goes by. So the available ingredients. As I say, you can only work with what you've already got in the cupboard in that game. And that's a relevant reference point for me because we almost certainly haven't got time to develop and deploy new technologies at scale. But picking up tips that I've gathered from the world's greatest sustainability chefs over the last 30 years, I think I've got a pretty robust recipe for what would create a much more sustainable world. Uh, the sustainable world, that blue marble, uh, often called fragile. Now, actually, I think we ought to recognize that um, the Earth and its systems themselves are not fragile. It's the uh, sweet spot for humanity that we've arrived at that is fragile. And we need to do all we can if we want to stick around uh, to ensure that this wonderful blue marble um, allows us, its situation, uh, our own situation being the fragile thing, uh, to 
succeed on it. Now, what I'm going to propose isn't a fixed and unchanging recipe. I'm pretty sure it'll work even if you vary the quantities of the ingredients in different places and at different times. Indeed, recipes for change are a bit like comedy or tax systems. They tend to be very culturally specific. So give this a try where you are. But you will need to give it your own local twist. And do please share your tips and variations as you go. This is going to be a learning experience for all of us. Now, in my version, I think there are five key ingredients. You may come to your own number. The first is a stable political consensus on key ideas that can be sustained in democratic systems through three or four election cycles. And that's because we can't uh, keep turning backwards and uh, restarting the process and winning the arguments once again. We have to have these ideas sustained over time. Now, in some parts of the world, you might have to reach right to the back of the cupboard for this one and blow the dust off this ingredient if you're living in one of the all too numerous polarized societies around the world. But we need to take all of the main political parties in democracies and, where possible, the dominant forces in other political systems to the point where they all commit to sticking to the script on climate change and biodiversity protection day in, day out for the rest of their career. So fair enough, news of airport extensions, road building or obsessions with clumsy and outdated metrics summarized as economic growth figures or make it sound like we haven't even got this first ingredient onto the table. But I think we start from a surprisingly good place. Let's start by considering where the electorate's heads are at. And this is also true in countries without democracies. When you look at polling data, you find that awareness of humanity's huge environmental impacts has been building nicely over time. And that there is now a really chunky majority of concerned or very concerned people on environmental issues, people who recognize the need for action. And politicians have been recognizing that and reflecting that in words at least. In parallel, that concern is unlocking a great tide of determination and innovation um, that's found in more than pockets now of business and local government and cities and uh, that itself will propel uh, politi mainstream politicians uh, to a new perspective. But concern on its own doesn't give us this first ingredient in our recipe for change. It has to be translated into commitments that are shared across political parties and even competed over in green beauty contests at every election. So how to win these commitments? Again, I think there's some good news to be found in political contests of recent years around the world. It's becoming increasingly difficult to find countries where, at local and national level, whole parties oppose sustained action on big environmental issues. I think we've seen the climate issue tilt just in the last two years. There might be conflict within parties and recalcitrants here and there who wrap themselves in their flag and promote simplistic narratives about how logging or an unconstrained fossil fuel industry serves the poor and unemployed. But the tide is going out on these short-termist arguments and on the idea that parties can win majorities in democratic systems without recognizing the force of logic that our economy is underpinned by our ecology. But those of us that hold to these ideas need to be need to allow them to be pal palatable across the political spectrum and a whole range of political philosophies. Some of us respond to the idea of conservation of treasured things. Others are motivated by the sharing of collective goods. Our political consensus needs to get comfortable with this range of motivations for caring about our planet. Progress at international level would have been impossible with, without such a big tent approach. Keystone international events 
including the United Nations Conferences of Parties or COPs on biodiversity and climate change this year in China and the UK and Italy, have the power to ratchet forward our ambitions and to publicly bind leaders into broad coalitions of the willing. All the countries in the international system are bound into these processes. Competition for international leadership is hotting up. These are moments when the backsliders can be publicly embarrassed and we should all take those opportunities, but also remember to reward uh, leading politicians with the odd thank you as well. But for that first ingredient to really release its flavor, we do need a second ingredient, which is to recognize that the policies that are designed at the core of those, uh, those political programs are designed around the need to recognize responsibilities and to protect against vulnerabilities. Now, a key feature of our knowledge of global environmental issues is that responsibility and vulnerability tends to be very unevenly distributed. So we know that environmental degradation of the last 100, 150 years um, should be laid at the door of the economic powerhouses of the great acceleration above all Europe and North America. I mentioned timekeeping, so I'll tell you what this is. Um, it's an egg timer from probably the 1830s, 1840s. Um, it, I come from a long line of clockmakers. We've been clockmakers for 250 years. And going back six generations, my antecedent was trained by the person that made this in Derby. Um, sometimes Derbyshire is called the hearthstone of the Industrial Revolution. So um, if you're looking for someone who is uh, genetically responsible for climate change, you could pick me because uh, without time measurement devices, you couldn't have the Industrial Revolution and you couldn't have burnt a huge portion of coal uh, and later oil and gas um, to power the great acceleration in consumption that we've seen. So I'm responsible. And the poorest countries and the people, poorest people in them are going to be the most vulnerable to the consequences of climate change and uh, other forms of global environmental uh, degradation. We have to make sure that the policies we devise acknowledge both responsibility and vulnerability. And I'll pick that more up more in my next ingredient, but we have a set of good hard thinking delivered in the form of the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to help guide our way. They give us a, a broad and sophisticated framework in which to both think and measure our progress. And that balancing of responsibility and vulnerability is found in, in many of the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. Just one thing about this ingredient though, um, We've got 17 goals, there are 169 indicators, and uh, even more social and environmental objectives clustered under them. It's a great plan, a great process, a great toolbox of approaches, but a vanishingly small number of people are aware of them. We have to do something to turn sustainability into a compelling story. That story will be easier to hear if we get our third ingredient right. And that's about the better pricing of goods um, that uh, embed our best guess of the full social and environmental costs of products, including prominently an end to fossil fuel subsidy and, and introducing forms of taxation or pricing for carbon particularly, um, but also valuing uh, our, our, our key natural resources, including uh, including forests. So this is really about making sure you can afford all of your ingredients. Some just aren't worth the price, but some new stuff you can find on the market does the job. In some ways, even better. I'm thinking of uh, renewables here. Now, uh, it's important to recognize that, uh, as I said, taxing, uh, a bit like comedy, is very cultural, culturally specific. There will not be one 
answer fits all here. Um, but broad principles and frameworks um, can help. And of course, in a globalized economy, uh, common rules are going to be uh, vital um, in order to put the right price on things. Now, it's also worth saying that if we've got sticks over here in terms of putting the right price on goods and services, we also need some carrots to balance that with. And one of my answers to that is that we will be protecting some of the absolute essentials of life and improving quality of life and public health. So my emergency drinking water from the Cold War, um, we've learned in recent decades how to deliver clean water and sanitation to every household on the planet. We've just got to get on with it. Um, unlocking resources by taxing certain things and pricing certain things better will allow us to pay for those essential needs. Ditto, whoever you are, and if you're living in a town or a city, you suffer from dreadful uh, air quality. Um, and here, my 1967 Canadian Centennial Air is a sort of jokey reminder of the fact that um, the quality of air isn't what it could be. And um, action on climate change is going to deliver vastly improved quality of air and quality of life. Uh, and prioritizing green modes of walking and cycling um, will uh, take us to a better place uh, in, in terms of everyday life. Now, I've, I've already really summarized my fourth ingredient, which is that revising some taxes and prices um, will open up space to reduce others. Now, I can't do a better job than a US Republican politician who uh, came up with the phrase carbon funded tax reductions. So his point was that there are political opportunities for people coming from the right to address climate change. And uh, from his perspective, it was about the opportunity if you added a tax load to uh, fossil fuels, you could actually reduce uh, the tax load on businesses and in incentivize entrepreneurship. Um, so this is what I mean by actually a political coalition for action on climate change doesn't mean everyone will end up saying the same thing. In a way, we want to see uh, competition and argument about the best and fastest way, remembering our uh, ticking, uh, ticking clock, um, the importance of, of recognizing the limited time we've got. Um, that competition in the policy space, as much as in the uh, commercial and entrepreneurial space, is going to be really important to unlock, um, uh, unlock initiative and allow for pace. So now to my last ingredient. We've got a lot to do and we haven't got a lot of time to do it in. However, we are the most imaginative, energetic and purposeful species when we put our mind to it. And one of the things that we can do to speed the pace is to support and reward experiment and innovation. Now, I've touched on some of the ways in which we can do that at the level of the economy um, through economic signals that reward entrepreneurship and successful innovation. But also we can and should uh, reward and thank people around us that help move things on. That might be a good citizen, uh, a purposeful uh, local, uh, local politician. It might be through prizes like the Earthshot Prize, which will be gathering global attention to some big ideas. I show gratitude every single day, thinking of my grandmother, who, when she died at 101, left me a little bit of money, which I put into solar PV panels that are on my roof. So in rainy, windy, cloudy Britain, half of my electricity comes from uh, solar panels, thank you, sun, and from my grandmother, thank you, granny. And uh, these are small ways in which I am reminded every single day that through innovation and determination, 
humanity at its best, we really can uh, address the challenges in front of us. So in conclusion, this dish can serve well over 7 billion people very successfully. I think we don't spend enough time reminding ourselves that, you know, this could be good. Let's stop, stop talking about approaching sustainability as being a diet of austerity and denial. And let's shout from the rooftops that we're going to end up with something much more satisfying and enjoyable than what we've been served up every day until now. Thank you for listening. Great stuff. It's nice to get a little recipe sometimes. You know, I, I think Joe's dead right there from the Royal Geographical Society. Why not put all of this into some sort of recipe? Now, Joe, the genius whose idea the Global Biodiversity Festival is, has the amazing job, heroic job, of working out how to put the thing together. You can imagine it's not very easy. So we finished, decided to finish on geography. And it's the, it is the single subject that holds us all together. We can't do anything without a decent understanding of geography. So there's Joe Smith representing the Royal Geographical Society. And we now have uh, Arkady uh, Tishkov, Arkady Tishkov from the Russian Geographical Society to put things in a Russian perspective, focusing on Arctic biodiversity and climate change. So the honor of the last event and the last talk goes to the Russian Geographical Society. So you're very welcome. Please join us. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to, uh, to hear, to see, and to meet my colleagues from uh, uh, different countries, uh, my colleagues from uh, Arctic regions. I want to speak about uh, problems of biodiversity and climate, climate change in the Russian Arctic. Uh, uh, I pr present brief uh, results of field and uh, remote uh, studies of uh, laboratory of biogeography in Institute of Geography in the Russian Academy of Science in the last two years. Uh, welcome to Russian Arctic, colleagues. Uh, the first about biodiversity uh, in Russian Ar Ar Arctic. Uh, you can see uh, in information about uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, different group uh, uh, of uh, plant and animals in the Russian Arctic. For example, the uh, mammals, uh, uh, about 75 species, uh, birds, uh, about uh, 240 species. Uh, uh, reptiles only one, uh, amphibian two, and as a, as, a, as a group. It's very important now because uh, uh, the part of bi Arctic biodiversity in Russian Arctic, that's not so mo uh, high, uh, about a few percent. Uh, only, uh, only some uh, group of likeness, for example, uh, from uh, plants and, uh, and some uh, fishes and uh, insects, uh, more than one person. And as about uh, climate change in Russian Arctic, uh, it's a map of uh, uh, temperature, uh, annual temperature in uh, northern Eurasian region. And you can see Russian Arctic it's, uh, the, uh, a red uh, color uh, because about, uh, about uh, zero uh, five and one uh, one gr gr grad per year, year uh, per, per decade uh, uh, increase uh, in last decades uh, temperature. Uh, uh, but uh, in different uh, different region of uh, Russian Arctic, the change climate change uh, different. For example, you can see. Uh, um, Kola Peninsula uh, and uh, other regions, uh, 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 warm period uh, change with the cold period and in, in, in last uh, decades, uh, in, in, uh, next warm period. It's not trends if uh, uh, in, uh, in centuries, uh, inner centuries, it's cycles of temperature. 
change. And because the answer of uh, biodiversity, reaction of biodiversity, uh, uh, same cycle in other regions, because start of warming, for example, in Russian Arctic, in different regions, uh, have the different dates. Uh, some, some regions start uh, warming in about uh, 90, 90s uh, years, uh, in other regions only in the first year of the uh, 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 third century, uh, third uh, millennium. Uh, about effects uh, of uh, climate change. The first um, effects of greening of tundra in uh, uh, 2020. You can see uh, uh, the warming, uh, warming uh, in Russian Arctic and uh, greening effect of tundra. Uh, what's mechanism for green? The first mechanism uh, is occupied uh, tundra and, uh, uh, and uh, other um, polar uh, deserts, uh, grasses and uh, shrubs. Uh, and uh, uh, after it, uh, through uh, uh, co cosmos, you can see uh, more, uh, more, uh, uh, more greening, uh, surface of uh, tundra, its effect of um, warming. Uh, our colleague from USA and other Arctic country uh, uh, pu published the maps of NDVI uh, uh, in index for understanding, uh, understanding processes of greening in uh, uh, Arctic, uh, Arctic tundra. But uh, we use other, um, uh, other methods for uh, uh, for analysis of um, greening. Uh, the first mechanism is uh, its, its second effects of uh, uh, warming. It's growth and stabilization of primary production. Uh, uh, you can see on this um, slide uh, two maps. Uh, the first, uh, it's primary uh, pr uh, modern primary production in Russian Arctic uh, and not all, uh, all region uh, have a, uh, uh, dark uh, um, uh, color, and uh, some uh, uh, forecast forecast for uh, the 2025 uh, here. Uh, not all region uh, increase uh, pr uh, pr uh, primary production. It's very important because uh, uh, some regions uh, stop uh, warming and stop uh, reaction of uh, uh, of uh, uh, warming. Uh, uh, you can see in a different, different uh, point uh, where we analyze this field method uh, cycle uh, change of productivity uh, uh, tundra. It's not trends for increasing, uh, it's a reaction of changes uh, annually temperature. The next effect, third effects of uh, climate change and innovation uh, alien species in Arctic. It's not so, um, so uh, uh, large uh, processes because uh, uh, in uh, Russian Arctic, not m many areas disturbed for, uh, for occupied of alien species. But now we know about uh, uh, 300 species which uh, founded in Russian Arctic. Uh, this uh, this uh, diagram uh, illustrates of uh, 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 alien species uh, abundance in different region of Arctic, uh, including in Russian Arctic, in the left part of uh, picture. Uh, it's uh, uh, spe 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 special biodiversity of, of native and alien vascular plants in Russian Arctic. And uh, we, uh, we, uh, we can uh, see uh, uh, the present of uh, alien species in local floras, uh, Kola Peninsula, Pechora region, uh, Yamal Peninsula, Taimir and other uh, regions. And you can uh, see that uh, this, uh, this present is about 5, uh, 10, 15 uh, percent for 
from uh, uh, local uh, flora, uh, uh, flora diversity. Uh, its um, number of naturalization, naturalized uh, species in the Arctic region, because not all invasion species uh, you can found in next year after after uh, uh, after uh, fiction, fiction, and you can see uh, uh, 100 and more species in Russian Arctic naturalized. Next, false effects of uh, climate change, change of dynamics of forest in uh, northern boundaries between boundaries between uh, tundra and fo forest. Uh, we study this process along along the all boundaries from Kola Peninsula to Chukotka Peninsula, but it's very intensive. Uh, uh, these processes uh, now in Kola Peninsula and. Uh, <laughs> You can see uh, that uh, uh, some uh, some regions uh, receive new new areas of forest in tundra, uh, and the speed of uh, uh, these processes uh, uh, in, in a mountain of 15, 50 meter uh, per, uh, per dec decades in a uh, uh, plain uh, about a few hundreds meter per decades uh, occupied uh, trees uh, of tundra. The fifth uh, effect uh, about uh, change in uh, animals population, uh, for example, in mammals and birds. For, uh, the first uh, sample uh, about reindeer, the warming uh, last decades uh, um, uh, have the effects uh, fragmentation of a areal uh, the habitats uh, uh, range and uh, 1950s year uh, this areal um, uh, occupied the more part of Arctic now only some uh, some uh, 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 small areas in the, for uh, uh, for habitats of uh, 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 population in Taimir, in uh, northern of Yakutia and Aze. The next uh, sample uh, uh, with uh, uh, the Arctic geese, uh, some species uh, have the more broad areas after warming. Uh, some species, the uh, localization, uh, the habitats in uh, Small, uh, small areas. If uh, you can see Branta uh, leucopsis and uh, other uh, 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 species. Uh, next uh, sample of um, uh, effects of warming at the damping of lemming cycles. Uh, the observation only in the western uh, region of Russian Arctic and in the uh, eastern uh, regions. Uh, uh, lemmings not uh, not uh, broke uh, cycles and continue this uh, this dynamics. It's very interesting uh, uh, effect because it connect with uh, uh, problems of uh, increasing of uh, uh, increasing of productivity, increasing at effect uh, uh, impact of. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, some other species uh, uh, on on grass cover and other uh, the trends of recent decades composite of fauna uh, it's connect with uh, birds uh, population ch change for example the number of the di and distribution of some groups of vaderns uh, some species and uh, a positive change uh, some species uh, 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 negative uh, changing uh, and I believe that uh, it's very important for understanding uh, the not direct effect of uh, warming only through change of habitats for uh, biodiversity uh, this is illustration of uh, effect uh, effect uh, uh, warming on uh, migration species, uh, waders, geese, and others. Uh, 
uh, all material uh, uh, about uh, birds uh, migration we collect in uh, results uh, the uh, European uh, project uh, results I I cars, uh, because we using special equipment for uh, a study a study a study change of migration of uh, Arctic birds through uh, uh, international uh, uh, station uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, sp space international station uh, special uh, special um, anten and other equipment uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, information about a change of uh, uh, dynamic of ungulates and pred predators mammals in Russian Arctic uh, under uh, climate warming some species it's uh, increase some uh, some species decrease but uh, if, uh, anthropogenic press uh, of this species uh, the change is the same uh, same because uh, not uh, not um, if effect of uh, increasing and dec decreasing uh, for uh, mammals population uh, impact of uh, hunting for example but uh, special uh, special problems uh, the uh, dynamics of uh, population of polar bear uh, now uh, now we <laughs> together with Russian geographical society we have a special uh, special project for uh, for for uh, estimate of uh, of uh, populations uh, polar bear because it's that uh, the very important indicator of state uh, Arctic Arctic uh, nature Arctic biodiversity uh, in, in in photo you can uh, you can see uh, uh, compact um, compact. Um, uh, uh, place with uh, uh, polar bear about 100 polar bear uh, 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 meet in uh, uh, valley uh, uh, valley um, body. Uh, and uh, what about uh, past uh, change of biodiversity? What effects of uh, reversible Invariable and and cycle. Uh, some uh, some species, uh, some species, some population have a, 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 a conserve uh, uh, cycles, uh, uh, and <coughs> some species, uh, some uh, group of uh, biodiversity. Uh, now uh, now <coughs> uh, now uh, have the effect of. Uh, Atlantization, for example, the western part of uh, Russian uh, Russian Arctic, and or uh, Americanization flora and fauna uh, in um, uh, in uh, Chukotka, for example, uh, 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 biodiversity uh, and by geographical effect uh, extinction, some species increasing, decreasing. Uh, area uh, 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 area for uh, uh, some population and changing of um, migration ways for example and a lot as a mechanism for reaction of warming uh, on biodiver Arctic biodiversity and can, uh, I, I think that very important uh, uh, forecast for Russian Arctic biodiversity because some uh, some uh, scientist, um, uh, our colleague from uh, USA and other country, uh, uh, propose the forecast uh, where we can uh, uh, can found the uh, after uh, 50 uh, 100 years uh, Russian Arctic has di disappear uh, and uh, uh, all uh, areas occupied the forests. Uh, and after uh, 200, uh, 300, and uh, for, uh, boreal forests disappear, and sub subtropical uh, sub subtropical ecosystem ecosystem occupies the Arctic. No, no, it's uh, uh, it's not possible uh, because uh, uh, now in this moment we we observe the effects 
uh, reversible um, and uh, not uh, uh, irreversible uh, processes uh, with, uh, uh, with situation uh, biodiversity situation in Arctic. And I believe that uh, uh, many, uh, many uh, <laughs> millenniums we can, uh, we can, uh, can observation of uh, bi uh, Arctic biodiversity and uh, our, and our uh, system of uh, nature, na nature protected areas support uh, uh, us about what uh, 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 reserves, uh, nature protected areas, uh, I, and this, uh, I spoke. The first, uh, the a lot Zapovednik in national park in European part of Russian Arctic. Uh, for example, Russian Arctic National Park in uh, Nova Zemlya Archipelago, uh, including uh, Franz Josef Land Archipelago. Uh, in, uh, in Yamal uh, and Gedan, uh, a few, uh, a few uh, reserves, uh, about a few uh, uh, million hectares. Taimir Peninsula, uh, four areas, uh, more than, uh, uh, more than uh, uh, eight million hectares. Northern Yakutia, uh, Lenski uh, reserves, uh, and other. And Chukotka with uh, International uh, uh, Natural Park Beringia. I, uh, I uh, want to invite you in Russian Arctic and uh, receive the enjoy on uh, Russian Arctic biodiversity. Bye. Well, great stuff there you go, everybody. Um, Thank you, RKG and our friends at the Russian Geographical Society. It, felt, it did feel really good to finish on geography. So we had Joe Smith from the Royal Geographical Society giving us a recipe, which is a lovely way of distilling it. And then why not bring us to that lovely polar view of where we're headed? Because as we all know, we use the Arctic as the canary in the coal mine. This is where we're going. We can measure uh, habitat loss, climate change. We can even measure the effect of persistent organic pollutants by looking at what happens in the Arctic. So it's the canary in the coal mine, and it's a single place that I guess is good for us to focus on as we wrap up. So thank you very much to our friends at the Russian Geographical Society. Hope to see you very soon. Well, now we're gonna wrap up. So where is everybody? The idea now is to bring as many people that are still alive and awake and kicking um, into the back onto the screen. So where is everybody, Joe? <laughs> I'm not sure a lot of people are still awake. Uh, I think people in this time zone have crashed pretty hard. Uh, and I think it might be night in a lot of time zones as well. But uh, is it? I wonder if anybody, if Clay, I mean, we couldn't have done this without Clay Event Technology and the crew that took 12 hour shifts throughout the whole festival to make sure that things kind of ran smoothly. Keith, Mateo, and Pablo. I don't know if any of them want to pop in, but uh, they're welcome to. There's Pablo. Oops. There he goes. Hey, Pablo. There's Hi, how are you? Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Matteo. Oh, oh, you guys. Good to have your voices back there. Um, <laughs> rocking the green room, making sure the stream didn't explode. Uh, <laughs> I think we had a pretty, a pretty darn good festival. Everybody made it. Uh, we ran on time. That's pretty phenomenal for something that went over 72 hours. It was Thank fantastic. You. It's really, really great. Great festival, great content. Great people and uh, amazing hosts. So it was all very, very amazing. We, so, we, we really around. enjoyed it. Sorry, it felt like a real support team, you know, having having you lot here. We got we got Joel here. Joel's jo you've got Joel's to bring Joel in there. Hi, Joel. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Joel is the powerhouse legend who's going to pull this massive book together last year's book was spectacular and this year's book i don't know how you're doing it it's got to be double the size just absolutely wild so joelle thank you so much and obviously supporting for paul back there too the experience <laughs> keeping paul in mind getting him on screen in time and stuff like that yeah. <laughs> most of the time most of the time yeah very important uh and then so representing the host i want to thank all the hosts and i'm going to list them shortly but We've got Jesse, my good friend Jesse, backstage, uh, who hosted a nice chunk for us. 
over the weekend. Jesse, thank you so much for being there. Sat in the green room, did some social media. So much appreciated, Jesse. Brought backyard bio to life this year. Yeah. Thanks, guys. What a great festival. It's so nice to see Paolo and Mateo in the background, too. You guys, every time I went there, someone was there to help me out. It was a good time. So what a fun program. What a fun thing. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Jesse. I want to give a shout out to our hosts. We had Stacia Carrington who joined us, Sylvia uh, Tran from Lenovo. So, you know, another shout out to Lenovo uh, EDU for supporting the festival um, and for loaning us uh, Sylvia from Australia. So she was able to cover a nice big late night shift for us, which was great. Um, I got a shout out Brianna Rowe, Lizzie Rosenberger, Eleanor Drinkwater, Olga Lapina from the Russian Geographic Society. She took some good night shifts for us. A huge shout out to Olga. Kate Bosler, Maynard O'Karaki, the hip hop MD. And then Peter, Peter Ong in Malaysia. How amazing was Peter, Paul? Oh, Peter, Peter was just great. He was one of our first sort of regional hosts that jumped on board. Everybody has just been fantastic. I mean, really brilliant to be able to do that. And it made it feel, I remember, Joe, when you were first putting this together, I remember holding up the world's smallest planning globe and, and working out time zones and how we, we might do it. So having hosts in different parts of the world really pulled it together. And let's face yeah. it, it helped the whole thing feel a bit more, a bit more global, as it should. Yeah, absolutely. Two more shout outs. Wes Delavola from Meridian Treehouse did a lot of social media, produced a lot of cool things for us, did some hosting for us. You know, a great production guy. And then Dan Klein, our big data guy. So he's going to pull together just some beautiful pictures uh, of the data so we can really see what happened. So, I mean, wow. Everybody, thank you so much. Just incredible to everybody who tuned in and our speakers, 150 plus speakers, pretty wild. And, and Joe, I think all of us, the rest of us here in the thing can just do like a big thank you for you because none of this happens without your vision for this. And, you know, exactly. 60 programs last year and that was nothing, 150 plus this year. So I'll give you an applause. I mean, I work with you, but Great just applause. unbelievable stuff. The respect Amazing. to you is you. So way to go, man. No, it's 100% a really good team behind me. Uh, I'm sure Paul's going to turn his phone off for a while, so I can't call him <laughs> with another idea. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, Joe, it's just brilliant. I mean, you know, I'm ready for mad ideas anytime, but particularly from you. It was just wonderful. I still remember just over a year ago, you know, you called, hey, Paul, I've got a mad idea. And I said, I'm in. Didn't even know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for the idea, Joe. And as you, you rightly say, Jesse, you know, we're all, we're all standing on your shoulders, buddy. So thank no, you. not at all. We're, we're, thank you very much. We're all 100% in this together. And this isn't going away. Year three is coming. And I think, you know, everybody who's tuning in and everybody who registered can look forward to, to some exciting events throughout the year as we build towards another uh, biodiversity festival. Um, who else should we shout out to, Paul? I know there's a few more that we should thank. I think um, we should definitely push out to Rolex again and their support for the festival, um, you know, as part of their Perpetual Planet Initiative, supporting individuals, organizations, using science to understand the world's environmental challenges. Um, couldn't have done it without them as well. And I think just everybody that's been in this tent, you know, everybody that's been been tuning in uh, from around the world and, and all the, you know, field scientists, people of all ages and backgrounds, yeah. financial experts, photographers, explorers, musicians, journalists, businesses, global conservation leaders, all in the same tent. And then sometimes jumping in the same submarine or up in the same, up in the same, you know, uh, up in space with Nicole, you know, the astronaut. So somehow we've, we've all been together. And it does genuinely feel, look and sound like the planet. And we're all in one big expedition tent. It couldn't be better, Joan. And, no question. Uh, you know, one I guess the is to physically all be together. So as yeah. things change, um, stand by, everybody, for a, a big physical um, adventure anywhere. Coming, coming to your neighborhood soon. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, everybody. I want to shout out too to Frank and Susan Mars, who've been so supportive the last two years of the festival um, in many ways, including a huge advisory role um, and helping us make the book happen. Uh, and then Eo Wilson launching the festival. That was pretty special. That was, yeah. Shout out to them in the foundation. Thanks so much, everybody. Paul, Pablo, Mateo, Jesse, Joel, amazing. Uh, I can't wait. I don't want to turn the stream off, but I think we probably should. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. This is going to be great. Keep an eye out for the book. 
keep an eye out for the recorded sessions. We're going to get them up in a huge magical list that you can check out all throughout the next few days. Uh, thank you. Thanks, guys. See you, everybody. All right. Bye. See you. Bye. Thank you. Signing off, everyone. Thanks. Bye. See you.